Okay, good morning. Hi good everyone morning. who's morning. on this panel and hi everyone who's watching. Um, I just thought I'd do a very quick introduction just before we do start the day. Uh, we've already got quite a couple of viewers, which is great because it was going to risk us for just having a bit of a chat throughout the day on our own, but I'm sure that would still be quite fun, but maybe not for 12 hours. Um, so um, I think a couple of weeks ago, I put out a video. Um, I've always been very open about uh, my mental health struggles for as long as I can remember. Um, and certainly, you know, I'm sure a lot of people will relate to the fact that it feels the coronavirus pandemic has got lots of us up and down. Um, you know, I, I always joke on on live streams and hangouts that I go from the bed to the desk and that's my life for the last four months. Um, and it's obviously having lots of effects on people. And now we're seeing obviously lots of people losing their jobs and facing lots of other problems. Um, so we're just gonna, just gonna mute some of the other people because someone's got uh, something up in the background. Um, so I, um, I, I said, we're seeing, and we reported this to our local council yesterday, we're seeing a lot more clients with mental health problems presenting to us through the data that we are seeing. Um, and it just felt that it was appropriate to, 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 to do something like this, to put this high on people's agenda. So when I was talking to our team of people who were joining us today, you know, my only objective was that um, you know, we've got, we're broadcasting to our national network of citizens advice, we're broadcasting to our local network, but also the public so that we can show the public that we do take this um, issue really, really seriously. So uh, for me, I just hope that this, as I said, puts it on people's agenda, um, makes you think about this situation, um, but also that, you know, a lot of us will be talking about either our personal experience or our professional experience of working on mental health, and that might inspire some of you to be able to move forward as well. Um, I think it's also fair to say before we start the, um, some of this, you know, when we've had some of the pre-chats, it is quite emotional sometimes with some of the stuff that people may be talking about. So please do reach out for support, um, either through your own organizations. Uh, there's also absolutely brilliant charities such as Mind and Samaritans that are here to support you as well. Um, and I think that's it. I think let's do our introductions to people. Um, so Kate, do you wanna start? Yep. Hi everyone watching and everyone else in the stream. Um, my name is Kate. I work at National Citizens Advice. I joined uh, just at the, when did I start? End of April. Um, so relatively new, relatively new, but not so new. And I work in the digital workplace team with Steph, who's also on the stream. Um, and yeah, partly I kind of got uh, just, I'll talk a bit about why I wanted to get involved. Um, partly because I thought it was just a great thing to do. I'd never heard, you know, coming, joining Citizen Advice, it was really immediately obvious how um, nurturing and caring the organization is. Um, I came from the private sector, so coming to something a bit more third sector and a bit more compassionate was really, really, the, the difference was kind of obvious. Um, and yeah, it just seemed like an amazing thing to be involved with. Um, in terms of kind of my mental health experience, I don't know if that's not the right way to phrase it, but um, yeah, I, I've been, I was diagnosed with like anxiety and depression when I was like 19. So I've been on the roller coaster for a while. Um, and I think it's interesting for me because I'm really open about it with all my friends and family because I'm just kind of in that kind of world, I guess. Like, I think I've, a lot of my friends have similar issues and, like, it's just very easy to talk about for, for me with my friends. But I understand it's perhaps not for everyone. And, um, yeah, it is one of those things we talk about, you know, breaking down stigma and kind of all that stuff. But sometimes it's easier said than done. So uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here to kind of just chat about feelings, but also in a more constructive way about mental health. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, re I'm, really, I'm really excited about um, what everyone else is gonna to bring to the table. That's me. Yeah, it's great to have you. Thank you, Kate. Steph, we'll go on to you. Yeah, um, so I'm Steph. Um, I'm also part of the Digital Workplace team, as part of National Citizen Advice with Kate. Um, and I think um, for me, uh, more recently, probably within the last year and a bit, um, I've um, kind of come face to face with my mental health. 
um, quite quickly. And um, it's something that I knew was always kind of there, but never really addressed it. Um, and so I'm kind of learning as I go and I'm trying to find kind of my ways of handling things. Um, but I've been really lucky to have some really great support. So my family, my friends, but also my manager, and my, my team. Um, and so I'm just really happy to be able to share the things that I've learned, but also hopefully learn quite a lot of other things along the way as well. Absolutely. I think that's a good summary. Thank you, Steph. And Rosie. Hi. Uh, so I'm Rosie. I work um, at Citizens Advice in Manchester. I'm um, the partnership and communications lead there. Um, and I think in terms of sort of the mental health journey and why I wanted to get involved, um, for me personally, sort of my biggest stumbling block with um, mental health was that I was diagnosed with uh, anorexia when I was about 24, 25. And that was actually just as I was, I'd found my first permanent like job. Um, and I just sort of gone, uh, I've been working, I've been temping for a few years, like out of after uni and stuff. So um, I was sort of, uh, it was, it was quite an interesting journey for me to sort of manage my mental health and then like try and manage my professionalism at that time as well. So I think like the whole interaction of mental health and the workplace has been really important for me. Um, and while I would sort of say I've been in like, some stage of recovery for probably like uh that makes it about 10 years since i was di like 10 uh, since i was diagnosed and sort of then recovering um but obviously profession like what's going on at work often really has a big impact on then what's going on for me personally so it's really important that we kind of open up um the discussion and talk about how those things interact and i think again as kate had said coming into what is a very nurturing environment at citizens advice i've always felt incredibly well supported and and i think generally in the voluntary sector as a whole i think it's, there's a lot of good understanding um but the kind of capacity for for support has, has always been great but i think it's about how do we share what works um for us so that other people can can replicate it and potentially like take learning along the way as well Absolutely. I think that's great. That's great. That's really good introductions to the day. I think um, at the bottom, you'll see a little bit of a ticker that's going to hopefully tell you what is going on throughout the day and, and, and know that I'm going to forget. So if we get to six o'clock and it still says that it's the coffee morning, then please do forgive me. Um, so the idea is that we're here for 12 hours. Um, Kate, Steph and Rosie will be pleased to know that they won't be stuck for 12 hours, but they will be dipping around and out of different panels throughout the day, which I think will be great. So the purpose of this morning's session is to bring you along, um, have a bit of a chat with us. It's a bit more of a, just a bit of a, like, well, I suppose the whole day will be a bit of an informal chat, but it's supposed to be a bit more sort of relaxed, uh, not as sort of intense in detail. And then as we move through, I'm just gonna quickly go through what the panels are for the day. From 10 o'clock till 11 o'clock, we'll have a panel on listening and talking about feelings. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll have a panel on peer support, um, which obviously uh, will be about how we can support each other. 12 o'clock on how to start talking to colleagues about mental health, which is both their own and, and, and ours as well. At 1 p.m. till 2 p.m., we'll have a panel on disability and career. And I think the focus on that is sort of long-term disability and the impact that that might have uh, on your career. We've got some people on that that have um, got experience of that. At two o'clock, um, Kate, and I think Steph as well, you'll be able to be back to lead on the um, mindfulness hour. And we'll be joined by um, Tracy, who will do a bit of an introduction on breathing at two. At three o'clock, we'll have an interview with Sarah Hughes, who is the chief executive at the Centre for Mental Health, which is a, a large national charity that's a, a policy um, driven charity supporting um, changes on supporting mental health. Four o'clock, we'll have a panel on delivering services for people with mental health problems. And Rushmore have got a couple of staff that will be talking through one of the large projects that they run. At five, we'll have a panel on ways that we can help ourselves, which obviously I think will be um, also really interesting. At six, we've got um, myself and two other um, CEOs from across um, Sit and Device Network talking about poor mental health and leaders and um, you know how, how we feel we have to be portrayed and, and all that type of stuff. At seven, we'll have a, a quiz, and there was a lot of debate yesterday with the two people who were hosting our quiz of how serious and how fun it should be. So we've agreed a mixture. There'll be a mental health aspect, as you can probably imagine, for the first round, and then we will have uh, a bit more of a, a fun 
element to it um, as well. But that's again a designed like the coffee morning just to bring people together because mental health isn't only just about talking about all the negatives that mental health brings. It's about hopefully coming together um, and sharing experiences. And then after that quiz, we don't know what time that will finish, but certainly then up until now, we'll just have a, a panel and Kate, I think you're down for coming back at that point um, just to talk about the day, how, how we think it's gone, um, any, anything that's come up through that particularly, uh, and what's next, how do we continue the conversation? Because I said this was to put it on people's agendas, but I know certainly people from the panel who are going to join us today, around 20 people on and off, have said that a lot of them are taking this back to their offices and to their teams about what they can do. Um, so hopefully we'll have some of that stuff um, as well. Um, I think as, as Kate, Steph and Rosie naturally then did through their introductions, um, you've seen that people are from different parts of the Sitting Device Network, which is something I'm certainly also passionate about with the, the, the network itself. I've worked for Sitting Device on and off for um, six years now. I first joined in 2014 um, and I've worked for four of the local Sitting Device um, throughout that time as well. So currently I'm Chief Executive in the Wokingham office. Um, and we'll be joined by people from right across uh, England and Wales throughout the day, which I think will be great. So um, do you want to tell us about what panels you're all going to be on there? Let's let's do that. So who wants to start? Kate? Yeah, um, I am going to join in on the mindfulness hour, which is at two, I believe. Um, and Tracy, Hopkins. I've forgotten her surname, sorry. Tracy, <laughs> thank you. Um, she's going to kick us off with a kind of 20 minute um, kind of guided breathing um, session, which would be really great. And then I'm going to just chat a little bit about the concept of mindfulness, how it kind of works or might not work for you. Um, my kind of personal experience with it, kind of avenues into it. And just kind of give a bit of a primer on it, I guess. And I'd, I'd love if anyone's out there listening uh, to answer comments or, well, no, not answer because I'm not an authority, but talk about comments and kind of uh, have a bit of discussion there. Because I think, I don't know about you guys, but mindfulness is kind of, it's definitely kind of the most common, I think, for people, my experience, people who first go to the GP about any kind of mental health. Ooh. My head that's just cut. It's just got off. Yes. <laughs> what a moment. Live TV for you. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I think mindfulness is kind of the first kind of port of call for lots of GPs and kind of because it is very accessible. Um, so I think it's good to have a bit of conversation about what it involves, how it can work. How it, yeah, so that's what I'm doing. And then I think the kind of cool down session at the end, I just said I'd pop in just to, I guess, put a kind of, yeah, just to be part of that conversation there. That's me. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Steph, do you want to go next? Yep. Um, so I'll be in the session from 12 to 1, so your lunchtime session, um, kind of talking about how we start that conversation about mental health with our colleagues. So whether that's um, kind of sharing ours or, or hearing about theirs, um, it's something that I think I've um, kind of had to learn really quickly um, over the last year and definitely have found some things not to do um, but have also found lots of things that have been really really helpful um, and I've learned loads from um, other colleagues as well so I'm really excited to um, have that chat with um, Al and Tracy a little bit later on um, and then I'll be watching um, kind of everything else so I'll be probably commenting in um, mm -hmm. and asking lots of questions because it's um, the whole day is just something that I'm really keen to learn more about. It's brilliant thank you Steph and Rosie. Yeah, so I'm going to be uh, in the session from 11 till 12 talking about peer support. Um, uh, I think, again, I've, it's been really vital for me to have people in the workplace that can kind of support me, um, but also potentially some of the like the downsides, I guess, like particularly when it comes to like uh, like um, issues like eating and how that kind of actually the more you talk about them, potentially you can uh, make them worse. So I think it'd be quite interesting to look at sort of the the plus uh, pros and cons of peer support during that time. Mm -hmm. And as Steph said, I'll probably be dipping in and out throughout the day and commenting and uh, as I can. Yeah, no, that's great. I think it's it's really interesting, isn't it? Because um, so when we uh, certainly the first time we all got together to talk about this which was only like two weeks ago by the way so please don't think we've been planning this for years um but when we when we got together it was around you know i, I came from it we've just lost steph but we'll 
we'll bring her back up when she's back. Um, yeah, she's on um, rural North um, rural uh, Wales, Mumbai. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so. yeah. We'll, we'll bring her back. Uh, oh, she's back. We'll bring her back up on the screen. We we're just hearing it's about your internet. It's your internet. <laughs> um, Sorry. But, okay don't worry but yeah what we, what we were saying was around uh you know so for, for me the video that i'd put out on 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 my social media my personal social media was around how um you know and, and i don't want this morning bit to be too heavy but certainly i'll talk about it later on at six when i do my session um with the mental health and leaders bit but you know for me the reality is that i live with thinking about suicide every single day so that's not a strange thing for me to experience the idea that i should then go and um, think about not being here anymore and it is quite deep but it is something I'm just absolutely used to you know when I was a counsellor when I was 18 I was or I would go to you know BBC breakfast would pick me up in a car and drive me to Salford to go and do an interview and on the way back it would be all about how much of a disaster that was and it'd be better if I wasn't here I was never able to enjoy those positive moments and the stigma for me as a counsellor and someone who then maybe wants to be an MP I've also wanted to be a police officer at some point in my life was this idea that if there's ever mental health written down on my record, I will never, ever make any progress in any sector that I want to do. And then, Kate, I think as you've sort of touched upon, when you're joining the charity sector, which is very, very value driven, which is very much around a, a cause that we're here to support, I do think you feel a bit more empowered to talk about stuff. Um, I don't think it's easy. You know, I also don't think that we have every solution. But the idea, at least, that we can talk about it, I think, is a huge, you know, first step. And when Sarah comes on later, the CEO of the Centre for Mental Health, you know, we, we're talking in her interview around what can employers actually properly do? Because obviously we have duties to support our teams as employers, but also what can we do? What are the hints and tips? So when I worked for mine previously in Cambridgeshire, you know, we had like a, a, an hour a week. I can't remember what the hour was called, it was maybe a wellbeing hour or whatever, but it would come up in your supervision and it was about how you spent that hour. So if you were full time, you were given an hour off in your work time a week to go and do something. Um, and even if that was to say, right, I'm going to go and do my laundry because it's been sitting in a pile for the whole week and it's making me feel all stressed out because I can't manage my, my you know, home life, then that was enough. It was just an hour that the employer gave you to, to do things for you. You could go swimming, you could do whatever. And they're just little ideas that, that, that can make a difference to, to teams or to organisations. And then Rosie, particularly with, you know, Manchester, with the, with the network, we have a lot of volunteers. I don't know, National do through the, the witness service as well, but we have a lot of volunteers and that brings a different layer of support as well that we need to offer um, to our teams. And, and quite often, certainly for us, we've got 80 volunteers and five full-time equivalent staff. So, you know, it's quite intense to obviously provide that support, but it's really, really important. But when we talked about at the, at the panel to plan this, you know, I was coming to it from that angle of, I said, always thinking of suicide, but never ever attempting it or never attempting self-harm or anything like that. Always having lived with depression, anxiety, PTSD, and everything else that GP's thrown into the ring about what he thinks I may or may not have. Um, and then obviously you you all came to it different perspectives. The rest of the panel came to it from different perspectives. And that's the thing that I also think is fascinating. With, and I've always been fascinated by mental health, but it is so complex, it is so varied, and everyone has different experiences as well. So, you know, Kate, you've said about depression and anxiety, which I'm also relating to as well, but I could promise you our experiences are probably nearly entirely different in how that has manifested itself. And I just think that is fascinating, and I'm hoping that that's why this panel will help people throughout the day, because it's not just about the topic, is it? It's about how that's affected you and your life and how you've been able to hopefully move forward with that. Yeah, I completely um absolutely agree with everything you said and I think something I'm really interested in um hopefully we might get some comments or people might want to share afterwards um but that thing of you might have the same diagnosis but your own personal lived experience can be so different and things in sex from a computer's peeping um <laughs> but like, you know the fact that even just gender and um, race like mm -hmm. um, physical ability or all those things do feed in and kind of really you know, even you know, your class or like, you know, you know, where you live in the country can affect so much of how your um, lived experience changes. So, and I'm also something, I'm just kind of throwing this out there because it's something I'm kind of aware of when we talk about mental health a lot. I think there's, 
as a, it's getting a bit heavy, sorry. But as a society, we're really good at talking about um, anxiety and depression, which because I think they are very common and, and I think and there's, it's good that we talk about them. But I think there's some aspects of mental health that are such as you know, psychosis and mm. personality disorders, which I don't have any personal experience for myself, so I can't speak to them. But I think it's really important when we talk about mental health to kind of acknowledge that these other kind of uh, you could almost say like less palatable kind of they're they're then they're kind of less acceptable face of mental health it's great that people are getting better at talking about anxiety and depression and that people can kind of relate to it and so i know someone who yeah. is much more accessible which is good but i always, i'm always very aware that like when we talk about mental health it's not a homogenous thing that's not just what i'm used to which is you know kind of low mood which is one thing but there are there's many facets to it and um, yeah, there's, I, I can't obviously speak personally of those things, but it's just something I, I, I think when we talk about everyone's lived experience, that um, yeah, mental health kind of encompasses a lot, and which is fantastic as well. But um, I think it can also. I'm wondering if people who, yeah, perhaps have schizophrenia, borderline yeah. personality disorder, might feel these kind of conversations are more. I'll, I'll maybe less accessible to them. I don't know. I'm not speaking on their behalf, but it's just something that, yeah, I'm um, aware of when we talk mental health. Yeah, I think I would agree because I think there's that um, the I think you, you sort of talked about like you're getting heavy early on, but I think obviously we kind of have to. That's the whole point of today. Yeah. <laughs> if we don't, then we're not doing it right. Um, and I think for me like again it's when you talk about oh we have to think about what happens in or how different things affect people differently and um so my my experience really with my mental health if, if you like actually started at 14 I was that I and that would be like sort of more low mood anxiety depression a little bit more again accessible that people know how to talk about that and that then having struggled with, and had like a really low point at that point in my life then kind of managed to get myself back on an even keel and kind of probably just lived with it as like this low level thing that sat and so many people I think are living with this low level of discomfort or something doesn't feel right in their lives and they just don't know how to address it because we don't talk about it enough but equally like low level anxiety and depression are much easier to talk about but even when you get into the darker side of things like that and like say bring up the word suicide and everyone sort of goes okay I don't really know how I'm supposed to react to that and you think well it, you just exactly the same way as you would have said if they said oh I feel a bit like I'm I'm, I'm struggling with depression it's the same thing it's just mm -hmm. a little bit like that's one sort of element of it um but then having like a diagnosable condition that you can say this is what I deal with um and also that idea about like recovery and not uh, and being fine and not fine like this idea that I get a bit like when I looked ill and it was like that's I think it was almost easy for people because they were like we can tell there's something wrong with you um that's very obvious now I don't look ill anymore and because I talk about my mental health a lot I'm I'm a real sort of I champion this idea that we should all be talking about it a little bit more because if we just normalized it we wouldn't have to be so freaked out when someone mentioned oh today I'm not doing so well thanks very much um but because of that, I think people think I don't struggle. And it's like actually every day, like you say, Jake, that idea of th this is something that is just in my head every day. And that's it. Every day I'm thinking about food. I just have to like make those choices and, and learn to make better choices that are good for me. And I've got some tools to, to deal with that. But it is so complicated. And then something comes along like lockdown that throws you completely off your course. And I think there are going to be so many people struggling um, because they've sort of or even those people particularly these people almost who were not necessarily acknowledging that something was wrong beforehand and this has kind of tipped them off balance and and they don't know how to put themselves up I always think I'm I feel really grateful almost that it got that bad because I had to go into therapy I had to get some significant support otherwise like I might not have been here that's like the reality of it it was that bad and but that has given me the tools to then kind of get through every day. And we have to kind of find ways of, like, even if 
people don't want to go into a professional course of therapy that if we just share our tools and say like this is actually how I deal with like what I'm doing on a day-to-day basis they don't need to go to not everyone needs professional therapy necessarily but some people need just a few tools in their kit that they can pull out and help them get better if that like I just feel like I rumbled for like five minutes no no it's great it's great just before I bring Steph in, I just wanted to bring up, you know, we've got some comments that are coming through um, and this is a perfect time to then tell people to do that if you can. You know, we want to hear from you, even if it's just discussion in the comment section between yourselves. But uh, we've got a comment here from um, Sarah on Workplace, which is our national um, pay, um, in, internet page, whatever Kate tells me I need to describe it as, I don't know. <laughs> um, and Sarah's saying, thanks for being so honest and open about your struggles. It's not easy talking about mental health, especially at work. So thank you for that. And we've also got a comment from Paul saying, good point about the charity sector being more forgiven and supportive. And we have a comment here from Paul on YouTube as well, saying definitely more awareness needed at the early stages of poor mental health, I agree. So thank you all for that. And please, as I said, do keep posting throughout the day. Steph, do you have anything to add on that new panel that we've just introduced there for the morning? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I'm um, kind of picking up on one of the kind of uh, later points that Rosie was making around that support um, and kind of recognizing that um, for me, my mental health, I probably wouldn't have been diagnosed with anything had it not been for my husband recognizing that black eye changed quite a lot suddenly um, and kind of him being able to recognize that that wasn't the stuff that he he's known for however long, um, but also kind of so kind of recognizing that people might be trying to help you in slightly different ways and the ways that you might be able to find help and support yourself and kind of look at that recovery I feel like I've kind of done that thing where I've, I've tried one avenue and then I've come back to center and I've kind of felt a bit down and then I've tried another one and I've come back to center again um, and I think there's kind of that level of saying it's okay not to it's okay not to feel okay but it's okay also to have tried something and then um not be able to kind of pull through with it and say okay that worked for like a day um, and maybe I, I don't have the best attention span so I'm going to pull back and try something different and um, so hopefully through this we'll be able to kind of share those techniques with each other so like the mindfulness like Kate was saying or just being able to kind of talk to other people about it and have that shared commonality um, or even kind of when lockdown does end sometimes just like going for a drink or going for a coffee and um, kind of can lift that weight off your shoulders as well so kind of just recognizing that there isn't always one way to kind of fix yourself or to make yourself feel a bit better but there's loads of ways and that can be really exciting but really really daunting at the same time but um we've kind of all gone through and we've all tried to find different ways so hopefully we can all act as more of that support system for each other I yeah. agree. That's great. I think um, it's quite interesting that um, when you sort of talk about oh, like this, you're know, going for a coffee, coffee that works, and then finding what works for you. And I think also that acceptance that we need to find within ourselves that it, if it works one day, it might not work the next. Like one day, going for a coffee with a mate might be exactly what you need. The next day, that might be exactly what's going to tip you over the edge. And it's all right to sort of to just acknowledge that and I think like some of the better friendships I have are those ones where I just go I'm really sorry I just can't do that today like maybe like give me a week or like but this is why those things don't work um and again like with my husband if I just he'll try, he'll like he knows how much to push without then pushing me over the edge so he's like some things are acceptable some things we will not tolerate that kind of behavior because it's harmful to you and then that's like you have to learn to sort of sit where you are and your whatever your comfort zone is and then like sort of push your boundaries and I think it's just yeah finding that for everyone it, it I think it's it's different for everyone. There is nothing that's the right approach or the wrong approach. And I think so much people get really hung up on should I be doing this or shouldn't I? And there's it's like there's no shoulds or shouldn'ts. Just do what feels right for you, and yeah. you'll find something eventually. And I think um, I think on that because I think it's it's really interesting obviously here and again those those sort of perspectives because for me. Uh, you know, because I've put out a couple of videos over the last two years of being chief exec, because I think you feel a bit more, you know, you haven't got a land manager to, to sort of upset if you say the wrong thing and 
the, you know, my boards are very forgiven of all of the, the the risks that I certainly take over the last two years. But um, for me, you know, I've always had to have it, even as I went back when I was a councillor and, you know, with manage my own diary there as well, of never having morning meetings because it'd be mornings that I don't know whether I am, you know, ready to face the day or not by that point. But it might get to 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and appointments that I would have cancelled in the morning that I was no way near being able to, to go and cope with, I'll be ready to go by that point. You know, and that would just be based upon mood of how I've sort of, you know, woke up on, on that day and certainly personally have never been a morning person in itself. But as chief exec, I've got every permission to be able to, to do that. But obviously in a lot of the roles that we have and the nine to five culture that sort of still exists, it's very unforgiving, isn't it? You, you know, you have to put up with this a, a, a lot of the time. So I think those sort of things as well about what we do personally to sort of help ourselves through this and then the mechanisms that we put in place ourselves without necessarily knowing that that's the exact reason why we're doing it. I think that sort of stuff is interesting as well. Um, Paul has asked a question um, around easier chatting about this online. Have we found a tool to make the conversation about mental health more accessible? So I think, again, that's probably what will come out throughout the day on some of the, the panels that we've got. Um, but certainly, you know, locally, we've introduced initiatives such as um, it was called a permission slip, and it's an idea that I saw on one of the mental health blogs around um, each day you'd sort of come in and say you know one thing that you wanted to achieve through your job and what you actually want to do in your in your day but also one thing that you personally as yourself gave permission for yourself to do so quite often our team would say things like um and I give myself permission to have my full lunch break without any sort of distractions or I give myself permission to go and have a coffee with someone that they get along with in the office and stuff like that and that certainly helped open it up as well and then they could do them anonymous and on the back they would fill in if they achieved those goals and if they didn't what was the reason that they didn't do that so I would then be able to review them maybe at the end of the week so if it was staff and volunteers saying you know I wanted to take my full lunch with such and such and they couldn't do that then why aren't they able to do that because if that's the one personal thing that they wanted to achieve that day it's not unreasonable for somebody to be able to go and take their their appropriate break with a with a friend so i think that sort of helped start the conversation as well and then obviously there's there are things like mental health first aiders which i'll be talking about later on in one of the sessions as well but i don't know whether anyone else in this morning's panel wants to touch upon this question yeah i think um there's something obviously people talk a lot about like social media and and sort of uh the anonymity of it or the sort of relative anonymity of it and how that can obviously be quite detrimental it allows people to say things that they maybe wouldn't say to somebody in person but I think the flip side of that is actually it does allow people to talk a little bit more freely about how they're feeling and putting it out there in the world and sort of seeing how people respond and I think actually then there is almost a, a wider community. You are tapping into a wider community of people who are struggling. Um, person, like even when I've posted on like my like Facebook rather than say on Twitter, like people come out and say, "I, you know, I'm so pleased that you talk about this because actually it makes it easier for me to talk about it." And I suddenly realise that it's not the worst thing in the world that I I say I've got some sort of mental health issues going on. And I think so. In a way, yes, I think it has kind of freed up like made it a little bit more accessible made it a little bit easier uh to at least open the conversation which i think is is really beneficial yeah um when i was yeah i agree with everything you're saying i think um it sounds really daft but i think if i hadn't have been so active on social media in a kind of a, a the kind of strand of social media i'm in it's kind of people we're talking very openly about their various mental health issues. And you, it's that thing of you see other people do it and it normalizes what you want to say. Um, I'm also a big, um, when I was younger, I was on, on quite a few forums, um, which were anonymous kind of like uh, depression type self-help forums. And they're really useful for having a, a um, space to say things that perhaps you just, you didn't, perhaps you didn't need to say to anyone in your life. You didn't need to tell your mum exactly what, you were feeling at that moment but you just needed to have a space to say it to someone an actual person who can go oh that's interesting yeah I know that that's that's a valid thing of feeling something um I'm aware of kind of um social media 
and I'm definitely guilty of it myself. Is there's, there's this, and it was brought up. One of um, I was in a kind of group therapy session, and this concept was brought up: the idea that of kind of that broadcasting isn't the same as communicating. So you could do, and I'm not kind of trying to like denigrate anyone who does do this or finds this useful, but I know that I've self myself done it in the past where you make a post that says I feel bad or some kind of negative post about how you're feeling and you feel that because you've put it out into the into the world that it's communicating it's talking but it it's not necessarily the same as reaching out to someone in your support group or actually you know and saying actually I have this problem I need help and there's times and places for both and sometimes you just need to vent and sometimes um that's okay but I think there's it's something I always think about when I perhaps go on Twitter to have a moan or I'm thinking, am I communicating or am I just broadcasting and putting out what I want to say, but not necessarily engaging or having a dialogue or is it just a temporary solution that I kind of get something off my chest, which is good. But, you know, is there actually a deeper problem here that I need to um, actually have the scary conversation of talking to someone in my life and say, actually, um, I'm not not coping or whatever. Yeah. I think yeah, that's great, I think... and I think they're, they're go, sorry, Steph, go on. No, carry on. They're just going to say because there's a comment. I can't, I can't post it because it's it, it won't go in the box. But Rachel has said I agree with trying different things, Stephanie Mulvey, and also recognizing that you have a certain baseline of emotional energy or resources to deploy deploy on self care. Sometimes self care isn't enough, and you need others to care for you. And I think, Kate, that might touch upon a little bit of your, you know, two-way communication rather than just broadcasting. Um, Steph, I didn't know whether you wanted to come back on on anything on that. Yeah, I think um, I think from like a social media aspect, of it, I've not really, I've not really done loads. I think if anything, I'm probably kind of finding other resources or other people that I can kind of follow their journey as well to help um, kind of bolster mine. But I think um, for me, like mental health hasn't been something that I've been really open um in terms of talking about for quite a long time probably because I've just taken so long to try to figure out what it actually means and and what that actually is um but kind of doubling up on um what Rachel said there around um kind of allowing others to take care of you as well I think is really important that's great that's really great thank you um and we've got a comment here as well uh, agree, Kate. Forum culture is a huge help for me as a teenager and young adult experiencing mental health difficulties. And I think again, it's just I'm assuming a generation thing. Because obviously, again, I clearly know that from school it was a um, it was a big thing of forum. And 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 is that maybe a form of anonymity as well? You know, it was that was an opportunity to be able to say things behind not necessarily having to be seen as as you. Yeah. I think, um, and, and I, I agree again. I'm yeah. oh, sorry. Okay, <laughs> we're sort of talking over each other. Um, but I think, yeah, my concern about um, like forums and and those the only thing that sort of comes up with me for that is again, I think it's quite prominent in the uh, eating disorder community. Is there are a lot of sites out there that are like pro, like they're called pro ana sites that they're horrible they're really scary and just even the idea that you can be searching for support and that that can be what comes up um like because if you look for like support with anorexia that's what they're kind of badged as but what they mean is we're going to support you to be good at it um and that idea that there are there are online forums that can be harmful to people as well as the ones that can be helpful and how do we the problem almost with the internet is it's just it's not moderated in any fashion so how do we make sure that people who are vulnerable are protected when they're trying to use these sites to get support and to get genuine help and then potentially are pushed in the wrong direction I think and yeah made to feel guilty almost for wanting to get out of it and want to wanting to get better um yeah so I think it's just it, it's such a difficult line because they can be so it can be such a valuable use of support for people but it's it's just a really risky uh, area I think that's a really important comment um Kate I've just messaged you on the private chat your internet mm -hmm. keeps freezing so I think that's why there's a bit of a delay but we'll we'll pass over to you oh yeah 
Oh, you're not, you're not... <laughs> Sorry, Jax, I'm... Um, Is that... We can hear you now, yeah. Let's start talking. Do, 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 do. Go on, Kate. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, that's what, something about the internet and mental health and technology and lockdown all converging when you get that Zoom anxiety because you start speaking and then it goes silent and you're like, have I just said something awful? That's a fun part of lockdown. That's just, it still can't get over that. Anyway, side note. Mm. Um, I think, sorry, Rosie, your point about forums is actually a really good point. And I've definitely myself experienced that where you, especially with the pro Anna stuff, it's really insidious and awful and sad. And just, this is, sorry, a tangent, but I think, yeah, sorry, no, I won't get out the tangent. Um, what was I going to say? No, I've, I've, I've distracted myself from my own voice. I'm so sorry. <laughs> So definitely on internet um, forums and the pros and cons and yes i think it comes back to that, that like, thank you jake it comes back sure. to that idea again of have this idea of a toolkit so it's great if you have um online support as part of your toolkit but completely relying on that as a salt as a source of, of all your support is dangerous and especially because a lot of forums are peer-to-peer -peer, which is great but that sometimes you do need professional help or you need someone in real life you can help you so it's, it's part of having that vast toolkit so you're like on one day i need you know i need my online friends on another day i need my family another day i need a walk or you know it's having this kind of vast um toolkit to kind of pick and choose from and you only you only learn what you need through trial and error um and something i kind of wanted to touch on which i think we kind of uh, there's a comment i think yeah it was rachel irvin's comment um saying recognizing you have a certain baseline of emotional energy or resources to deploy in self-care. Something, again, not to be too depressing early on, but I have to remind myself, is that like mental health doesn't, isn't really curable <laughs> or like it, it's, if you've, I've got depression, I will have depression for the rest of my life, likely at times it will be lower, or it'll be more manageable or it will be less prevalent. But it's sometimes, I think that can be an important slack to cut yourself that rarely, most mental health conditions that I, my understanding is that they're manageable. You, you, you learn to manage them and you learn to live with them, but you very rarely cure them. So it can actually, and sometimes I'll be chatting to my friends, I'll be like, God, I feel awful. Like, why can't I get out of this slump? Like, oh, because you got depression, Kate. That's why, because it's it's, this, it's it's a chronic health condition. Um, and I think um, it touches on eating disorders, eating disorders as well, like the fact that you can come out of a bad patch but it's always there and I think on one hand that's really depressing um on the other it's kind of it for me it helps cut you some slack it's like okay I, this isn't a thing I can beat it isn't like a kind of I need to do this one thing or like and that'll be it done tick and it won't bother me again um and that kind of feeds into lots of things so like maybe you I, I did therapy and it really works for you but then it stops working that's not your fault it's not the therapist's fault it's just the nature of the human mind is that things change and so yeah it's kind of and also it's, I think it's important to be aware of that like if you're kind of starting out on your mental health journey through life you, it's it probably will be with you for the rest of your life in different forms um yeah sorry sorry for the ramble there no, great. no it's great I think they're really great points. Can I just bring up a comment, Rosie, quick, but first from Paul about, because again, I think it does touch upon some of those points. So lockdown is an interesting point. There will be definitely be more people suffering with undiagnosed mental health conditions as an unintended consequence of containing coronavirus. And I do think it's a really important point because I think it will have heightened that for a lot of people. So you can sort of see a little bit in the background and Steph, hopefully you'll recognize Wales in the background and you can see the um, Capucura, I think it's called. But that's a photo that I took about two or three years ago now and that's a place that i enjoy visiting and i work part-time on purpose to be able to go and do that because i don't like going on a weekend where there's loads of people there and the lockdown meant well one wales banned me from attending for four months particularly um but but you couldn't just go out and enjoy a, an environment in the quiet really um so that that certainly then impacted on me because something i used to cope with coronavirus was not uh, to cope with coronavirus to cope with mental health was not sort of accessible to me at that point someone's clearly making dinner in the background there just a tiny bit distracting <laughs> um but i just wanted to for the last 15 minutes i just wanted to see well not for the 15 minutes but 
So Kate, you touched upon something that you know I learned again when I was a councillor, and I used to attend obviously these after dinner speeches, dinners, because obviously, you know, you're a politician, but you spent most of the money you got from being a councillor paying the party that you were part of to campaign. Um, and there was a speaker on who was talking about how they live with uh, depression, right? So they've never said, "I've got over it, I've cured it, I, I'm, I'm happy." It was about living with it, and 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 some days it will take over and some days it won't and, and how they do that and that was a huge huge eye opener for me and i think it did change the dynamics of how i talk about or even think about mental health so i hate it i definitely wish that i didn't have those problems but what i try to do and tell you interview every interview i've had for the last couple of years i've talked about it very openly you know so i can give you an example of a live one at the moment um I've wanted to be a police officer for a long time, but not full time. So a special constable, if you've heard of them, would volunteer police officers with the same sort of responsibility. And I went for an interview for a local police force and was very open throughout the interview about depression, about anxiety, about suicidal thoughts, and about how I think that related to policing and the problems they have to face. I left that interview with them wanting to appoint me as a special inspector, you know, so jumping quite a few of those ranks based upon the idea that I was being very open about those problems, very rational about how I thought we had to deal with and respond to them. And certainly at Sitton's advice, you know, the one front door that we introduced through the coronavirus pandemic, a crisis helpline, again, I think was based on my anxiety. It was the anxiety of being in lockdown and not knowing who I could get support from. I'm someone who lives 300 miles away from my family and friends. You know, I live in the South, uh, obviously um, working in Wokingham. And when I was going to the council, I was saying, I don't want people to be given a menu of options that eligibility is different for different bits and what you might be able to do and might not be able to do when you should be able to just contact one organization who says, right, here's everything you need. You know, and you could do with a bit of help from us on your benefits, your debt and whatever. And that's proved to be really, really successful. But I do think, and I might be doing myself a disservice, but I do think it's based upon my own anxieties and my own problems that I experience that makes me think in that way a bit of, looking at an experience and thinking, right, how would I want that to be for me if I was the one needing that support? Do you think for, for the three of you, there's been other situations where you have been able to make that a positive experience or a positive output, should the same? Yeah, absolutely. I think, like, I often sort of think of my mental health almost as my superpower, if you like. It's mm -hmm. that if I, if I can get past that, I can basically do anything. Like, it's fine. I, I can bring myself back from the verge of something very dangerous and, and actually put myself back in it um and I do think also it yeah it gives me empathy it gives me the ability to connect better with my colleagues and with sort of why you know as a partnerships manager like that is actually to build connections with people and to build relationships that's my strength is actually I I get it I get what real life is and I'm not af afraid to talk about it a little bit as well and I think that sometimes is what is needed to kind of bring people on further and I think it is just like actually we just need to kind of be a bit more real there's a whole thing that like sort of moving towards talking about bringing our whole selves to work and like actually that I think is I've been able to do that much more effectively because I sort of think actually yeah you know if again like if we talked about it more it would be easier to kind of to manage and I think yeah it I, I definitely feel like it it helps me uh, as much as it kind of sometimes it gets in the way, <laughs> I do think it, it does yeah. help in a lot of yeah. situations as well. Yeah. Yeah, I like that idea of, um, I kind of that's definitely charm that idea of like, if I can get through that, I can get through anything. Um, and it's made, yeah, I think it, 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 it reframes my experience of mental health, re reframes how you see the rest of the world, mm. which sounds a bit, um, dramatic but I think it, it perspective I think having been to really low dark places when you get on an even keel and get to like experience joy and happiness or like kind of get to out of that place it really profoundly changes how I think about life and kind of it, it's a very nice thing of having been in that place where you don't want to be alive to to do want to be alive it's, it's a very very profound um thing and I think yeah. that's something I'm sure it'll be touched on a lot throughout the day but um mental health sucks and it is not good poor mental health sucks but um there is oh it's manageable and that there's the the moments where the clouds part and 
things get better are really really worth sticking around for or sorry it's again dramatic but um and, and, and going back to your point rosie i think this is about empathy and kind of compassion and i think it's really important to see those as um like useful skills at work like i, I i'm very much in the kind of touchy-feely management style of being or like i think again it's coming back to the idea of being in the uh, charity sector where that kind of thinking is much more accepted and tolerated. And I think environments where I've worked in the past where it's been very kind of like corporate and it just isn't conducive to um, to kind of people working in the best way. And I think that's why people burn out because you, you, people work, um, they manage to work under high pressure situations because they find weird coping mechanisms, but it's not sustainable and I think and um, yeah, it was just Sarah's comment here from Facebook, I'm going to read out, pretend I'm on the news. Um, empathy mm -hmm. is such a valuable trait and we need to, as a society to recognise it that more. I like the idea of being seen as superpower. Thank you, Sarah Brown. Um, yeah, I think vulner using vulnerability and compassion and empathy as like just another part of like a, a manager's toolkit is really important because, yeah, I just, it, it's so much more, in my experience, it's so much more productive than shouting at people. Well, that's fun to, sometimes too. But. <laughs> um, I completely I, agree. And I think that um, there's something really strong about that superpower as well. Because I think it's something that I saw as like um, kind of a, a really difficult thing um, initially in, say, in trying to kind of um, tell people about my mental health or kind of be kind to myself about my mental health, which is for me the hardest thing being kind to myself um but i would tell all of you to be really kind to yourselves and then not do it to myself um but i think also um kind of being a bit more open about it and talking to people about um, my mental health has has really shown that superpower and shown that um today i'm feeling really really rubbish but maybe tomorrow i'll feel better or maybe like in an hour i'll feel better who knows but it's also helped me grow some really tough skin um for there's been um, kind of situations where if I told someone about my mental health and the reaction was actually, are you sure you have mental health problems? I think it's just this instead. Um, kind of growing that skin to say, um, kind of actually, that's your opinion, that's fine. But this is what I know about myself and, and being really true to yourself within it um, is a, a superpower that is really, really special and spectacular to have. I think it's great. I'm really, really enjoying the contributions and I'm definitely looking forward to the rest of the day because, you know, the the the, the, the whole context is really important, isn't it? Because, you know, Kate, you, you touched upon the point there of, you know, it is it is hell to live with. You know, there's no there's no denying that mental health is not an enjoyable thing to have. I think for me, I wanted to talk about some of the positives because I do think, you know, we, we do ourselves a disservice enough to then have to only talk about the negatives all day long. So I think that's that's an important aspect as well. But I just wonder whether someone could be, is it Anis? Is it Anis from National? I don't know. I'm so yeah. bad on I have pronouncing names. But um, I think it's a really interesting comment from there. Um, and Kate, I like, I'm going to email Gillian because I like the idea of the 24 hour Sit and Device news channel uh, where we read out <laughs> all of the latest news. So if uh, Steph, do you want to read out that comment? Yeah, sure. Um, so Ernest has said in the workplace um, where we tend to bring our best selves, I think we can sometimes be so keen to demonstrate that we're functional and productive despite our mental health conditions, um, that we can portray them into our colleagues and managers um, as a transient state. I'll be back to normal soon kind of mentality, um, which is, of course, um, it, it's a mis representation um, when we don't get back to better soon. Um, so kind of the fact that we're living with that mental health um, for the long term, um, but with uh, a greater or less severe um, in the short term. So it's, it's hard to say, um, Anis has said it's hard to say if there's a solution, um, but there is definitely something about um, kind of having that support from your team or your line manager or um, kind of your, your wider um, kind of office around um, kind of recognizing that 
um, mental health is a day-to-day -day thing and um, one day is going to be um, bright just like the weather, one day is going to be bright sun um, and one day it might be um, thunderstorms but that's not to mean that it's going to be thunderstorms forever um, but it will probably come back so kind of just having um, that support and uh, guidance kind of around everyone I think is really important. I, and, and do you think as well because it, it, you know, that's again a really really interesting comment isn't it I think today will be really fascinating uh, on this subject well but it's it's not other people's fault as well because I think when you then when you're then and you know and, and you two might know this better than me have lucky enough to have husbands to to support you but um this idea that it's not then necessarily someone else's fault so when you then talk about it and then say like, oh well, what have I done what what you know if I especially including at work because obviously that's where I'm then talking about it is then it's suddenly someone's fault because you are you know you are feeling down or you, you know you, you are experiencing um, poor mental health at that time that, that i do think it's hard for people to disconnect themselves from that and just say actually okay if that's if that's how you are feeling today that's how you're feeling and obviously what can we do to support i've definitely seen it where people have took it to a oh well, what have i done you know what, what how have i impacted on that and that's not necessarily you know the case is it so yeah i think it's we are we are drawn to like logically think we have to think things through logically so like if you feel like this x must have happened and like this and that's you know again for all for the, the sort of supportive element it can be really difficult when you've got then someone then being like but but now what and how do i fix that and like how do i how do we put that right how am i going to stop you feeling like that because you know if you if something's forced made you to feel like that then we can we can divert it and make you feel something else it's like you can't make me feel anything unfortunately this is just how I feel and you know I'm gonna have to sit with it for a bit and it's gonna have like hopefully that will it will pass and it's that thing of I think again we we are drawn to apologize for our mental health so often that, that we're sort of saying I'm really sorry I'll get back to normal or I will you know when I'm feeling all right again and again it puts that pressure on ourselves to say right I should be doing this I should be behaving like this I, I apologize it normal service will resume and then it will be okay again and it's like actually if I just said do you know what I feel really rubbish for 24 hours I'm probably not going to be my best self I'm gonna and and I actually I did this it was more of a physical thing but I think it would have gone down equally acceptably if I'd said it uh, to my boss I basically not that long ago a couple of weeks ago during lockdown I'd had a horrendous night's sleep I was absolutely shattered and I just said to my boss I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm not functioning very well because I'm really tired. What I'm going to do is just focus on like all the little sort of quite menial jobs that I need to get ticked off my to-do list, but I often don't do them because they kind of just sit there. Um, I'm probably not going to try and attempt to do anything big today because I just can't. Um, and then I'll tackle that tomorrow when I feel better, like when I've had a good night's sleep and I feel all right and that's yeah. fine. And I think equally, had I said to her, to be fair, I just I'm having a really difficult day with my mental health, and and for all of those exact same reasons, I'm going to do these tasks that feel achievable, and tomorrow I'll tackle the bigger thing. I think that would have been okay as well. And I think we just need to get better at saying that. So like, I know me, I know how I work, and feeling strong enough to say this just isn't going to happen today, but it's all right because it's going to get done. It's just like I just need to adjust the time frame a bit. Um, and, and if we felt more confident, I think it would yeah. be better. Yeah. I'm just going to bring um, Sue and Jill in because I think what we've decided to now do is have a little bit of a crossover and, and try and have a bit more voices. And then Kate, Rosie, and Steph, you know, in a, in a couple of minutes, then you can head off if you want to, or you can stay for 12 hours and I won't complain. Um, so, so, so uh, um, do, do you want to do you want to carry on with that bit or sum up? how you because I think that I was probably gone quite fast hasn't it really in terms of we've talked about a lot of different yeah. things obviously to introduce the day definitely I think the only point that I was going to add on with um I'm sorry with uh Rosie's point was kind of especially with lockdown um especially with lockdown as well you're with your um your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your husband or your wife or whoever um all day, every day. Um, and while that's something that's really, really special, I think that can make um, kind of going through these mental health kind of hills and valleys um, even more difficult because they are just seeing it constantly where if you're going into the office or you're going to the gym or whatever, um, you kind of have that, that space to try to help yourself and give yourself that space. But I think picking up hobbies or things that you can do yourself um, that really help you will be really, really 
good as well. But that's all I had to say. No, I think that's great. Um, so, and Jill, did you pick up anything from that session? Because I know you were watching some of that session, particularly so I know you were commenting before. Um, no, it was just, it was really interesting. Good morning, everyone. Um, no, I think it's a great start to the day. It was really interesting. Um, I've been thinking about one of the things, I don't know if you covered this, I didn't manage to listen to the whole session about how this is about about mental health and about mental health disorders, but also about um, a, a kind of wider than that, in that, um, that anyone who's suffering any kind of, of psychological distress would benefit from the, the discussions that we're having today, not just those that have any kind of mental health disorder or diagnosis. I think it's really important to normalise that discussion and to have that, that openness, but also to kind of take it beyond that as well and, and reach out, because I think, particularly, I don't know how much you've mentioned yet this morning around obviously COVID, I'm sure that's going to come up a lot today. But during the last four or five months, I think you'd be hard pushed to find anyone in the world who hasn't suffered some kind of psychological distress, whether or not that's reached the level or is, is, is related to any kind of mental health disorder. So I want to sort of include that within the discussion. I, I, but I don't know if that would come up or not. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with Sue. I think there's probably a lot of people who um, didn't feel that they had any problems with their mental health who have really struggled um and, and been on that roller coaster i think you, you were mentioning about a um a roller coaster and i think for most people it has been one day's been quite good and you felt able to cope and the next is is just really really challenging for no apparent reason um just such a change in in everything that's happening absolutely and hi, Rachel, you're here as well. So hi, hi. we'll do proper introductions for you all in a moment. Um, no no problem with the, with the headphones bit. So I think um, I, I just like this little bit of a, it's sort of, it's more busy as well, having all of you on this, the screen, which is, which is great. So we'll try and do some of the crossovers um, throughout. So um, thank you, Kate, Rosie, and, and Steph for your contributions for that first hour. It's really great. And, and, and we're looking forward to seeing you at your sessions later on <laughs> in the day as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks. So, hi. Um, so, we've got Sue, Rachel, and Jill. Um, Rachel, I'm just going to edit your name just to, so that we can put in national on that. Um, so, do you want to introduce yourselves? And then we'll introduce what the panel is for today. So, we'll start with Sue. Hi, I'm Sue. I'm the Chief Officer at Winchester District Citizens Advice. Um, and just to say, in case it comes up and it's relevant, I'm six months in post, so I was in post about six weeks before COVID hit, um, which I think is quite interesting from the perspective of stress <laughs> and coping with stress in, in a new role. And Rachel? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Rachel Irvin. I'm the Performance Manager at National Citizens Advice. So um, I'm responsible for managing the team which delivers leadership self-assessments, uh, which obviously is quite an emotive um, issue at times. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. And Jill? Hi, I'm Jill. I'm the Chief Officer in Citizens Advice Cornwall. Um, and previously, I was the Director of Cornwall Samaritans. So mental health has been um, very much part of my life for a long, long time. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you. So, um, Jill, do you want to introduce this hour? Because I think this was your concept, wasn't it, for the for the panel? So, so what are we going to talk about in this hour? Yeah, th this is very much um, about listening and talking about how you're feeling. And actually, it links very much um, to what Stephanie was saying just now about being a little bit honest about how you're feeling. The importance of, of, of listening, active listening, um, allowing your team to really talk about how they're feeling, giving them permission. And I've found, I know there's very differing um, viewpoints. I've always been quite honest about how I, I'm feeling, not, not to the point that I will burst into tears and, and share all of my problems with my team, but actually to say, do you know what, I'm really struggling this week, um, just give me a bit of slack. And I think that in the course, I've been in post about 18 months, I think that has encouraged people to open up about how they're feeling um, so I, I quite regularly have people either email me or, or call me just to say actually I'm, I'm struggling a bit and we can have that open conversation give them a bit of leeway 
Um, so I think it's 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 all right to be honest with your team. I think it's great. I think it's I think it's really interesting. I I'm, I am particularly interested in 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 because obviously you know I, I'll talk about that a little bit later on in the in the leaders panel and, and Rachel, you and I have had conversations about you know when we. Um, when Jan and I did the um, session of conference, and I know you've done stuff for National Sitting Device as well on being open and talking about mental health years before I was even thought of in the Sitting Device network. So I know you've been championing that for for a while. I do just, just do, do you really like that idea of um, you know just being honest and saying, look, I'm just I'm just not feeling it this week, so please do just bear with me because on the on the um, you know the video that I did, it was around that pressure of it feels like certainly in a manager role of which all of us are in, um, you've, it sometimes feels, certainly to me, that you have to be always on on game. You always have to be in control. You always have to be able to answer quick fire questions that are coming to you and deal with problems and challenges. And actually, sometimes it just isn't your day and sometimes it isn't your week. And I think, you know, um, so I've had conversations with you about that and that's why we did the peer support calls for, for CEOs is, not every week is, you know, uh, is great for you, and 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 sometimes there are external factors that affect that, and sometimes it just is what it is. So, have your team positively responded to that? You know, because I know you're saying they're then open with you, but have people continued to just put the pressure on you, or have you noticed a a very clear sort of taking that step back away from putting that pressure on you? I, I think you always get that pressure. Um, I've just every day you come in and there, and there's something different um that that is asked of you and it just by being very open and saying you know, i think last week it was i've got a brain like concrete today so mm-hmm. if i give you something that's a little bit random just bear with me um and we work through it you know i think it it just encourages people to understand that you're human as well that sometimes the pressure does get too much and and that, you know i've had a, a long career in lots of different things um and i have seen people burn out because they haven't been honest about how they're feeling and the mess that that causes afterwards um and, and you know about five or six years ago i was in danger of that because i just internalized everything and um uh, one of my friends said you know i completely wrapped myself in bubble wrap So I wasn't feeling anything good and I wasn't feeling anything bad. I just wasn't feeling, I was just functioning. And I'm not sure I actually made very rational decisions at that time. Um, So it was a question of unpeeling that bubble wrap and and now having, you know, allowing yourself to have the highs and lows and go with it. I think that's really important. I think it's really important to normalize that conversation and to show, to be a good example about that as a leader or manager. And to be open with your team and not to be afraid to say, I'm having a bad week. And, and particularly since lockdown, since COVID, I've, it's been hugely pressured. And I felt that's hugely important to keep that conversation going with everyone in the organisation and to frequently say if I, how I'm managing it and how I'm feeling this week. And, and particularly when the pace has been really fren- frenetic and I've been, I found it really important to say to my team, how are you? Because I'm feeling like this and how are you feeling? Um, and, and, you know, I'm not great this week or or the workplace just got too much for this week and this is what I'm trying to do about it. How are you and where are you? And just trying to encourage people to to be open about their feelings. I think I've, I've noticed at times in the past, I've always been open about this. Sometimes you get that look of shock in people's eyes. They're a bit like oh, someone in a senior position admitting a weakness. Oh, oh no, you're supposed to be the strong one. And I think I think it's really important to challenge that kind of reaction and to say, this is a sign of strength because we all feel this at times and showing your weaknesses in a way is a sign of strength. So, um, yeah, I think that's a really important conversation to be having. And Jill, I wanted to ask you quickly about, um, give, I didn't realise about your Samaritans background around the active listening because I, yeah. I first came across active listening about a year ago in a previous role where I was observing training of volunteers. It wasn't Samaritans, but it was a different helpline where the callers would have been experiencing some kind of trauma or distress. And the volunteers were being taught about the techniques of of active listening. And I thought it was such a powerful tool. I'd previously thought I was a good listener until I heard this, went through this training and realized how bad I I can be as a listener. Would you mind, I'm sure you could explain it better than I could because I only just came across it with that. Would you mind talking us through the concept? Sure. So our default, um, as humans, our default is when you're listening to someone is to be 
formulating your reply. So you're actually listening to uh, and thinking about something else. With active listening, you're putting yourself and your thoughts and your preconceptions aside completely. And you're focusing on what that person is saying and how they're saying it. And obviously in Samaritans, 95% of it is on the phone. So you're you're listening for those little intonations, the, the words, the way they phrase things. Um, not to reply, and actually quite often at the end of uh, what whatever they've said, I don't say anything and I'm just sort of say, okay, I'm just processing what you're saying and trying to understand it. And then it's coming back with, um, so what you're saying is, and trying to paraphrase it so that the, the person at the other end can actually hear back what, they, what they're thinking, not what you're thinking, not like, um, oh, I had a great holiday last week. Well, it's not as good as my holiday. It's, so, so tell me a bit more about your holiday. It's exploring what that is, putting yourself, standing alongside that person and trying to see the world from their point of view. And, and we have what's called a listening wheel. So there's all sorts of, there's the, the, um, the, the questioning, there's the reacting. Um, I, I should have it in front of me now. I should mm -hmm. know it all. Off Sorry, I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> um, but the most important part of that listening wheel is the bit in the center, which is silence. And as we're really uncomfortable in a conversation about not saying anything, but actually being in Samaritans has taught me, and I use it a lot here, is just zip it because that person who's talking may want may have more stuff that they're struggling to get out and if you leave it quiet they will they will feel they've got the space to talk um we, we try and we try and have too many two-way conversations when actually what people need is just for you to shut up and and let them let everything out Jill, you're giving me flashbacks to school now of because that was the most common phrase I was ever told by a teacher was to just zip it. But I do think it's really, really interesting. Obviously, I just want to bring Rachel in as well before we then do go on to that full subject of of, of talking and, and thinking about feelings. But I just have this quick thought of surely on the phone, that is the biggest fear of just being silent as 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 the person providing help. So, you know, my, my thought of then have of calling Samaritans would be that they're going to give you some comments back and say your questions and what it seems that you're coming across is actually you're not afraid then to have that silent period. And and I do know, obviously, just through talking to people anyways, people do tend to open up more and more when you don't give them answers because you are just... So I get that there's that part, but is it not, awkward, is it not your first sort of worry that actually your expectations or you've got to sort of try and help this person not to sit and give silence in that conversation? I think it's okay to say... Um... I've gone a bit, you know, I'm, I'm quiet now because I'm just thinking about what you said. Yeah, I just want to make sure I think about this properly. I don't want to shoot from the hip. Um, I just want to make sure, well, as you said, Jill, that I'm processing what you said. Um, and that's respecting you know, the other person's point of view and the other mm. people's feelings and their you know, their circumstances. Because if you, if, if you don't take a moment to just order what you think they've said and then reflect back to them that you've understood it properly then you could just go off in a completely wrong direction couldn't you and if you're making assumptions that are wrong um that could be actually really damaging um so um i think it's okay if you feel awkward with the silence say i'm not ignoring you i'm just thinking about what you said Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you can then paraphrase what they've already said back to them. It, it, you know, it, so what you you've just told me is, and they can say, well, actually, that's not quite what I meant. You know, you're just clarifying what they have said, and that then might lead on to something more. I think we're, we're often in danger of of trying to solve the presenting problem <clears throat> without exploring everything else that that happens, and and we could, you know particularly with insistence advice, we could just be putting a sticking plaster over one part and, and, and not looking at, at everything that's that's happening behind. I, I, I'm pretty sure that it doesn't happen, that doesn't happen 99% of the time, but there is always that, you know, if there's there's one massive issue, that, that are we really looking at, at everything else that it is, is has led up to that? 
I think it's interesting. We've got just a very quick comment for you here from Diane, who's one of our volunteers at Woking Gun. Um, silent to an active listening, though, in, in, in the training advice, it's around not being silent and sort of doing that. Does that ring true with you, yeah. Jill, particularly? Yeah, absolutely. If, if you know, just to say, mm, yeah, or I'm still here and, and um, I, I'm just thinking about what you said, or, or, or can you just... Can you just go over that the, something that you just said? Can you just repeat that again? Because it might come over differently. Um, yeah. But but so, again, you know, sometimes silence, not saying anything, and they will come back. You're still there, and you're, yeah, I'm still here. Um, and that just makes you makes them feel as though you're still with them. So. Uh, the, sorry, the, just the, the video equivalent. We're all doing it. We're all nodding along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so you can tell that we're engaged. I think it's a good. Point. I, I think I think it's going to be a really interesting hour. Sorry, Sue, go on. No, I just think it's it's about um, when and how you have that conversation because we could be talking. I think uh, throughout the day we need to come back to: Are we talking about work with clients? Are we talking about supporting colleagues? volunteers and staff's um, well-being so you might have these kind of conversations mm -hmm. and I'm wondering about doing this within Winchester District around encouraging these kind of conversations where you have a kind of well-being being cool with a buddy or with someone else where you you agree that you're going to have this support call so you are now going to do active listening and so you've kind of agreed that set up so both the listener and the talker have agreed that that's what you're doing and then you can kind of you can agree the purpose of it because my understanding Joe, is it is a very much the active listening isn't about which isn't about what we do as an organization about advice it's active listening is about just sitting like you said just sitting alongside someone and just it's not about moving them forwards in a way i'm not talking about work with clients now i'm talking about perhaps supporting a, a colleague with their mental health it's about just letting them feel heard and yeah. sitting alongside them it's not it's signposting and referring on where needed but actually being listened to is a really powerful thing in itself and it can be an end in itself and that that support can be really powerful just as a as a colleague to colleague but you'd kind of need to agree that that's what you're doing and then when you are doing that then you can all be calm you can say there may be silences um I, i'm not going to try and give you advice I'll, I'll check in and check that i've understood what you're saying but this is the kind of purpose of that discussion yeah i i think particularly at the moment it's really important that we support each other um and active listening is really important in that, I, I don't know about you, but I've still got quite a number of people who are working remotely. I've got some people who are coming into offices and and that's because they found it that it was really difficult um, not having that human contact. But quite probably about 75% of my workforce and volunteers are still working remotely. And, and checking in with them is, is really important they can feel really isolated and particularly if they've had difficult calls with clients um there there isn't that network of people sat next to them to say you know let's go and get a cup of tea or um let's talk it through uh, that that's the feedback that i'm getting from quite a few people that that they're struggling um with without that support yeah they can ring someone but that's not quite the same as having your buddy sitting alongside you. <laughs> Can I just come in on that? Because my um, I'm a permanently home-based worker because um, the office where I used to work was closed. Um, and everybody in my team is a permanently home-based worker as well. And given the nature of the role that performance assessors do, they're on the road a lot, they're on their own, they're away from their families. Um, and... Um, you know, they are going into local offices and having very difficult conversations sometimes. Uh, the time is quite, quite significant. So um, I feel very strongly that it's important to acknowledge that doing um, active listening when you are remote from each other, it does take more energy um, or a different energy. And I think it's really important to say, you know, we're going to have this, this conversation about how we feel or frustrating some, you know, something um, and um, afterwards you're going to need a little bit of downtime you're just going to need to go get a cup of tea or look outside the window or go in the garden if you've got one or whatever because because you have to put so much in 
when it's remote. And I think a lot of people through coronavirus have found um, it's been really interesting in national um, because as a home worker, we often feel that um, uh, the, 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 the structures of citizens' advice don't necessarily support home workers in the same way. Now, everybody's a home worker and people are going, actually, this is really hard, isn't it? This is really isolating. Oh, my God, I've put on weight. Um, how, do, how do you make time for yourself in your day? All of those sorts of um, things. And, and active listening remotely is is hard and, and doing your, the entirety of your job remotely is hard. And I think people are finding that out. That's very, I'm quite protective of my team because that's all we have. Yeah. Um, yeah, we only meet together as a team twice a year um, physically because because of budget. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's. I think it's really important to take those things into account. So I think you're right. I think remote work is an absolutely really important part of that. And, and Rachel, I think I remember talking to you um, the other year when I first joined as CEO and saying that, you know, because my perception of home worker was absolutely around, you know, if you're not in the office, you just don't know what's going on. You're not having conversations as you're passing by with people. So I was always fascinated by, by that idea. And I was sort of, as you say, living it. And I do think maybe it is a bit different because, as you say, because we're all doing it, maybe, maybe the... The, the connections with that is probably a bit better. I know the experiences obviously are still difficult, but obviously we're not seeing it as in half of our team or three quarters of, of our team being in the office and then feeling disconnected from from that as well, which which I would hate to obviously see us, us move towards. So on, on talking about and, and, and listening on feelings, so Rachel, I just don't obviously interested in your point then as, of a home worker, because obviously that is the likelihood, you know, our team are majority going to be working from home, at least for the rest of this year. What are your tips and, and advice on that as someone who's, who's, who's dead open about mental health in terms of talking about that topic and is managing a team and working from home yourself? Well, I think just to go back to points that others have made before me, transparency. Um, transparency is a value of citizens' advice. Um, so I think it's it's very important to, if you can be transparent about where you're coming from, um, if you're having a bad time yourself, um, but also the active listening as well. So p- picking up on cues when you're not in a room with somebody is a slightly different skill set. So doing it on the phone, as you said, Jill, you know, picking up on how people phrase things or um, people's tone of voice or the, their silences um it is a, a a real skill to develop and i think doing you know we we do all our work over video all of it um so um i think there's a real you can you can you can pick up on some cues that you would pick up on if somebody was in a room so you can see how someone's holding their body or you know um technology sometimes doesn't help if somebody freezes and you think oh, what's yeah. the matter <laughs> you realize it's the internet um so yeah those sorts of things really so i think being transparent and being just being um authentic um for me is really important um making sure that people understand that doing work over video um and having difficult conversations about work things or feelings um or both if it's if they're related Mm -hmm. um uh, then it just takes so much energy and I think it takes more energy so um, make sure you take time to recuperate afterwards um, I, I don't know really I think I think it's the sort of thing that you take for granted when you do it um, yeah, and st- yeah, standing point. back from it and thinking how do you do that is actually quite a challenge in itself um, t- trying trying not to make assumptions I think about about people particularly from where they are um so you know I mean I, I've been on um lots of um workplace events recently and you know one of the best things is that you see into people's houses but, <laughs> um, but at the same time you can't make assumptions about people from the houses can you um so um i think that's um really important although i have got some brilliant decorating ideas <laughs> <laughs> can i just say rachel because I, I i was invited to join a committee recently and an external one and um, i'd made some sort of comment and i don't know why it was then interpreted that way and he said it's very easy for you to say with your grand piano sitting behind you and it's me bed it's it's, it's funny for the, 
<laughs> Please, I'm not a grand piano. Um, but but so, so that insight into people's homes can quite often just be a, a little bit far off the uh, reality because I certainly don't sleep on a grand piano. But it's really interesting. But, but, but actually, on, on that point, I think also when you're in a big meeting um, and people uh, and, and the discussion does get difficult, then sometimes people will want to turn the camera off yes. as yeah. well, uh, and that's okay. Um, I think if it's all the time, then then it's it's something that you might want to talk about and say, you know, why are you feeling that you need to do that all the time? Um, you know, is there something behind that? But but I think on occasion it's fine to turn your camera off if you just need to be able to be and and be able to be present in the in the discussion. Um, so yeah. I know it's not feelings, but I tell you what, because again, I know I've talked to you, Rachel, about this before. That whenever we've spoken on the phone and our conversations often have been quite lengthy when we've when we've had a chat. I like to walk around, and that's what I find really difficult with being on Google Meet or Zoom or whatever. It is you've got to sit still, yeah. and obviously it's twelve hours today, so you've got to just sit and watch the screen. And more often than not, people say, "Oh, your signal's gone," because I'm walking all the way around the house in the garden and and whatever, because I can't unless I'm in a meeting and actually sitting physically with people, I don't like to sit still and have a conversation. I don't know if it's nervousness and energy or whatever, but I definitely like to, to walk around. So I think, again, with sort of the video thing, that's another point of, you know, people have different ways of coping with conversations and managing conversations, don't we? And if, if you've got to sit still and always be, and Jill, obviously I just wrote to you privately about we couldn't see you anymore. So that's all the, obviously the difficulties we then have with, with video so so sue and jill obviously we have the, the situation of uh, and, and i know obviously national we do as well of having volunteers in the witness service and stuff but in lcas obviously local sit interface a majority certainly of my team 80 volunteers and 10 staff five full-time equivalent a large part of our job is supporting and and and, and motivating our, our volunteers who are often in one day a week for example or, or sometimes less sometimes more uh, what what are, what are your thoughts on 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 that including staff as i said as well because most of our staff are maybe part-time certainly in our lca as well but that's really important aspects as well isn't it of different dynamics of, of roles that they play in the organization and not necessarily being part of one team you have day cultures, don't you? Of being in a different day and having mm. a different feeling of your organisation. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of this is around. Sorry, Jill, to jump that we, I don't know if I was just talking over topic. Um, a lot of this for us is around internal communications, around supporting and encouraging people to listen and talk about their feelings, and just generally managing well-being. One of our biggest issues, and like you, Jake, we've got a lot of people home working at the moment, and they probably will be the majority of them um, for this year um and internal communications is a big thing so every day like you say each each day has its own group of advisors and own feel and they have a video morning briefing which anyone who's listening who's outside sit device is the kind of a, a morning update on on advice services before you go into your session and that lasts about 15 minutes and all of our advisors over i think this started a few weeks in have started casually meeting about half an hour before that. So not even necessarily with their supervisor. They all come in, they get a cup of tea and they just have a chat. And it's not about advice and it's not about work. It's how are you, it's what you would do in the office as you're coming in and putting your coat up and talking about the weather and whatever else. They're tr we're trying to bring that into home working. And equally at the end of the sessions, also having a bit of that kind of just let's all come on and talk about how it went and just offload a bit. Um, and we're looking at, I don't want to get too technical because I can't, because I don't understand it, but we're looking at MS Teams and the possibilities, this comes into internal comms, about having chat functions during the session just to encourage that. One of the, I think, Jill, you mentioned before that people are really missing in the office environment. If you've had a particularly difficult conversation with a client, being able to then turn around to a colleague and just not necessarily looking for advice, but just to kind of offload, that, oh, that was hard or whatever and you're, you're kind of missing that as part of this home working yeah. so we're trying to look at ways of having that either chat or or through the kind of video functions or whatever but what are you doing Jill around that? Um, well we started off by having a daily catch-up at about three o'clock before people went home um, I really like the idea of the morning catch-up we, we ran we ran that until about two weeks ago and we were doing it every day and to begin with we had you know up to about 30 people joining us and it was great and it, sometime some days it was talking about the cases what we were seeing some days it was talking about what we we're going to have for tea or what we'd done at the weekend and that sort of thing and we started up a whatsapp group and to begin with it was really active and lively but over the course of the the lockdown it, it sort of tailed off so i thought well actually perhaps 
daily was a bit too much and as the workload was increasing people were finding it difficult so we've gone to once a week on a tuesday lunchtime i have to say we've run it twice now today there'll be the third week it hasn't been massively attended um but i'm hoping you know, i'm going to keep at it and keep plugging it and hope that people do join in well, i do have a catch up with the <laughs> supervisors first thing in the morning and then they catch up with their teams we've we've got nine offices so um each each has got their own sort of group of of people but i do like the idea of perhaps we could have a sort of quarter past nine dial in and and just have a catch up and and talk to people see how we could trial it i i just think you've got to continue to invent new things you can't say mm this is what we do and this is what we're always going to do because things are changing so quickly so you've got to to be prepared to adapt to, to provide the support and if it doesn't work it doesn't work but let's try something else it's a good think, point because we think. tried to introduce sorry so we just we tried to introduce coffee break so we have we're, our supervisors on hangouts all throughout the day so you can dip in and out and have your conversation and that works really well <laughs> um but we were then being asked, you know, for an opportunity for people to just, as you say, have a bit of a chat, an informal chat or have a coffee with somebody and there'd always be someone on hand. But it's never really taken off. And I do think it just goes to your point, Jill, of, you know, we can introduce these new ideas, but we then have to be able to just let go if they don't. We can't yeah. force people to take coffee breaks with each other if that's just not the environment that they want to take part in. But I do think there's got to be something that is going to gonna help people because my concern um, you know, and so I don't know whether you can touch upon this as well with our future planning, but it's that our demand is is growing and growing and growing. And, and Rachel, obviously, I know it's similar for you. The challenges that we're facing in terms of, you know, you're, you're, you're being unable to go and visit offices and how you've had to be able to adapt to that and, and the pressures people have been under recently, uh, including obviously your team who've had to adapt to this. But the demand and the pressures are going to grow. We haven't got an opportunity. And this is something we've been talking about in the peer support calls to take a step back and say oh we can have a break now for a month you know things are going to be calm and we're going to be okay for a month because it's not going to happen and i'm sure all of us have just wished that it was but it's not going to happen we're seeing demand in in, in cases increase and we're seeing new volunteers come through so that we can try and ease that pressure but we're not going to have this this relaxed opportunity to be able to take a step back and say right here's what we're going to do let's take that pause let's take that break because the demand is going to keep coming in you know and Rachel same for you that, that, that you'll just end up in a backlog if you do just take that break for uh, any period of time what are we going to be able to do about that because the whole point of talking and listening about feelings is about creating that space and about being able to support people are we not at risk of chasing that demand and having to fulfill that demand and actually uh, what we're risking is the support for our peers that's obviously not his accusation to you all, by the way. That's just obviously throwing yeah. it out there. Of a, I think of a that's concern. a really good point, Jake, that we have to remember that there are people, you know, our teams are people and they've got feelings, emotions, and they'll be up and down and constantly saying, you know, we've got we've got to answer more. We've got to answer more. That's, that's the pressure we take. I, I'm not sure that we have to, at this particular time, really push our teams to the to the point of you know that they just walk i think you have to prioritize space to to focus on people um if you don't do that um then you're not doing the put your own oxygen mask on first yeah then, you know so if our people um aren't able to function then we can't help any clients and you know we're all here everybody is here because we yeah. want to support clients but that does come with a responsibility to support ourselves uh, and to recognize that is quite powerful yeah so you know making space to have those one-to-one -one discussions or group discussions we have a we have a running um chat thread we have one for work stuff and we have one for we call it the chitty chat <laughs> um, it just anybody can just put anything random on there and if somebody and very often that does go into the territory of, of feelings uh, and emotions um because you know work work is frustrating um and sometimes it's you know um inspirational and sometimes it's um triumphant and the, all the feelings that you feel when you're at work you know when you've supported somebody uh, and you want to share that and celebrate that all those feelings where you're just not being able to push something where it needs to go and how difficult that can feel. Um, it, being able to just write that down in a thread rather than having to have a, a, a conversation uh, can be quite useful. 
and just to have somebody go, oh yeah, you know, I, I understand what you mean by that. I think um, that that's that's really good. I think that's really important. Sorry, yeah. Joe. It's, it's those conversations that you would have if you were in the office. You know, you come out from a an advice session and that went really well and you want to share the positive but or actually that didn't go very well you, you would be sharing that not necessarily going into the nitty-gritty of what the appointment was all about um but you would be sharing the emotion behind it and if you you, know, you come off the call and you uh there's no one around other than the dog or the cat or whatever you know you don't get that same sort of being able to share your emotions uh, and I, I that that can be quite challenging and I think I think it's challenging as well for chief officers um because that's quite an isolated role as I see it I mean I'm, I'm not one um but um you, know, you don't have a peer on site to talk to um you, you um and you're always thinking the person who i'm talking leaning on here is somebody who i also possibly line manage or they see me as their employer or that you know there may be other other difficult issues going on which mean it's not appropriate for you to share your feelings in a certain way um yeah. which means that you know for chief officers you might then need to think about talking to um your board or your chair uh, and again sometimes those relationships can be quite difficult because because necessarily they're, they're normally quite task focused aren't yeah. they you know, you're there talking about how do we deal with this problem reporting on that thing um considering x y options uh, and none of that really was an easy window for talking about your feelings or or even listening to a trustee board feelings um so i think creating a, a particular space to do that can be can be healthy and obviously every chief officer just with my hat on uh, should be having proper supervision sessions you know with their line manager and supervision sessions when they're done really well they're not just task focused are they they do cover well-being and they do cover how you feel about things because how you feel about things is part of your development. I think that's really important. I think I think it needs to be part of those supervision meetings. But you also, when we're talking more widely about this kind of listening and sharing feelings, we need to be really kind of mindful of the power dynamic in that conversation. And if you're having that conversation with a in a hierarchical situation, you need to be aware of that and that people may not be comfortable sharing their feelings with someone yeah. who's got who's more powerful than the organization so at the moment i'm thinking about <clears throat> one of the ways of taking this forward internally could be having um people to champion mental health in the organization that could be amongst the volunteers and the staff people that we might train up more to help with this and that that issue about power dynamics is already going through my mind about who would be the volunteers it's fine but amongst the staff who would be an appropriate what appropriate level it shouldn't necessarily be me because not everyone would feel comfortable talking to me about it because mm -hmm. of that power dynamic and who would be the appropriate people i think that's quite an important thing i completely agree and i think boundaries are important as well because when you're talking about your feelings or listening to other people's feelings you have to be able to do that without being made responsible for those feelings necessarily um sometimes you, you can but sometimes you can't and it's not appropriate to um you know we are co-workers we're not therapists um and um you, you you need to really think about that quite carefully i have to do that really carefully um because i i i tend to really pick up on people's emotions when i'm talking to them uh, and absorb them uh, i have to really protect myself from that because otherwise it, it's exhausting um so yeah that's on, just on jake's point about how how we can manage this with the pressure and, and probably the likely increased pressure going into the autumn as we're likely to see more and more demand that we're all expecting, um, as unfortunately this issue continues to, to evolve in terms of employment levels and so on. Um, I think it's really important to plan this space out. That's why I'm trying, I, so far, I think my response internally has been kind of ad hoc and intuitive around supporting wellbeing. And I, that's why I think now I've got a tiny bit of breathing space over the summer where things are a little bit calmer, but I'm expecting it to get a lot more pressured in the autumn. And I think so now I'm trying to get into into place a more proactive planned approach to well-being so that as things pick up and get even more uh, demanding and perhaps back, we had a very, very frantic pace, I feel, internally for those first three or four months. And 
recently, I think we've we've deliberately tried to slow the pace to give people a bit more headspace over the summer. We've encouraged lots of leave. But I think going into the autumn, it's going to pick up again. And having a kind of planned approach in place where we, we allocate time to this will be really important because, like you say, Jake, it, the pressure is going to be there. And we're all determined to support clients as much as we possibly can. But we've got a balance like you said that was a really important point about putting our oxygen mask on first that's incredibly important yeah. like, i want to make sure that we're, i've got i've got those oxygen masks handy for the autumn i, I for, for me i think um jake your uh, in, inspiration of having the the wednesday lunchtime catch up has been a real um save savior for me that and, and also that um, I meet weekly with the Devon chief officers because I, I look after a large area my closest um, LCA is quite a long way away um, so I can feel quite isolated so being able to uh, you know you're, you're all going through the same things and and just knowing that you're not alone has been a massive help over the last few months but I think that's a, I think it's an important point again, isn't it? Of because I, 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 what I started this conversation talking about when Jill, you were talking about active listeners, that it isn't always about having the answers. So those peer support calls weren't about us saying here's the yes or no or here's the answer, here's the missing jigsaw piece. It was just about you know a bunch of people who, as you say, were going through the same experiences, had the same sort of roles to to deliver that, all different sizes, which is obviously the beauty of sitting devices. We all have different size offices and different experiences, but. Um, we could sort of share that and then where people did have the answers we were able to discuss that within the group and have that conversation but nobody seemed to go to those calls wanting somebody to give them the answers to their problems they just wanted to be able to talk yeah and I think that's why they were popular yeah and I think yeah. in many ways you know the, the the crisis has been horrendous but I think it's brought people together and and taught people the value of, of talking and listening about how we feel, um, which I think is really important. If nothing else comes out of it, I hope that we can maintain that, that sort of sharing of, of information on our emotions. So from your Samaritans experience, is there any more um, hints and tips on, on talking and listening about feelings? Um, I think the biggest one is, to get rid of your preconceptions and your judgments you know just because you've been through something doesn't mean that that person they might be going through the same thing but how they're reacting to it is is very different i, I just go back to when we were training there were like lots of different questions and one was um you know, which is more upsetting the death of your dog or the death of your husband and it's relative because you might love your dog and absolutely hate your husband, or you might love your husband and your dog's a pain in the neck, or actually you might hate or love both of them. So it, nobody goes through the same thing, the same the same scenario in the same way. So it, it's getting rid of your preconceptions and being able to listen from a, as objective a point of view as you can. Um, I, I think that's, <laughs> that's, you know, you're standing alongside someone trying to see the world as they see it um, and, and not saying, oh, you know, just pull yourself together or get over it. That's really not helpful. I'm assuming, okay, with the, with obviously the listening to people and obviously, again, we've got the difference of sometimes it's clients that will be calling us and talking about these problems. Sometimes it is our staff and volunteers. I would absolutely be assuming it's to encourage people to seek medical help as well, if or professional help more appropriately. So speaking to your GP about some of these points and trying to get support through those methods as well. I, I've certainly been um, signposting quite a few of my team to Big White Wall and yeah. other local um, initiatives. And they've come back and said that, they, that that's really helped. Um, and a few people, yeah, they've they've gone to their doctors and and um, you know take. I think it's just about taking taking people seriously and not dismissing that they're having a, a wobbly day. And and I take you know not. I, I think by being open myself and people coming to talk to me, it encourages more people to talk within the team. So they might not feel they want to come and and talk to me about it. 
but they will talk to somebody else. And so I guess it's sort of third hand that, that somebody's struggling. And and that you can you can make adaptions then. If you don't know that somebody's struggling, you're just going to carry on sort of, you know, can you do this? Can you do this? And then they they completely collapse. Whereas if you can um, manage that stress at, at an early point, then um, you, you, you help them carry on. And as you can see from Paul there, he's saying, I agree, listening is vitally important. Sometimes asking a person what they need you to do is a good way to open up the conversation. Yeah, yeah asking somebody, what, what, what are you expecting out of this conversation? What, you know, how, how can I help you best? It, it's really good because that helps that person to work through what 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 they're going through. We, we have an analogy in Samaritans that um, a conversation with a Samaritan, we're not going to solve any problems. We're not we don't give advice, but it's about taking your clothes out of the tumble dryer and they're all tangled up and they're all messed up. And what you do is take them out one at a time. You look at them, you fold them and you put them put them on a you know on the side. At the end of the day, you've still got the same load of problems, but actually you've had a look at them. You can identify which are the ones that you can do something about and want to do something about, and those that actually you're worrying about them, but there's nothing you can do or there's nothing you need to do about them. And it just helps put, put everything into perspective and, and you can carry on. I think it's a good point. I'd certainly be interested in uh, and Sue and Joe whether we could work together on um, on some of this talking and listening, active listening, and support for maybe some of our team to champion in LCAs <coughs> and see whether we can then share some of that learning um, through Rachel and some of the other teams nationally who can promote this with the other LCAs. It'd be an interesting approach, as you say, Sue, over the summer where hopefully. There's a little bit more <laughs> like room to do stuff. I, I think you're very optimistic, Sue, that it's yeah. going to I be know, yeah. <laughs> I don't <laughs> mean quiet. I mean, we haven't been, you know, we've, we've been, it's been compared to usual. We've helped more than, you know, double the normal, yeah. normal numbers of people. It's not gone back to normal, but it hasn't been that intensity in yeah. that, that yeah. April and May were there. Yeah. 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 But I do you think, I mean, yeah, so if we can follow that up, I think that would be very useful. Yeah. Sorry, Sue, go on. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just wondering about um, just closing off around the kind of the barriers of I think we've talked about the benefits of this, um, but uh, and we've covered some of the barriers, but just any other barriers that we have thought about, because I think time is definitely one of them, finding the time. Yeah. And we're talking about trying to be planned around that to make sure that we find the time. And I wonder what people think about maybe what the other barriers are. I mean, one thing we haven't mentioned is that. Um, this isn't always appropriate for everyone. Not everyone wants to talk about their feelings. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is a kind of optional thing. Um, and that we never want to make anyone feel uncomfortable and that it, actually it can also be counterproductive content trying to kind of force anyone into that. It can be anxiety inducing asking some yeah. people to talk about it. So that that, that could be a barrier, but also it, it, it's a kind of, it's an acceptance that this won't work for everyone, I guess. But also, I would say culture, because you know, one one of our experiences, you know, for me as as CEO, and again, I don't know if I ran this by Rachel, but I certainly spoke to someone at National at the time about this. Is um, having someone um, from a different background, different culture, where it wasn't appropriate to talk to a chief executive about, which is what they perceive. You know, I certainly don't walk around thinking I'm this big chief exec, but certainly for them, it was this idea that I'm not the appropriate person to have that conversation with and we had nobody else within the team that they that that, that, that they could connect with uh, where they were comfortable and someone external wasn't going to really fit that bill either and that was really um sort of upsetting i suppose for me because we wanted to support this individual they're a very valued member of the team um but but nothing that we had in place locally was going to be able to support that individual and they were very open about that it just wasn't it wasn't within their their culture to engage with 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 me about that and their fear was other people who didn't they didn't feel represented them were going to be able to understand the dynamics of their situation um so i think that's another another barrier um and i'm sure there are answers to it by the way don't get me wrong but that's certainly something i've experienced on a, a local level i think that's a really good point actually about um how to try to bring to bear kind of an, an inclusive um culture around talking about feelings and acknowledging that for some people it's just not the way that they want to go for whatever reason um 
and making sure that particularly in group situations, um, although they may not want to talk about their feelings, just to make sure that other voices don't get unfairly or disproportionately amplified. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's quite important. I was really struck by what you've all said about um, um, about having dif- different experiences on different days when you have different volunteers in. Um, because one of the things that I was reflecting on uh, in preparation for this was around em- emotional cultures of organisations or, or teams. Um, and I think most people who work for Citizens Advice or volunteer for Citizens Advice are driven by probably a passion to help people. Um, and I think that, that that very passion that we all have to be here and to support clients and to support each other is, again, it's quite an emotional, it can be quite an emotional flashpoint. And so um, it can, sometimes it can tip, the emotional culture can tip into you know, frustration uh, around uh, maybe bureaucracy or anger at injustice or um th- those sorts of things and, and um too much of that without a, without a balancing let's just notice that but we can't actually do anything about it now um i think is important so that kind of mindfulness technique of of being able to to say i i, I hear what you say acknowledge what you say but we, we can't actually deal with that with that right at this moment i think it's really important um yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. And we've got the comment there from from Matt from National. I think it's really important to normalise talking about feelings in the workplace in general. We're all human beings, regardless of what role we are in or what level role we are in. Actually, I think that's a really good point. Thank yeah. you, Matt. And I just also want to say it's really important, and I'm so pleased to be here to talk to normalise talking about feelings between national and local, um, because you know sometimes. Uh, that relationship can be quite difficult. Um, sometimes it's the best thing ever. Um, and I think it's really important to, for us to acknowledge that everybody in the network is uh, a person with feelings. And I think um, it's really important for everybody in uh, the network to acknowledge that about people who work for National as well. And I know, Jake, that you know, you know that that's something that I really wanted to mention. Yeah, of course. And I think it's 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 that thing again about relationships there as well, isn't it? And, and understanding that we are all driving towards the same goal and having respect and understanding for that um as well. So I do think it's a really important um point to to raise. Um I'm just gonna bring Breach in. Um and we'll bring people in throughout as as they join us, but I'm currently waiting for a panel member to join. So sorry if I'm a little bit distracted from Morning. someone who's not replying to me yet. So um Hi. so if you, you I think Hi. you've been watching some of this panel, haven't you, Breach? So I yes, just yes, if I you have any any comments to add. Oh no, I think it's excellent. I think it's it's really good to know that everybody is is in the same boat. We're all struggling with um the lockdown. Um you know in some ways it's um, I find it it's it's really empowering because people are actually being very open and vulnerable and, and you know I think that's great that's you know we're, we're all experiencing the same thing um you know nas- nationally but it's it's difficult to see that when you're just in your little office and you think oh is it just us but obviously everybody is is facing the same challenges so yeah it's it's excellent it's really good that's great and Rosie same have you been able to catch any of this last and please don't feel you have to say yes if you've been busy (laughs) I'm afraid I haven't I've been uh, catching up on emails uh, so doing that kind of I must be productive thing do you have any do you have any tips on talking and listening about feelings before we move on from this panel yeah I think it's always about sort of it's really difficult to to act to do it and I certainly I talk a lot about it but I'm not necessarily very effective at doing it myself um but when you're listening to other people's feelings to try to not put it in your own context in that sort of thing we sort of touched on in the first hour is everyone experiences things differently and just because you're hearing what someone's saying to you and like sort of saying oh yeah, yeah I, I, I and you I think you constantly start to process how does that relate to me and my experiences and how and you know in, in the best meaning way how can I empathize and how can I kind of understand understand it but I think sometimes when you're focusing so hard on doing that you can miss essentially what it is that they're trying to tell you um and it's like actually just focus on listening and and listening alone and then you know maybe you can bring something to it but 
actually this is their time to express to you what they're feeling, not your time to to show how much you get it. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a really good summary, actually. <laughs> I love the discussion. That's a brilliant summary. Thanks. <laughs> It's good. It's good. I like it. So, um, anything else from from the panel? We've been we've got another five minutes. Of obviously, this this panel, and it's obviously a really important subject. I think it's the basis, isn't it, of the rest of how you then support your own mental health, get support from from others about being able to be open about that. And obviously, mental health first aid is something we'll be talking about a little bit later on, uh, and probably a little bit in the peer support panel, which is next as well. Um, but I do think it's that entry level, isn't it, really, of being able to be confident about talking up about it. You obviously need a, someone who's going to respond well to that because you don't want your experience to be unsupportive of somebody or someone who's challenging or, as we've said, who thinks they know all the answers to that. Um, but it is that it is that gateway in, isn't it, of, of access and support or feeling more comfortable in your organisation. Yeah, I, I think mental health is, is so closely aligned with a lot of the work that we do that it's really important that we as an organisation do acknowledge how how uh, acknowledge its importance and and manage our day to day lives with that in mind. Yeah. And Bridge, I think someone was, yeah someone else was going to come in there. Well, I was just going to say that um, uh, technology is wonderful. But I, I think what we we don't realise is that this form of communication, while it's fantastic, you know, in lockdown, um, it's also really hard work. And it's yeah. kind of, um, you know, we, we're having to work much harder to communicate with people over these type of electronic mediums than we would do normally. And that's... That is going to cause us stress and anxiety. And that's perfectly normal because we weren't designed to communicate like this. We were designed to communicate face to face and, you know, reading body language and lots of other things. So I think a lot of people kind of are putting, you know, thinking to themselves, well, I'm fi finding it really stressful. Well, of course you will, because this is not a normal situation. We're not designed to communicate like this. I mean, it's great because we have no other way of communicating at the moment. But I, I think maybe we should be a bit easier on ourselves when we're going, well, yeah, it's stressful and anxious. Well, this situation is stressful and anxious as well. And although technology helps, it brings its own cost to it, to our mental health. And I think that's something we should be aware of, really. I, I certainly find, you know, I, I fit in so many more meetings now because you're going literally straight from one to another. And I last week I was sat in one for about 10 minutes trying to work out what on earth we were supposed to be talking about because I come from something else that had really sort of grabbed my attention, got clicked off. You know, you do the sort of goodbye, click straight into the other meeting and thought, I haven't got a clue why I'm here or what I'm supposed to be saying. And yeah. It, it is exhausting at the end of the day when you think you've yeah, had, had five meetings and you haven't had that time where you walk out of the room together, you you sort of, you know, have a bit of a debrief as you're walking out of the room. You might get in your car or walk off somewhere yeah. else to a different meeting. You're literally going from one straight to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hate to think what, what toll it's taking on us all. Yeah, I think it is taking a toll on, on all of us. You know, you get the Zoom fatigue, which, <laughs> you know, it, it's normal. Yeah. Because yeah. we're not used, you know, there's lots of social <laughs> cues that you normally pick up from people. And you're not doing that because you, you, you're not there face to face. Yeah. I think and there's something about, you know, we're not, we, we, we've been talking for so long about how we're supposed to be reducing the amount of screen time we have and then actually what we've done yeah. is just intensified it so much more and you know it's it's exactly. those things of actually like you say no one would think twice to put some put a meeting in your diary immediately back to back with a second one when you were in person because they would think well you've got to get to somewhere and you've got to have time to do x y and z in between it's like yeah. why are we not taking that approach then we, we all kind of rushed really headfirst into right how can we make the most of this situation and also you know there was a lot of planning to be done at the start of it that we it was something we've never dealt with before we really need to yeah. spend a lot of time talking about it but we've kind of then stayed in that mindset of let's just work intensely hard yeah. and actually, yeah. 
like maybe we could just do with taking a step back. I saw something, uh, someone was proposing on social media the other day that actually what we should get into the he- uh, sort of headspace of is 45 minute like meetings, setting 45 minute meetings so that there's always 15 yeah. minutes um, before like you, someone could potentially start your next meeting and I think it just gives people 15 minutes headspace to go right I'm going to go and put the kettle on I'm going to go to the loo I'm going to settle down I'm you know maybe and if I want to in that 15 minutes I can also just check my emails check what I've missed is there anything I need to catch and then yeah. right and put your headspace on for the next one and I think it's it's not a bad idea that we know yeah. it's a great idea yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah I think that's really good yeah that's a good point. And we're at 11. So I'll, I'll, I'll let Sue, Jill and Rachel go. And thank you. That was another great panel, which obviously then starts off the day, I said, in terms of how we have those conversations. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're now on to the next panel, which is on peer support. And we have our two panellists, Rosie and Bridge. Bridge. Bridge, yeah. <laughs> Bridge, there we go. I had to say that a couple of times to confirm. Yeah. I'm just going to take Sue off the screen. Um, and that's great. So do you want to introduce yourselves? Um, we'll get started with this panel. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Bridge. Um, obviously an Irish name. Um, so it's not spelt the way it's pronounced. Um, I'm from Preston Citizens Advice. I'm one of the supervisors there. Um, yeah, we've... Um, we're a fairly small office. We've got about 10 staff and um, I think about 20 volunteers, but, you know, on and off. So, yeah, that's we've been working really hard through lockdown. Um, we've, we've got the office partially open, but, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And Rosie? Yeah, so I'm Rosie Avis, I'm the Partnership and Communications Lead at Citizens Advice in Manchester. So we're um, a, a bigger service. We're, um, we've got around just over, I think, 130 staff at the moment. Um, volunteers probably as a smaller part of our service, but obviously still very important to the work that we do, and probably around 30 volunteers. Um, but it can, that can be sort of between 30 and 60 at any one time, depending on, on what's going on. Um, so, yeah, in the context of peer support that obviously that then creates a, a bigger network to to work with but also that obviously yeah. can have its own challenges as well in terms of not necessarily always feeling like one team like one ho- whole team because we have to be split up just for sanity i think a lot of the time yeah, hmm. yeah that's a good point so so this topic then is about peer support isn't it so it is as you say then around how we're going to support each other um in terms of staff to staff staff to volunteers etc and less around what the organization you know does in terms of its structure of support people however you know there might be times where structures can be put in place to encourage peer support so i think this will be an interesting conversation and again just to encourage people to post your comments uh, or either on workplace or on our public social media where we're broadcasting live today and we'll be able to feed that in through to the panel so did either of you have any initial thoughts that you wanted to raise on peer support today then yeah, well, first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit about what uh, the difference between peer support and other types of support are, because, you know, you, you get kind of, um, well, what's the difference between talking to um, someone else and, and talking to a therapist or whatever? Is it the same thing? And and it isn't the same thing because it's the power dynamic, really. I mean, if you're talking to somebody who's a friend or a, a colleague, it's it's different to, to talking to somebody who's... Um, a boss or somebody who's further up the chain. So it, it's really about kind of, um, you know, on, on an equal basis. And I'm, I'm quite interested in the science of why this works. I mean, you, you think that why does talking to somebody else who doesn't necessarily know the same as more than you, why does that work? Shouldn't you be talking to somebody who's who knows a bit more? And there is kind of quite interesting, um, you know, I've been Googling it. Um, there is a kind of, you know, ways we learn from, it, it's the natural way we learn from other people. If you look at kids, they kind of, they learn more from each other, from people that are, you know, nearer the same age than they necessarily do from teachers or people who are a bit older. So it's kind of, a, it's a normal way for us to learn and to support each other 
I also think the the thing that peer support um, does is that you know it gives you it's it's generally in a context. Um, you you learn kind of you know when you're learning a foreign language. I, I often find it's it's easier to kind of learn when you know if if you're trying to ask for a railway ticket, it's easier if you're in the station <laughs> because then it's it's you know when you're trying to kind of say uh, avez-vous on bile or whatever, and it's outside of the situation, then it, it's much harder for people to communicate. Um, peer support is if you're in a situation together, you can you both understand a lot more about the bigger situation. So if you have an advisor who comes out and they've you know had a difficult interview and they're talking to somebody else, there's a lot that they don't need to say because they already understand it. It's kind of embedded into the situation that they're in. And I think that's the problem we've got at the moment is we haven't got that. We haven't got, you know, we've got communication, which is great because otherwise we'd have nothing, but we've got no situational cues. We've got no way of, you know, even kind of being in an office or being, all of that gives you a context for helping each other. And we've lost all of that. And I think the problem is that we, we're going to have to work a lot harder to build that in so that people can help each other, but maybe not in the way that they used to help each other, which is go into the kitchen and have a cup of tea and talk to somebody. And we're having, we're going to have to build some kind of electronic or virtual replacement for all that. And, you know, if you look at kids, they do it. I mean, I've got a 14 year old and he's on TikTok and FaceTime all the time. So they've done it already, but maybe we need to kind of create this environment where we can support each other. And it's not going to be the same as it was previously, but, and it's going to take time, but I think we, we can definitely do that. But we just got to be aware that it's it's not intuitive. It's it's not kind of it's not going to happen. It's going to require effort and work. Yeah, absolutely. I think that sort of we need to put those structures in place. Like you say, those informal conversations that just happen throughout the office yeah. from day to day that you sort of you take for granted and you don't really ne- because they're not. It, it doesn't. I think peer support often, obviously, it, the sort of formalised peer support are those formal groups where people get yeah. together who have shared experiences and talk about their experiences and how they feel and things like that. And obviously, that's great. The other aspect of peer support actually is just kind of knowing that someone's there if you need to have a chat to them, and that it's not yeah. necessarily I'm going to sit down in this formal time and space and have a, a very in in depth conversation about my feelings. It's just about oh, do you know what, today's really tough. Like, oh, yeah. why are you waiting for the kettle to boil? And I think particularly, like you say, when we're dealing with sort of quite intense circumstances at, at work and like, uh, you know, supporting our clients as best we possibly can, that then, you know, it has the impact on our advisors. They need to kind of just talk things through to like just yeah. sort of make sense of stuff sometimes. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, we the, those just informal things have disappeared a little bit we have tried within teams as well what we've kind of put in place is like informal coffee hours or like lunch yeah, breaks yeah. so some of our teams just get together on a video chat and eat lunch together or they will yeah. have coffee at like 11 on a particular day um like after work one of our teams was at one point just doing an after work debrief like every day and then it that particularly at the beginning and then it kind of we didn't need it really every day so it just sort of it became once yeah. a week thing but it's just those opportunities for people to say right let's just have a chat let's just see how your day's been what what's going on for you like how is that working and I think it just offers people like a bit more sort of connection yeah. um and and what we have said to to our staff is wherever possible and like wait if it, obviously we can't we're not going to force anyone to do anything they don't feel comfortable with and like it's obviously about what feels right for you but if you can be on video chat rather than having your screen off and whatever it would be good because it gives us the opportunity to see you so that yeah. again for, for us sort of checking in on you how are you doing like because like you said those visual clues someone might be saying to you yeah, yeah I'm great I'm fine like I'm, I've got no problems and then like you can see like the visible tension in them and yeah. you, can, you can start to unpick that a bit more um so it's I think it's just about 
how can we sort of take that extra step to deliver peer support because it doesn't just happen no naturally. exactly yeah yeah, and it's it's funny because different people have different communication styles. Some some people are quite happy um, and open about having face to face communication about you know I feel like this and and but other people are not happy with that because um, I think they call it side by side communication. Uh, it tends to be more of a I'm not, I'm generalizing here, Jake, but it tends to be more of a male thing that if you have um, a group of men, they would tend to talk to each other while they're doing something rather than, you know, sit down and kind of face to face. Well, I feel like this and I'm doing that, you know, when they're fixing a motorbike or doing whatever, because I've got two teenage sons. <laughs> um, mm. They tend to talk more about how they feel in, in those circumstances. And I think kind of more informal or it isn't about we're talking about feelings today they, that will put somebody, some people off completely. Other people are absolutely fine with it but some people are like no nope, you know that's you know I won't touch that with a barge pole but if they're doing something else or it's it's a quiz or it's you know incidental then it'll be it'll be more organic and I think they might feel more comfortable with it so you might get kind of discussions about how people feel interspersed with a quiz or or something else they're talking about I'm, I'm actually in a walking group and I have I found that really useful because you notice that, you know, people, it, it's much more of a, you know, obviously we're out, outdoors, we're socially distanced, but people can be much more open while they're doing something else and you can hang back and you can talk to someone and then you can, you know, speed up and kind of, it, it, it's a, a much more fluid way of dealing with it rather than sitting going, right, tell me how you feel, because a lot of people won't do that. I do opinion. think it's a really interesting point. And, and one of the things that hasn't really come up today yet is loneliness. And obviously, yeah. working from home and being isolated is absolutely, you know, uh, an issue around loneliness mm -hmm. uh, and isolation. And I think um, one of the key ways, obviously, of dealing with that is meaningful interactions with people. So as yeah. you've then just said, there's, there's the, the walking club and all that sort of stuff. It just go back to an early point we were saying around, oh, so, you know, we introduced a coffee morning, a coffee breakout yeah. type chat where people could but it hasn't really taken off but that is again because we are not forcing because that's obviously the wrong word to use but it is that we're putting something in place it hasn't really um, taken off but it reiterates that view that it has to be meaningful so you know and it goes back to that idea of obviously working with older people as well for example that just because you have a bingo session in your local housing sheltered accommodation doesn't mean that they're gonna have lots of activities they're gonna enjoy taking part in because that might not be something for them so it's around and, and and rosie obviously it'd be interesting to hear your point of whether it is then easier to do that sort of stuff at a larger organization because you know for us there could be a book club that could be introduced if people obviously wanted to take that off the ground but but bridge i don't know if it's similar with you the issue we have is quite often it's stuff that we need to lead as as staff and as as an employer and it's stuff that we really can't handle like with all of the other stuff that we've got in place you know the rotor of that but we can advertise it and we can support the the, the delivery of that but i do think yeah. that would help with peer support of having having these groups of things that people could take part in um where as you said they can then it, 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 I'm, I'm sure it might not even be then they can talk about it it's just that they feel supported they feel more part of other stuff that's going on whereas my thing with certain devices has always been as important as it is it is very transactional isn't it so you know certainly now with people being at home it's transactional and you know we answer the phone we support someone and we move on to the next item yeah. whereas if you if you work for a charity like mind or you work for a charity like um uh, huk or some of these other charities you have groups and you have people that you build relationships with over a period of time you don't do something and then finish do something and finish you build up those relationships and that's not really something we do that much is it in our line of work as well, which adds another layer? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's um, when you talk about sort of it, it, how it works in a larger organisation versus in a smaller. I think like it's it's still it's a challenge in in either respect. I think we we try sort of putting some more formal things in, um, and some of the some of them worked, some of them really didn't. Like so, like I I tried to sort of just get the kind of informal lunch break going as part of what we were doing just because um 
so we had uh, we have a big breakout space in our building so like we were saying oh we've just kind of got that going and people go in there and they hang out in in, in the lunchtime like let's create a virtual kind of breakout room um and so we created that space i thought let's replicate it with a, an online meeting um and it just no one ever came and i would often find myself i would sort of have to be there myself because I, like, I can't start something that i'm not prepared to take part in but i would then sort of start it and then just sort of say oh like i'm sitting here for an hour an hour and a half where no one is is coming in no one's chatting to me or i might talk to like one other person um and that didn't really work uh but whereas where individual teams have kind of done that for themselves that's maybe been a bit better where they've organically started it um and then we had things like at the beginning of lockdown we had uh, a sort of friday night disco um so at the end when uh, sort of this it was a 10 minute slot or an, an agreed 10 minute slot sometimes people would stay on there for hours but and um, the idea that at 10 o'clock uh, at six o'clock on a friday when people finish work that we would all get into a room one person would be a dj they would play a song for everyone we'd all dance around and then like that was kind of like a way of shaking off the week a little bit because those week they, especially those first few weeks were, were really quite intense and what we saw was that eventually that just died a death a little bit like people just buy and more as as well as like lockdown rules eased and people could go out and hang hang out in someone's garden um after work on a friday they were more inclined to hang out with their friends than they were with us which was understandable and <laughs> um, so i think like they kind of like again it's that kind of you do have to sort of go with what people feel they need at like yeah. any particular yeah. time and i think it's like actually let's just not force it let's just let it happen but also finding that balance where you then kind of touch base yeah. with people and like and make sure they're okay because some people some people are really great at like reaching out um and some people aren't and you so you've got kind of got to create a space where those people who aren't necessarily great at reaching out can kind of drop in and kind of test the water a little bit and see because if you don't sort of put something in place they won't go i need a group to talk to at, yeah, at 12 yeah. o'clock on a, on a weekday so yeah it's it's a it's a really difficult thing it's a difficult thing to get right at the best of times it's a difficult thing to get right face to face when we're all in an office together it's even harder i think um and exacerbated by by lockdown conditions so yeah. Sorry, I, I was listening there, but I had to have a stretch because obviously I've been sitting there. <laughs> that's fine. I, think that's I did, reasonable. I did yeah. have a secret yeah. chocolate bar as well, but um, <laughs> um, I think I think it's interesting. And I was listening because I had a little walk around, but I was listening on my headphones. Of you know, so we introduced the quiz at the start, where it was I think it was fortnightly, uh, and I shared that then also then sort of fizzled out, and it worked really really well. People really enjoyed it. And what I liked about that is that people brought their family members because obviously they were in the same house. So people had their family members involved in the quiz um, as well. So we got to meet different people that we we wouldn't normally meet in terms of their wider support networks. So I really liked that. But I should say, as the lockdown has lifted and people have got other options, that's then yeah. meant that we've got that. But I do just think, and we touched upon it in the earlier session as well, about talking and listening about feelings, that there just has to be a bridge talking about your point. We have to create these opportunities, don't we? From what we're missing from face to face, we now have to find a way of integrating them into this arguably new way of work and at least for the majority of us you know certainly for our office this is something we intend to do for at least the rest of this year you know yeah. be very minimal amount of people in the office so you know it's something that we do need to be concentrating on and think about how we're going to implement this stuff but i, I think it's also important to realize that it's it's a new way of working but it, it is harder in some ways and maybe that invisible cost isn't something that you know we've touched on it previously but you know it, it's going to be more difficult for people to you know get used to this because you know for a lot of people they, they, this isn't their preferred way of, of contacting yeah. people i mean we've i think with our volunteers i i know that we've lost a few because their whole point of, of what they got out of citizens advice was coming in, talking to people, talking to each other, you know, having a, a bit of a chat, you know, feeling, you know, they've made a difference and then going home again. And it's really hard to replicate that on email or even, you know, if we do get around to video conferencing, that it, it's not going to be the same. Um, so if that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but I, I just think we ought to recognize that it's, it's, it's it's not an equivalent it's it's sort of it's a substitute but it's 
it does come with kind of it is more difficult especially if we go into client doing clients then we're going to have to work quite a bit harder with clients to persuade them to trust us yeah. um, because the funny thing is like before I, I uh, came online, I was looking up um, back in 2005. <laughs> um, I did a dissertation on video conferencing and trading standards. This is like way, you know, the early days of video conferencing where we got 15 people and they were going to make a consumer complaint. And, you know, what I actually found was that they used it, but they didn't like it because they found it. They, If it was a choice between seeing somebody face to face and um going online they, they would pick face to face every time but they did find it useful in, in some respects because they could share documents and they could you know th there were useful aspects to it but i think just looking at it as a right you go from a face to face to a video not there's a lot more work involved and people find that harder and they will do it if they if they think that the result is worth it if they if there's no choice as there is at the moment or they need the help badly enough they will do it but they will they will find it more difficult and i think we've got to be aware of that that building up trust in a, a video call is 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 harder than doing it face to face and if we're aware of that we can kind of make them shorter or find ways around it but I, I just think you know this is a useful learning experience for if we do have to go down the, the route of doing this with clients what kind of lessons are we learning from talking to each other as well you know yeah. how, how, how are we managing it yeah I agree I think there's that sort of as we change the way we work actually obviously we do what we find necessary to support yeah. people but actually like you say those interactions are going to be harder with clients and and also the the nature of people's problems is 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 much is changing significantly yeah. isn't it through lockdown so we've already seen that start to change and actually sort of we're anticipating that there will be probably quite a lot of people calling us in very dire yeah. circumstances yeah. Yeah. even more so than normal and look yeah. what that does for our advisors and then how do we again sort of coming back like how do we put those peer support things in place that maybe they haven't needed before like maybe actually at work we haven't really needed to do much talking about your mental health because while it's you know we all like you kind of go into citizens advice knowing what you get sort of thing you know it's not going to be easy work that's kind of the point you can you process it it's fine you have and the odd chat that you have it like helps you through and that kind of keeps you on an even keel but actually that what I think we value is, or we maybe need to tap into a little bit more is that idea that if and I'm I'm not client facing so I don't deal with actual speaking to to, to clients but I do obviously pick up on what's going on for clients and what we're sort of dealing with as an organization and that kind of that it's heavy stuff and that if I come home and I can talk to my family and my husband and my life and my friends about it but they don't necessarily because they haven't experienced it they, they don't get it and I feel that will probably be even more acute for our advisors that they will have support networks at home but if they don't have if it's that not sharing of experiences it's share, shared yeah. like learning and actually how do we sort of help you to kind of unpick and make sense of what is going on for you at work and and we probably need to start creating very obvious spaces for people to do that um yeah. because i think again it's that well, wh when are you supposed to to talk about things because oh, i've got another an, i've got another appointment or i've got another x y and z and it's like, actually how do we encourage people while doing all of the things that we need to do in terms of hitting service numbers and hitting targets and and delivering yeah. the advice that people need but also taking care of our advisors because if all our exactly. advisors, yeah. all our advisors burn out then we can't yeah. do it anyway so how do we just create those specific spaces where people go it's it's okay for me to talk i think yeah but yeah that's why this topic's really interesting one in itself on peer support because we know that peer support is often more effective in terms of support and each you know you and, and each other in the issues so we touched upon it in the earlier panel um just before this around you know so 18 weeks ago 19 weeks ago now i set up a 
um, peer support conference call every Wednesday that's now being chaired, Rosie, by Andy from, from your team, uh, Andy Brown, um, to support CEOs, operational managers, and chairs throughout the pandemic. So we started the week before lockdown, and it was about, you know, officers, including ours, were still deciding whether to close or not because lockdown hadn't actually gone into operation at that point. Uh, and we've supported each other throughout. And, and and as we talked about in the last session, none of us seemed to come to that session with the view that people needed to give us answers. It was just about knowing that there's going to be 60 other CEOs or people having to make similar decisions to us on whatever scale that would be, um, knowing that we were facing the same type of pressure, having the same feedback from staff and volunteers, same demands from clients, you know, just on different volumes, which obviously is, I said, important. So we would we would spend some weeks basically just encouraging each other to take leave, you know, to take a bit of holiday, to, to do whatever. So all of that was really a key part of that peer support call, was just about saying, look, I'm feeling burnt out now, shouldn't, you know, we encourage each other to take some breaks because we don't want you to also burn out as well. Um, so, so it was sort of that leadership, but amongst each other. So none of us would go and look into some greater, higher person to tell us what we did need to do and not do. And I think that was what the beauty of it was. And we consistently got, you know, 60 people a week. And, and again, the point of, of the network surely is that we encourage and support each other beyond our office environment. You know, the whole point of being part of that sitting device family is that it doesn't matter whether, you know, Preston, you and I do a project together, or whether Cole Morley was on the call previously, and I do a project together because uh, we, we have the same values, we have the same drive, um, and, and often, obviously, you know, Manchester's always used as one of those examples where your office is huge compared to many of ours, but there's lots of things that you do, particularly at the moment around technology, that we're all learning from, where you're able to share that learning, and we're not at risk or a threat to each other because we're all, as I said, trying to achieve same thing and i just i feel that like all of those values do fit in with peer support the actual sitting device framework and model of working is is probably based on peer support isn't it it's about all being part of that same family unit and encouraging and support each other through the challenges that we face yeah exactly and i think that's that's something actually you sort of touched upon the, this idea of actually our unique job roles if you like that maybe that's where they get their support from because I think so I know that as well they've done some stuff haven't they, across the network for the advice line teams to sort of say actually you know we know that you're seeing like almost the the real brutal end of it because you all have to pick up that first contact and how just giving them an opportunity to come together share their experiences share what they're going through what, how like what's changed how do you deliver services and actually what and and even I think our contact centers are the, the people who have said they miss being in the office the most. I think they, they are the people who have really sort of struggled with it because they have that inbuilt peer support network between them that if one of them gets off call and just goes, oh, God, that was really hard, there's always someone there to kind of pick them up and, like, kind of just have a chat through and it's fine. And that actually, wow, that that's great. And obviously we just need to, con like, continue and support that and encourage that to happen more about the people who work on their own who have like a, an individual job role who say I don't have a support network who do I go and talk to because nobody else does the same job that I do nobody gets what it is that I'm sort of struggling with um and that if you've then got a peer someone else w within the network that actually I think that's almost the positive of lockdown is that it has helped us sort of reach out across the network a little bit more and say actually if I can't find it in my own organization I've got a wealth of people out there who are potentially doing very similar things to me and how can I connect with them to say oh my god how do you how do you do this somewhere else um, and, and share our experiences that way and I think that's that's been really valuable. I think workplace has been really good I mean, I found workplace great because, you know, you can see that lots of other people are facing similar challenges or, you know, just grappling with the same problems. And even if they haven't got the specific answer for the problem you've got, you think, well, I'm not on my own, you know, um, it, because I think you can feel quite isolated sometimes and think, well, I'm, you know, I really don't know the answer here. But seeing that someone else is also asking the same questions it does make you feel better you you, you think well you know 
there, there is a whole community of people out there and they are av available and I've used workplace um, you know for technology and to, to contact people and yeah I, I think it's really good and I think if we can develop that for our volunteers and, and for other for other people I'm trying to encourage people to kind of use it a little bit more as a, as a meeting place but I think in some it takes time for these networks to grow. We can't, it's not going to be overnight. I mean, I think actually um, a lot of people have done really well. Um, you know, some, I've set up some video calls and there were a few people I, I thought, I'm not sure whether they'd be confident enough because when they came into the office, they seemed, you know, oh, I, I don't like computers and I don't like, and it was amazing. They, they really picked it up quickly you know when they had to and you you could tell that they'd obviously used it for family and for so so people can learn but it, it still takes time to get used to the idea and to to grow these environments and we're not going to get it overnight and i i think we need to be patient as well i just feel like we the last six months has been crisis mode it's just kind of you know we're reacting all the time and maybe you can't keep on that level all the time you've got to get dial it back and kind of go okay we need to find a new normal that's a little bit more sustainable really i mean i do agree i do agree and i, and I think it's, it, i want to talk about workplace as well but i just wanted to bring up kate's comment which coincidentally has come from workplace um saying i feel a message it's okay not to be okay needs to be shared and understood more we have many different types of people who have different coping mechanisms I've worked for Citizens Advice for 16 years, and it is hard to ensure you take time out to look after yourself as well as others. Um, workplace, you know, I think I've been using it now for just over two years, actually, because in a previous role to this one, I was working for Citizens Advice in Stockport as the trainer manager there. And again, Rose, similar to you, you're, you're then in the role yourself, but there are plenty of people in the organisation and the network that do that 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 role. So workplace then was a, was a a real blessing really because you could reach out and if you have to suddenly deal with a problem where your team needs a training on a particular issue that had presented but you don't have any materials on it other people were always willing to share that type of stuff and again i know i know we're, we're stretching peer support now to just help people do their jobs but i do think that then has an effect on mental health because if you're constantly and bridge goes back to your point of of always in that crisis mode you've got other people who are prepared to give you materials along the way and help give you a helping hand and give you a step up i think that's great you know and, and we've tried to use workplace then through the helping each other group which is the one that we're broadcasting in today um to promote mentoring as well because if especially if you have got someone in a different sitting device um uh, sorry if, you, if you're on a roll nearly on your own or the other person's also new so for you supervisor in this example there, you know, there must be absolutely hundreds of supervisors in the sit and device network that are out and about. But for an LCAR size, we don't even have two full-time equivalent. And now that's only because we've had increased hours. Normally it's one full-time equivalent spread across two people who then work on different days. So the opportunity for them to grow, develop, learn new things, et cetera, is really difficult because when they come in, they're actually delivering the services and we haven't got much leg room to provide that. But through the peer support, through the mentoring, through supporting each other, encouraging each other, that really will help them to be able to deliver their work and then feel more comfortable, feel more hopefully secure as well, and give them some uh, things to work towards as well. So I think I just think peer support is a really, really important topic in general, uh, as well as the benefits that it has to mental health. Yeah, and I think I know you sort of said, oh, I think we're straying sort of almost from peer support into how people work, but actually the two things fit so closely together because it's that, um, and, and obviously you talked about mental health first aid training. We've just done that ourselves. So we've now got um, 16 staff trained up as mental health first aiders across the organisation. And that the, the concept they talk about where you've got sort of your vessel that where you fill it up and it depends how full your stress vessel is as to whether or not you can cope with other things that are going on. And actually, if we can take this part of like the, the, your work that makes it stressful and, and ease that, then actually you are better place to cope with other things that are happening in your life. And so whether or not it's about sort of literally saying, I'm going to sit and talk to you about your feelings or whether it's about saying, I'm just going to take something from you to, or I'm going to give you tools to make things a little bit easier in this area of your life so that you can maybe focus some of your mental energy on that other those other things that are happening for you and if you want to bring that into the workspace then that's fine and if not then you also don't have to do that but I think 
sort of yeah going back to Kate's thing of that how do we make it easier for people to say it's not I'm not okay like it's it's okay to not be okay and I think you know by ethos that is certainly citizens advice we would absolutely say yes please like tell us that you're not okay but it's one thing to to say it and it's another thing to action it and to sort of live your values as an organization and say right this is how we encourage you to do that and actually I'm having a conversation with some of our my fellow mental health first aiders this afternoon about actually how do we do that a little bit better because like it's great that we've trained ourselves up and we've got this like resource now in our organization but how do we communicate that effectively to people how do we show to people that that's not just about ticking a box and saying we've got something that we're supposed to do um it's about saying we genuinely believe that this is something that you need and that we need to actively create space for you to do it in because I think there's there's definitely a difference it doesn't you need to promote that how do I tell people that I'm not okay because it's not natural for some people like for me it is now it's quite natural for me to go to my boss and to go I, I'm not okay I'm not dealing with this and I'm not coping very well because I'm happy to talk about my mental health because I've done it for a long time for some people this is new to them like they're not they don't know how to talk about it or and they haven't even then grown up in spaces where it's space uh, it's safe to talk about your mental health or, it, or normal again like I couldn't I couldn't go for more than about five minutes when I was a kid without my dad talking about my feelings and my patterns and understanding all of that stuff but that's not like your average household necessarily and how do you kind of help people um I think like right at the, the beginning Bridge, you talked about learning a new language and I think that talking about mental health for a lot of people is it's learning a new language it's learning to express themselves in a different way um and that we need we do that most effectively by immersing ourselves in it so how do we create like an immersive experience for people how if more people are talking about their feelings somebody else goes oh actually now I understand how to say that how to express that how to like kind of put that across so I think yeah there's a lot more we need to do actively rather than just sort of saying this is a safe space like that's not enough for some people absolutely and Breeze just before you comment we've just had a comment from Sandy saying Breeze you are absolutely right I've worked in crisis before in my previous job but the crisis never lasted for so long to be in a crisis for an extended period is exhausting but now this is the new normal so we're having to find new ways of supporting each other yeah yeah that's that's really good yeah um what i was going to say is in some ways what what we're doing is kind of making the invisible visible because i think you know if you're in an environment you do a lot of this stuff instinctively you know you do you're in a kitchen and you see somebody is kind of feeling a bit down and you might put your arm around them and that actually that's one of the things I miss most in lockdown is being able to you know just give a colleague a pat on the shoulder or a hug it just feels really wrong that you can't do that you know it's it's wearing that you kind of you would normally reach out to someone and go you know it's 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 okay well maybe that's my personality because I'm a bit more tactile but that that kind of stuff that's instinctive we really need to build that in back in because you know people go well this is just common sense but it it isn't and not for everybody so you you need to kind of articulate that actually it's okay not to be okay it's perfectly normal if you have a really upsetting phone call you don't need to suck it up and you don't need to go well right I'm going on to the next thing you need you know that I, I like the analogy of the the vessel. You've only got so much mental energy, and if if you don't look after that, then it, you have holes in it basically all the time. It's leaking. Yeah. <laughs> you 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 need to be able to kind of go right. You know, I need to look after myself in order to be able to look after other people because I use the analogy of the the air hostess. You know, tells you to put your on on your own that oxygen mask first before you put that it on your child because you can't look after other people. Yeah. until you looked after yourself absolutely and i think that's um and the sort of the taking that um the vessel further like you say is uh and again it, this is the mental health first aid england their sort of graphic if you like and they say they you you put a tap on the side of it so you like and you release 
like yeah. and you have to have like your your healthy release mechanisms and for some people that's exercise for some people it's talking through their feelings for some people it's other like there are other sort of coping mechanisms that we put in place and so it's just about kind of almost having various different options for people as to like how are you going to cope with that um how can we support it and it is again it's some of those things might be they don't necessarily have to be really targeted mental health initiatives it's actually is your release the fact that you've got a, a group in the workplace where you talk about sport all the time like if that's yeah, what yeah. makes you happy great yeah. wonderful. like I think there's sometimes we get really focused on oh let's talk about like mental health and that's and then we have to only talk about mental health and it's like well what's informal mental health stuff and actually yeah like, exactly talk about something um and that's uh, uh, one of my sort of go-to phrases if I've got a friend or family member who is struggling and I will sort of say to them like look I'm always here if you want to talk about it I'm also here if you want to talk about absolutely the opposite thing and talk rubbish about like trash tv for a night because if that's what makes you feel better and that that makes you feel less alone that's what matters we don't need to talk about your feelings if you don't want to talk about them but if you want to just kind of know that you are supported and in a safe space that's fine we've got a space to do that in and just I think we need to kind of create workplace equivalents of saying these safe spaces for you to just come and like blow off a little bit of steam um in whatever way that looks like for you um and and not be too prescriptive about what mental health support should look like um and peer like yeah peer support like just just come and chat to each other it's all right yeah 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 i agree i think you know if we if we label it as mental health support we're going to put an awful lot of people off because they, they don't want to talk about their feelings I, I remember kind of going around the tower of london and with with uh, my sons and the one of the uh, yeoman of the guard was saying here's a torture chamber this is a really really scary room and he said and here's a this is the scariest room in the tower and i said well what is that and he said that's the room where you know they made people talk about their feelings <laughs> that's, that's the worst torture you could possibly get yeah oh, for some I people it's it, absolutely it's a, it's a really interesting point um but i do think on the on the, the sort of support each other again the the group on workplace of working parents for example so you know again it's not something i can then relate to myself can't provide much peer support to people on that but being part of the network because we have that we've got pets at sitting device haven't we as well where people can can post that and again that just all does have a positive impact on people's well-being and and, and mood and days and i know some people really like seeing pictures of dogs and cats in people's houses and stuff like that so okay. um so and they were the most popular posts on workplace which is why they had to close the group down because everyone's timeline was just flooded with um to not close it down make it a secret closed group to the say because it was just flooding everybody's timeline so it shows that it's really popular. Yeah, I think, and it comes back to that thing as well. If, if you badge it as mental health or like peer, even if you like use a word like peer support, it kind of has that connotation of this is a support group. And actually, I think for a lot of people, like they might not consider it their mental health. Mm -hmm. Like we obviously, what is it, there's that sort of very common phrase now isn't it that you know everyone has mental health it's just about how good or bad it is at any one time it's just absolutely the same as your physical health but still for a lot of people they won't necessarily particularly if it's not severe like if you just sort of feel a bit down or a bit like a bit meh is the way that I often describe it it's like I can't put a word on it I can't describe it because it doesn't quite fit with a, a labeled emotion but it's just I just don't feel quite right but people won't go, oh, that's a mental health issue. Therefore, I, that's not for me. Like peer support isn't for me. And it's like, actually, it really is because it's just about kind of keeping you. If you don't feel yeah. like you've got a mental health issue, wonderful. Let's keep it that way <laughs> if we can. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But is it not like your physical health? I mean, you know, people think about, you know, you, you need to go for a run, you need to maintain your physical health. But people don't think about... Well, you you know you need the same strategies for your your mental health as well you know it's a, a lot of them kind of maybe be instinctive and people don't think about well i go to a knitting group or i go to but all, all that all of that is basically doing the same thing yeah. and i think in, in lockdown because we've all we're all in this situation where it's incredibly stressful we're having to consider you know 
well, maybe I should do a bit of mindfulness or maybe I should think about kind of, you know, taking time off, making it more explicit that you need to look after your mental health. But actually, that's a, that's a conversation we should all be having, really, because, you know, you all know if you, you binge on, you know, um, TV all day, you, you, you won't necessarily feel good. So you all have... We all have different strategies for managing our mental health, and some work better than others. But you know, maybe kind of having hobby groups or having just yeah. interest groups is, is something that people could contribute to without necessarily thinking, "Well, this is this is a way of increasing my mental health." But it is effectively; it's just doing it in in. A, it's just a benefit, up. isn't it? It's just a, yeah, it's just a benefit is, is is improved well-being, and and I think that is that point, isn't it? Of Again, obviously, as you talked about mental health first aid, one of the key points on mental health first aid is that everyone does have our mental health, just as we have our physical health. Um, so anything that we do that helps maintain our mental health at a good level is is then good. And it doesn't have to be the intention either. That's why I call it a benefit. You don't have to attend a group thinking, I go to this book club because it makes me feel better with my mental health. It can just be because you enjoy it. But a consequence and a benefit of that is that it improves and and, and maintains, obviously, um, good well-being so yeah I think I think it's really key but I think I, I just wondered if you either if you had examples of where you have seen good peer support promoted in any organization any any so Bridge you've talked about a walking group for example and just any examples that people might take inspiration from well um, I think my best experience of peer support was actually after I had my older son, who is now 21, he was the guy who came in and took the phone mm -hmm. away. But I had postnatal depression and I, I found it really difficult. And I was at home um, with a small baby. I couldn't drive and I felt very trapped. Um, I actually got a taxi and went to a local mom and babies group. And I walked into a room and he hadn't slept and I was really shattered. And I, I said to my husband, I immediately felt better because there were loads of other women in the room who looked just as knackered as I did. <laughs> and he thought that that was immediately, you know, it gave me a lift of thinking, I'm not on my own here. There yeah. are, yeah. you know, everybody else's baby is perfect and mine is the one that's crying. Um, they were all kind of, you know, we were sitting down kind of exchanging, I've only had two hours sleep and you've only had three hours. And that was... That was fantastic because I, you know, at a point in my life where I felt very isolated and just stopped work, I didn't know anyone. And I, I built friendships. And actually, 21 years later, we're still in touch and we, we still communicate with each other. And, you know, it was the, the health visitor who had set this up basically. There was no mentoring, there was nobody leading it, there was nobody telling us what to say to each other. We were just all in a position of, we've all just had our first baby, we're, we all really don't, you know, where's the manual for this? We just didn't know where to start, and it was great. And I, I think that experience is the one that would stay, you know, stayed with me for the rest of my life. It, you know, it, in, in a time when you really feel low, it is fantastic to have support from other people who are in exactly the same position as you are i, I do like it because it, it, it does it goes back to that point doesn't it of it's it isn't about as you say someone having to lead it someone being the leader having all the answers being you know full of wisdom it is just about relating you know for you that that answer there was just about knowing that other people are experiencing it as well it sort of normalizes the situation for you and that you know it is is hopefully enough for, for a lot of people rosie um i think it's sort of so the the charity I worked at um, before Citizens Advice. I think we had uh, it was a very small team. There's probably only about five of us in the office uh, at any one time. Um, and for me, uh, when I started there, I was at my most ill. So I actually I uh, remember I went for my interview. I got the job, and it was probably actually it ended up being a couple of months before I en um, ended up in the office. And by the time I got to my first day of work um a member of staff she didn't dare tell me till a few months later i think when i was back on a better track but she said i genuinely i i thought they'd hired somebody else because you look so different from the point of interview to the, your first day of work and so i had to walk into that space being like i already don't think i'm very well like and i don't and i was just kind of trying to get my get to grips with it and then 
having to sort of approach and say, oh, I'm going to need some sort of space to, to go and address this quite formally. Like I'm going to need some time to maybe go and, and take some time for therapy. And they're like, that's absolutely mm-hmm. fine. Just take whatever space you need. And then within the office, just people having an understanding of that I might need to adapt to the way that I work just to kind of help me put in in, in process some sort of healing mechanisms mechanisms and just being really supportive of that and like what can we do to kind of make it easier without kind of really overloading and being like oh we're going to fuss over you like you're some sort of patient it was just about how do we make this space safe for you to kind of do what you need to do um in order to to recover and so like in a lot of ways that that workplace was not always very good for my mental health later on but actually at the start when I really needed them that was exactly what I needed was just kind of a, a bit. And it, so it was, yeah, again, that kind of, it wasn't formal peer support, but it was just about saying like, how do we do whatever we can to put those processes in place for you um, as your colleagues, not just as you know, your manager or your your boss. It's actually about how do I, as a colleague, support you to do whatever you need to do um, and kind of make like not be judgmental about what any of those things. I think that was, that was really valuable. I think, I, and, that's, and that's great. Thank you, Rosie. I think one of the other things we haven't talked about in this hour is the network groups. So, you know, this is obviously, again, particularly talking about sitting device, but I suppose that is why we're, why we're doing the 12-hour uh, is We have the network groups. So I know, and I, I hope I don't get them wrong, but we've got disability network group. We've got the trans and non-binary network group, the uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual um, group, and the black, Asian, minority, ethnic group as well. Uh, I think they're the four that we have. Um, but again, they're very popular. It's another form, surely, of peer support because it isn't it isn't run by a director or a chief executive or somebody then who's just got to be senior. It's a it's a peer support group of people who have got similar experiences, similar backgrounds, um, similar connections there, um, where where you can talk about things. And Bridget probably goes to to your example of of the of the mother and baby group, where you're attending something where people have got that similar experience that's similar insight where you could then talk about an issue uh, and and rosie we talked about it as well obviously about the roles isn't it so the role that you have if you're on your own and you've got so so let's say you know for example me being a gay man if i'm the only gay man in woken gum and that was my issue in terms of, of feeling comfortable and welcome as part of the organization or that was something that was causing me discrimination or harm then connecting with a group of, of people who understand that and, and, and have possibly experienced that and have advice on how we can move forward is another really effective way of, of peer support, you know, so about supporting and promoting those network groups, which again, just, it, it feels like this hour has turned into why we should be championing the sitting device network, but I do think it's that strength in, in numbers and, 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 and volume, isn't it? So the idea that we're across England and Wales and we have over 270 LCAs and however many uh, national staff that we can engage with as well there's just got really really got to be a huge strength in that yeah and I think it's about if you sort of then want to talk about it outside of the citizens advice kind of bubble that you sort of say that the point of that is it's not always exactly where you're looking for it so it might not be if you work in a bigger organization but you only really spend time with your team actually are there yeah. ways for you to kind of connect with people like outside on like on floor three rather than you only ever sit on floor one like how can you like find your peer support in a different space and like and because I think again sometimes peer support if it's your friends it can feel quite difficult to have those conversations with your friends because it kind of then feels like it dominates a bit I think I and I know it's really common like we have like a number of whatsapp groups for friends and like the amount of times again particularly women are really bad at doing it but like apologizing for like I'm really sorry for like taking over the conversation for like telling you how I feel Mm -hmm. telling you that I'm struggling a little bit and actually we should never be apologizing for the fact that do you know what I've just come here to talk to somebody because that's what I need from you um and I think but it can be much harder to have like a a friend support group but a peer support group that are like people that get it because they have some sort of shared experience with you um whether or not that it's that you do the same work or if it's that you work for the same overarching organization or it's that you have the experience of the same condition or and like just finding those similarities I think across the board is like invaluable for people because again it's that you don't necessarily you don't want to approach your manager and say oh, I'm 
struggling because that then feels like you have formalized it and you have yeah. to kind of then take a particular track or it's you don't want to go to therapy because again it, then it makes it feel like a much bigger thing than it is that like I, I it, one of my biggest regrets but like you know it's a, it's what happened is at 14 I turned down formal therapy because I was like mm-hmm. I do not want to be the crazy person like I'm I know that I've got my issues but I just don't I don't want to call that a particular problem right now and part of me always thinks well if I just dealt with it then like what might have happened later on and actually my therapist later on said to me well you know something else probably would have happened (laughs) it's fine don't worry about it um and you have to be ready to kind of engage at whatever time but it's just that yeah it's about letting people say this is a really informal way of supporting each other it doesn't have to be like putting a label on anything you don't have to be saying you've got a mental health problem you don't have to be saying you've got like a major issue it's just actually how do I kind of make myself some space absolutely I think it's called being human we're we're all the same you know I, I don't think anybody goes through life without needing support I think the people who who say they don't need support aren't really being honest with themselves and you know I, I just think we all need support in in some form or another whether it's formalized or informalized but yeah I, you know and it's it's about like exercise it's, it's about doing things that promote good mental health and I, th- I think i came across a study that said you know loneliness is far worse for your health than smoking you know if, if you look at kind of you know we're we're built to connect with other people and i think the problem is at the moment the pandemic is stopping that it's it's cutting and that's actually making you know we're not designed like that that's you know people you know if you're on your own at home in lockdown it's no wonder you're feeling down because that's not the way you're meant to be we are social animals all of us so yeah I, i think kind of labeling it as oh it's a mental health issue or i've got a condition i, I think it's called being human we're, we're all the same really yeah yeah i think it's good so we just lost al but as you know we're trying to do this crossovers where we have other people come in so steph i wondered whether you had any examples of things that you think have been really good peer support practices yeah definitely i think it's kind of just um having that like our, our team, um, digital workplace team from national staff, we've been um, we're really supportive of each other, which I know is an absolute blessing, um, and I'm really thankful for it every day. And I think um, we're really good at just kind of being very open and being really quite transparent and honest about how we're feeling. And um, we do these things that we call temperature checks um throughout the day so and we kind of ask everyone to reply with their emoji of how they're feeling throughout the day and kind of um sometimes I'll have one that's like the face upside down because who knows how I'm feeling or sometimes it's just kind of my head's not feeling right at all um and just kind of having that space um and kind of having that buy-in from everyone to know that this is something that they really they want to do and they want to be involved in and then we can kind of talk about it if anyone has an emoji that's a bit um worrying for example um and kind of how we can support each other through it no i think that's great thank you and al do you have any examples of of peer support that you think has been effective in your like that you've heard about before um we previously tried to set up a buddying system um and so we've done some legwork on that and we had a team meeting a couple of weeks ago and it got mentioned again so i'm going to try and pull that one out of the bag a bit um i think we tried to do it quite formally last time where people would be dedicated to a person um and what i'm thinking now because we have a team meeting every morning if we just assign people that day then it makes it a bit more fluid um and so um i know um colleagues at mind for their staff they all they assign um buddies like for a week and then they switch so um that works quite well sorry so thank you al but someone's definitely someone's echoing uh, at the moment but um so as you can see we've brought on tracy allen and, and steph uh, just to um cross over the panel. Tracy, I just wonder whether you had any examples of peer support before we wrap up this session that you wanted to share? No, we've lost Tracy. I think you're just still figuring out your... 
Jake, I was just going to say sorry just while um, in that t- it completely reminded me that I, I forgot we do this. <laughs> that on our so we have uh, we use workplace both at sort of uh, Manchester level and then at national level, and um, in Manchester we said like what people miss the most almost is that thing of walking into a into the room in the morning and just going morning. Like, how are you doing? It reminded me as everyone waved when uh, Tracy came into the room. And I was saying, like, that's... Um, so what we started to try and replicate almost was, like, again, similar to the emoji response, was someone always goes into... We've got a, a, de- a sort of dedicated... It's called the Home Working Survival Group on Workplace, and it's just about sort of someone goes in there every morning and says, morning, this is, like, how I feel today, and kind of just gauging some of those responses that you get back helps you to a if someone actively comes out and goes oh god i'm having a really rubbish day today you know that you need to pay them a bit more attention also notably by uh, people who are silent um if you don't get a response from people if you don't see people on workplace when they're normally there like quite frequently that's somebody that i need to check in with um and it has just it's it's not the same, it's not the same substitute, but it is just quite nice as a way of like, I don't have to be coming here to post something meaningful, I'm literally just coming here to say hi. So. Yeah, no, I think it's a good point. Thank you. And Tracy, I was just asking, do you, do you have any examples of peer support that you wanted to share? Um, probably not, I, I've had connectivity problems, so you're catching me on That's the right. bit with this one. Um, I think probably one of the things during lockdown that's been really valuable is just having like a WhatsApp group with a group of chief officers. And I'm sure you all do the same kind of thing. Um, But it's really coming to its own, I think, during lockdown, where in the morning, sometimes you can just put something on there that might just be, I'm not great today. I'm really struggling. Has anybody seen this, seen that? Because I feel a bit out of the loop with things, which sometimes can make me feel like I'm kind of on the back foot and I don't really know what's happening. I don't know if you sometimes experience that where other people seem to be in the loop and know everything and sometimes you're not. And just having a group of really friendly people you can just go to and say, hey, I'm I'm really struggling to know what's going on here and, and just be updated straight away is actually really valuable and even yeah. more so during these times. I completely agree. Um, so we'll 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 head on to the the next panel now. So um, Bridge and Rosie, thank you very much. That was another valuable um, session. I really hope that people got some great um, input from that. So thank you both. Um, a, a colleague of mine has has mentioned about the psychological first aid course. I think she's she's doing it at the moment, and she's trying to promote that with our volunteers. So that's a really useful yeah, so resource that people can so it's a free government um, program isn't it that's on free. future learn so if anyone's doing it internally then it's on it's yeah. on workplace that you can see it yeah. but if not then yeah do go on to um google and search for psychological first day i think it's a three-hour training program or something isn't it but it is really useful as you say so thank you for raising yeah, that that's great like that, so thank you yeah. both um and that's great thank you okay and yeah you're welcome bye bye okay bye. um so steph Tracy and Al, welcome to the next session, which I quickly read at the bottom before it disappears, is how to start talking to colleagues about mental health, theirs and our own. Um, so um, we'll do introductions again. And I know, Steph, we've had you on, um, but it's just useful to people to know if they've just tuned in. So we'll start with you. Great. Um, so I'm Steph, and I'm part of um, the Digital Workplace team, which is part of uh, National Citizens Advice. Um, I'll kind of recap what I said before around um, mental health and um, it's definitely something that I've kind of known I've always had um, because I think everybody has mental health whether yours is really really great or maybe not so great um, but it's only been in the last year or so um, that I've really kind of come face to face with mine um, and have had um, to kind of battle through it so um i've learned loads along the way um, i've learned what to do and what not to do um which i think is really important to kind of recognize as well um but really excited to be able to chat about how to talk to others about it um whether it's just mine or checking in um because i think that's something that can be really really tricky and quite sticky to do but once you kind of start having that conversation um I don't know about you, but I immediately feel like a massive weight off my shoulders and I feel so much more comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. That's really useful. Thank you, Steph. Um, Tracy? Hi, Tracy Hopkins, uh, Chief Officer at Blackpool. Um, obviously, like a lot of you, I mean, mental health has touched my own life and, and those that I love around me. Um, 
in a variety of different ways. I mean, probably my first awareness of mental health was when I was doing my finals at a university, which is too long ago to remember, to mention now. But uh, and my father was made redundant from Leyland Motors after 27 years uh, and had serious mental health problems following that. Um, it was quite a difficult time for me growing up. Um, and then I experienced my own issues around mental health and have found it quite difficult to talk about this. I've talked about it in very private, close groups with other groups of women, um, but not really openly with very many people. But when my son was born, my first child, who's now 18, I suffered with severe postnatal depression, um, which anybody who knows depression will know it comes with a it's not a lot different really than any form of depression, postnatal depression, um, other than the added issue of obviously having to look after the baby. But it comes with a whole range of suicidal thoughts, feelings of inadequacy, um, which hit me like a brick wall. And um, I would say I, I'm still recovering from that, even to this day, 18 years later. Um, but not a bad thing. I think there's really positive things that I take from this experience. And I think I heard somebody say this morning, um, when you've had days where you feel like you want to end it all, then actually the positive thing about feeling really great, the contrast to that, and knowing that you're kind of still here, you're living your life, and, and you've got lots and lots of positive things going on in your life, is a great contrast that makes you just feel so much better um, about kind of life. So, so I don't always think I don't always see my mental health as a negative thing at all, um, mm. but like so many people. Sometimes I just don't quite know where I'm going to be or how I'm going to feel. And the recent challenges have obviously um, yeah. had ups and downs. Like for everybody. Um, and also added that to that in the mix as well is uh, my husband suffers with depression. Um, and he has, um, ag again, it, it, he describes it as being a real asset to him. Um, and he works in a very different environment. So there's quite a lot of solidarity we feel in terms of how we cope with it as a family. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Tracy. Thank you. And Al, have we got your audio working now? I hope so. How does this sound? You can hear me all right? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so I'm Al Bell. I'm the Chief Officer at Oxford. Um, I've probably struggled with mental health all my life, um, but I didn't realise it till uh, about uh, nearly 20 years ago now, um, when I really, well, I guess, like I'd overworked before and I'd gone off with stress but I totally um imploded when lots of life events happened all at one time mm -hmm. and I think that's the thing with mental health isn't it like one or two things um you know you can be quite resilient for one or two things but it's when like it's more than one or two things and then everything all happens at the same time mm -hmm. um and that's what happened to me and um I had, um, yeah, and then I was diagnosed with depression and had lots of counselling and medication um, and um, I still take medication um, at a lower level and I still have to keep aware of what's going on and, and check myself. Um, and uh, yeah, just as Tracy said, I, I think it's an asset. I think um, I, it makes me a better listener, a better empathiser, a better boss hopefully um and uh yeah like working with people as whole people and not just like what your targets and outputs are but realizing that when we come to work you know all of us comes and as employers we need to look after everything um and yeah some people don't relate to that um but the people that do i think it it, it really helps so that's me Thank you. And thank you for sharing that again. Thank you all for sharing. I think that's it's a great introduction, really, isn't it, to the session. I just wanted to start with a comment from Ray Harner, which is, um, having worked for Preston Sit and Device for a number of years, I feel a period during lockdown has actually been a blessing in disguise. Building a support network with our peers has proven to be a positive aspect. So that's really good. So thank you for, um, for that as well. Um, so who wants to start us off with how to... Um, I keep having to catch the, the the ticker at the bottom. I'll start talking to colleagues about mental health. Who wants to start us off on on your thoughts on that? Well, I feel um, one of the ways that, um, like, obviously, as a new chief officer, you're not going to walk into a role and start talking about your mental health straight off. Um, 
I think you're, yeah, I think that's quite a unique thing to do. Uh, it doesn't mean to say it's bad, but it's not where I would position myself. Um, and I think, you know, talking about mental health, um, you have to feel safe, don't you? You have to feel safe that you can share comfortably and what you're going to say is not going to be rejected or um, questioned or fixed either. So um, you want it to fall on, on warm ears. And I think uh, that's that's one of the things that um, you can do on a one-on-one -on -one basis much easier than you can with a group. So I think when I've started talking about mental health, um, I first start talking about it in one-to-ones with staff. Um, and I probably wouldn't talk about mental health. Like, it's not like you go in with, like, how's your mental health today? Because um, that's culturally something not we're not used to. And I think people will be like, oh, yeah, fine. Why are you asking? Like, what, what's wrong with me? So I think it's got to be over that basis of a, a relationship, hasn't it? And, and part mm -hmm. of, um, of knowing people. And I think... You know, I can just tell by watching one of the team on Zoom. They don't even have to speak and I can see like where they're at. I'll get an idea and then I might send them a message saying, are you OK? You didn't seem quite yourself this morning. And those little kind of ins, I think, are, are much easier. Yeah, and I, and I completely agree. But I do. I do. I am just going to add in a bit of contrast to, to that, because I think for me, I, I did join this this organisation with being open about it right from day one uh, that for me and again it's all about perceptions isn't it so this was my own perception but the perception was 27 i think i'm still well i don't know how old i was i, I can never i wasn't 27 i was 26 so i was 26 <laughs> i had to check tinder one point to see what my age was that's how bad it's got to um uh, so i was 26 when i took over this here and and the concern is true though and the concern is that um that obviously there's a lot of perceptions then automatically, isn't there, of always young. I was on a call the other day, I went to someone else's AGM, I remember the sitting device, and the volunteers were like, he can't be CEO of the next door sitting device, he's only about 10 or whatever, you know, so you always get those type of comments. So for me, I think it was about coming in and saying, well, look, you know, the mental health is a really important aspect of, of why I want to be the chief exec. It's because here's all the things that I've been through, here's all the things that I've, not, well, you know, not offloading every single aspect of things, but, you know, for, for me, it's 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 very clear, you know, and I talked to my mum about this a lot, but she went through domestic violence for as long as I can remember, or from the earliest memory that I can remember, you know, when I was having to call the police at, at five, six, seven, ten years old in case things went too far. And when I say too far, it doesn't mean that anything was acceptable, but at what point does this actually become, a, a you know, an ultimate crisis there? And no child should ever have to make those sorts of judgment calls. Um, so I wanted to put that context in place just to say to people, look, you know, you are going to have your views straight away of look at this guy. You know, we've all because it is, you know, a, a lot of time that is the case with volunteers, isn't it? That they've retired, they've had very successful careers and then they're given back. And you've got this young guy who now is telling you how to, to do your role properly and, and the way it should be. So I tried to set the context in that way. And it didn't work with a lot of people, but it did work with a lot of other people. And it instantly made some connections there where people were saying, look, here's what I think we're missing here. Here's what I think we could do. And it just seemed to open up that, that vulnerability conversation around we're a charity. That's exactly the type of people that we are absolutely here determined to help. What can we do more on that? But I don't think I'd go into proper details of diagnosis of this and that and whatever until, as you say, then you build relationships, um, which are important as well. So just wanted to add a bit of that context. Steph, I think you were looking to come in next, is that correct? Yep. Um, I think there's something about have, uh, that kind of when you recognize that you have um, something with your mental health. And I almost found it as soon as I recognized mine, I found it so much easier to recognize it in other people, um, whether that was, oh, they feel they're looking a little bit anxious today, or they're looking a little bit down today. And it almost kind of, you kind of see some mirror aspects of how you might be feeling on other people. And I think that makes a massive difference in being able to help have those conversations, because you can kind of relate to it straight away. Um, I think there's something about uh, I think I went off sick um, for about a month um, because of my mental health. And I remember my first day back, 
um, kind of having somebody ask me about it straight away. Um, and I was really quite open with kind of uh, why I was off sick, but it still took me back because it wasn't something that I had really talked to many people about. It was something I, I kept quite internally for myself. Um, and I think it is one of those things that once I kind of opened my mouth and let the first sentence out, which was so scary, um, it just made such a massive difference into how I can talk about it now. Um, and kind of letting uh, others know, my family know, my friends know. Um, it felt like a really scary situation initially and having those conversations still can feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but I think it's one of those things where once you start to have it, it kind of is like an avalanche effect and it just keeps going. Um, and it sometimes is really hard to stop, but um, you do feel better afterwards. And I think whether that's you talking about yours or you listening to somebody about theirs, um, there is just a sense of helping each other. And at the end of the day, that's probably all why we want to work for Citizens Advice. And we want to help people and we want to support them and we want to bring out the best in everyone. Um, and kind of having these conversations is one way that we know we can do that amongst ourselves. Mm. And Stephanie, what made you decide to um, be fully open with the colleague who asked you about the sick leave? You must have made a conscious decision at some point to, to to be honest yeah I think um I think when I was first diagnosed I thought it was um kind of like a weight um and it was something that I was just gonna have to carry for a really long time um but then the as soon as I started to find myself recovering a bit um which was definitely like a a bit of a some days were really great and some days weren't that great um I think I started to find that it was something a story that I needed to tell um and I remember my um therapist originally saying that um kind of going through all this is a little bit like a scar um or a cut and if you don't kind of address it and if you don't feel comfortable talking about it it might kind of fester and become infected and, and be this thing that's just kind of always there um hi Sarah um but then kind of if you're able to talk about it kind of clean, cleans it out. You'll always have that scar, but to me, scars make you stronger. Um, and I felt like I was starting to develop mine so that I could kind of share that with others and, and help others in my team or my office or wider. Because um, I think sometimes it just takes one person to be able to talk about it. And then that gives you the strength that you need. Um, sorry, oh, Sarah so can't hear us. So we're just trying to sort that out, but thank you. So can you hear us now, Sarah? You did smile then. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Tracy, did you want to come in? Because I think you haven't spoken on this. I think you know, just listening to what you said about, you know, Jake, you being very open and Stephanie, you reached the point where you decided to sort of be open. About Sorry, Tracy, we can't. We, it's it's very, very low. Oh, right. Okay. Um, is that any better? Can you hear me now? Yes, that's fine. Yes, now? brilliant. Um, like I said, I'm having issues about where in the house I can be at the moment because I've got an electrician sure. in. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, just with you, Jake, talking about deciding to be open about it right from the outset, really. Mm -hmm. and, and Stephanie, your kind of moment of mm -hmm. realising that this was a chance to be open and, and the things that you could gain from that. I think it takes a huge amount of confidence to do that. But I think also one of the things that I'm really conscious of is creating the environment where it is much easier for people to talk about things so where well, you don't necessarily have to do the thing like Al mentioned about how's your mental health today um you know I actually do that with my children uh, and they look at me like I'm a bit strange but mm. you know I'm genuinely interested and and you know and it, it kind of opens up conversations I won't be too confident about doing that as a leader necessarily with my teams but I think there's quite a lot of tools that you can use and quite a lot of ways in which you can um, set a culture really around it being acceptable to, to have these discussions and I think then what I'm trying to do is create that culture so that actually if then there are any problems uh, people do feel that they can talk about it so they don't have to say I've got a dental appointment this morning they can actually give me a call and say look I'm having a really tough time of it um, I'm going to need a little bit of time off and feel confident that they can do that and they're going to get the right reaction and actually they're going to be able to feel comfortable about then discussing any issues that they have. And I think some of the things that we've tried to sort of put in place are a little bit more openness around how we're all feeling when we come into things like SMT meetings. Um, yeah. We used a technique that you may have come across, which is us all writing our own user manuals. 
so we can all get to know each other a little bit better and understand how we work um uh, the kind of conditions we like to work in so you know i have um, managers who really like being autonomous and they've probably well they have had a really great time during lockdown um, I have other managers who at first really struggled because they're very sociable people, want to be around others, bounce ideas off one another. And knowing that allowed me then to relate to those managers in a different way during lockdown as well. So I think if you've not come across it, they use the manual technique where it asks you a series of questions uh, and you basically create your own user manual uh, and then you share it amongst your team. And it really just gives them an insight into who you are, how you work, um, I, I recall you, Jake, saying recently about some mornings you just can't get your head in gear. Um, I certainly experienced that. Other mornings I'll be up at six and I'll be on workplace. Um, you know, it, 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 it varies, doesn't it? But if people yeah. understand that and know that about you, I think it makes it much easier then to start creating that environment where we feel more comfortable about talking about our mental health. Yeah, and I think I think I do think it's interesting. It's just, I did talk about that just a little bit before, um, and that's just about obviously my sort of coping mechanisms myself on how to sort of respond to that uh, and not let the day become affected by you know sort of how you're initially feeling in, in that morning. Um, so so Al, Al has obviously just sent me some notes on 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 how we're supposed to do this panel, which we're twenty minutes into and I've missed out. So we wanted to start off that so, so that was obviously still a great introduction so we want you know we want to then talk about so on one-to-one -one then so on, this is on the their mental health so you know stuff like how do we broach the subject in one-to-ones about why we should have that dialogue mental health being important the resilience how to make people feel safe etc cetera, etc cetera. so so what are your views on approaching other people's uh, mental health Oh, I don't um, mind. I think when it comes to approaching others, I think it is a really tricky situation because um, some people might be really, really open to talking about it and kind of feeling like they might be having kind of an anxiety attack at that moment. And, and actually, they do need to speak to someone to try to help kind of overcome it. And um, where other people, maybe they haven't quite recognized that they have mental health um, and that it's something that's affecting them and it took me far too long to realize that I did um, so it was always just something that I thought was like in the background I'm not really going to think about it um, but that didn't necessarily stop people like um, my friends or my colleagues or my manager just kind of saying are you okay and it's not asking in a very direct way are you feeling anxious today are you feeling depressed today um, but kind of just checking in as you normally would um, with a friend and just kind of how's it going and sometimes you kind of catch things in that conversation whether it's um, if it's kind of video call and or if it was face to face um, kind of if things just sound a bit down kind of sometimes it's just teasing it out a little bit um, but I, I wouldn't kind of I'd be quite weary sometimes about going into a conversation straight away asking how your mental health is unless it is your family members or your your husband or your loved ones or kind of people that you, you can really ask those questions with. I think with colleagues, it can be um, try quite a uh, eggshell kind of conversation to get started with, but then really, really rewarding once you have it. That's great. Yeah, and it sounds that. like you were really happy when somebody asked you how you were um, and then you could respond to that. And sometimes it's having that opener, isn't it? And giving someone, asking someone a nice open-ended question, and then they can, you know, take that conversation where they want to take it. And then you can probe people a bit more. Um, we're great at saying, you know, hi, how are you? Hi, I'm great, thanks, how are you, how are you? And nobody actually is listening. Um, so um, I think it's worth like, just making sure that you are spending the time to just, leave the space in that conversation once you've opened up and, and let that person fill it. Tracy, what do you find useful? Uh, I, think I, I always kind of work on the principle, if you're going to ask how somebody is, then you really need to be prepared to hear any range of things. And, and a lot of people say, yeah, I'm fine. But actually, if you're going to ask how somebody is, you've got to be prepared then to hear, well, actually, I'm really not doing great. And I think a lot of us aren't. It's kind of a throwaway comment. And, and I think sometimes, asking well really how are you uh, you know how are you doing and again 
during this time it's probably coming to its own a little bit more of that um for everybody really um but particularly for our teams um and asking people genuinely how are you doing um, and and you know making them feel confident enough to be able to tell you i think is really important um i think again i i'd probably go back to some of the kind of techniques that we can use in the workplace um and there's techniques around setting the right culture but i think there's also um simple things that we can do really i i sort of go back to i used to to manage a, a homeless and social enterprise and the majority of, of people we helped were single males um some sort of in the late teens early 20s and we provided accommodation and work um and really it was that kind of stepping stone back into um, a more kind of even keel in life um, and obviously the full range of, of mental health issues and I think it's that really kind of non-judgmental um, way of being and that, that obviously is a bedrock of us as an organisation mm. too yeah. and I think if we can always keep reminding ourselves that that, that is exactly where we come from and that was something when we did a bit of work around our vision and our values within the, the homelessness charity, social enterprise, we really honed in on this non-judgmental um, uh, kind of idea of we need to live this and breathe this, you know, not meaning to be cliched, but kind of walk the talk here and really demonstrate that people can talk about absolutely anything. Um, and we, you know, we had some real breakthroughs where people opened up about things like the death of a child through neglect because they were drug addicts and and things that they'd never really talked about before that made such a big difference to their progress and how they uh, kind of started to recover in every sense of the world word really so I think sometimes it is about that going right back to the basics of thinking how do we make sure that we are completely non-judgmental because the last thing anybody's going to start talking to you about is how they're feeling or things that have happened to them in their lives if they feel there is going to be any reaction and sometimes it is shocking um but i think it's really important to actively listen um and to and we've talked a bit more a bit about that earlier this morning didn't we but to also make sure that you are in a space where you really are not going to judge those individuals mm, yeah no i think that's really useful thing to come back to and really aligns with yeah our value structure because you know the four of us have all shared that we're coming from having experienced mental health issues and like 25 percent of people do but not everyone is as lucky as we are to have you know our own personal experience to draw upon and i can imagine that if you uh a chief officer or in another role where um you haven't got that experience to draw on um it can might feel a bit intimidating or a bit overwhelming and um so to come back to that non-judgmental um i think and and i suppose also the thing that about you know wanting people to thrive like i genuinely want our clients but also our staff and our volunteers to be um in situations where they can thrive and um you know ha having a space for a dialogue around well-being or resilience or emotional health or you know, we don't have to talk about mental health, you know, it's just there's quite a lot of different facets there. Um, you know, being able to talk about all those things means that, you know, people will achieve their potential, people will enjoy their work, people will, you know, all the stuff that, you know, is great for us as an organisation, but it's also great for them as individuals. Well, can I just add in, sorry, yeah. Steph, go on, go no, on, go on. No, I was just okay. going to quickly say about I was just going to quickly say about stigma though because I think you know we've been very positive today about about talking about mental health and 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 and, and that sort of stuff but there is still a big stigma isn't there and when when Sarah Hughes comes on at, at three I think um, from the sense of mental health we'll have a chat about this because in our catch up we had last week it was talking about how you know I worked for Mind in 2015 and it even felt like a different place then in terms of mental health there was still a lot more stigma and now it feels like there's less stigma but there's less support or there's not still not the support hasn't increased um but then we do hear and i was on linkedin the other day where obviously lots of people are in a, a position where they're looking for jobs now and some of the people were talking to me about how you know being open about their mental health they feel that they're not getting jobs because of that reason so it's just important to remember sort of those aspects as well is there are lots of reasons why people still would not be open about 
mental health. So I think Ali touches upon your point of just having these safe spaces and having it on the agenda positively will hopefully give people sort of permission and, and comfort in ensuring it within with at least within their own team because it doesn't mean you then have to tell everybody does it you know just having a conversation with one person doesn't mean the whole network of centerface for example needs to know so it's there yeah no 100 percent. and i think it's kind of um kind of making sure that you're comfortable with who you're talking to about it and kind of um it's not something that you feel like you need to broadcast to everyone because it it isn't it's completely up to you and it is your mental health after all it's not um kind of mental health of everyone to know about um unless you want it to be that um i think the other thing that um has just kind of sprung to mind i remember this from a couple of years ago was i think there was a campaign going around around um asking kind of the question three times and um, so if you said how are you and someone said i'm fine fine is one of those words where I think we've kind of banned it in our team um because fine never actually really means fine and um, it generally means like I'm not okay but what can you do um and kind of asking that are you really fine are you sure are you okay um kind of tends to be after the third time you've really had a chance to think about it um, and then you kind of can be a bit more well actually I'm struggling with this thing or actually um it's you know actually no i'm not okay i think i need to take some time for myself um and kind of not pushing people um too much and not you know saying are you are you feeling anxious or anything like that but kind of giving people that that space um because i don't know about you but sometimes it takes me a couple of minutes to remember what day of the week it is let alone to recognize how i'm feeling um so kind of letting people kind of let the gears move a little bit especially on a monday morning if i've not had enough coffee you're not going to get an answer out of me very quickly um so kind of just giving people that that time and knowing that they can come back to you about it as well um is really good that's a really important point so Jake, if i can just yeah, cool. quickly come in there on what stephanie said because i think also maybe acknowledging sometimes that when people have felt the way they felt for such a long time that actually they don't know the difference and again i can kind of relate to my own experience in this because i thought that was how i was supposed to feel when i had a baby and i tell everybody i was fine and for a while i started to believe it myself because i thought it was normal and I think that, that, again, going back to my work experience as well, I met a lot of particularly young men, but some young women as well, who've been street homeless for a long time. And they didn't re really know how to feel good anymore. They didn't really know how to have good mental health. And I think, you know, that's probably less prevalent within Citizens Advice. But I think there will be people within our staff and volunteer base who will need that kind of learning environment that, that we maybe take for granted when we recognize ourselves good days and bad days and i think sometimes saying fine is really just about i'm not quite sure what it means to feel better than this this is normal for me this is just how i live my life and how i get on with my day um and again you know i think it comes back to the stigma of probably never having opened up and never feeling that they can open up um and i suppose what i'm kind of throwing back to you is what what do we do about that? How can we counteract some of that so that there is that? And, and it's, it's a difficult thing. I mean, anybody who's been through counselling knows to get to a point where you can talk about things, you've got to go through a real pain barrier. Um, can we support people in that within Citizens Advice? I think it's based on your team and it's based on your manager and kind of those that surround you kind of having having that space um we've kind of done we've done a lot as a team to kind of uh we've done these kind of permission settings and saying it's okay to um have just have my headphones in all day and not actually talk to anyone it's okay to to kind of leave a little bit early if you really need to it's okay to start a bit later if that's what you need it's okay um to kind of really take that lunch break and actually take it um and kind of just giving yourself that permission has been massively helpful in the sense that um, even if you don't necessarily recognize that you've got something with your mental health that you want to think about and um, just kind of giving yourself that permission 
does actually do a world of wonder because it's a psychological safety across your whole team and saying um, this is a thing that we all agree is how we should work um, and you've kind of had buy-in from your manager and everyone else in the team so that you know if I said guys do you know what I'm gonna go offline for like an hour because I just can't right now or I need that space they go okay see you bye no questions asked and that's really that's really great and um, so kind of giving yourself those little cues are really, really helpful. Um, Cause you might notice that one person is actually taking quite a lot of offline time. Oh, I wonder if they're okay. And kind of helps you to, to guide that conversation, but it's different tips and tricks, I think, depending on your team. I think one of the problems, which I'm sure um, other offices would have is that um, my team can work too much. Um, and I'm probably a bit guilty of that myself, and I have to make sure I lead by example. Um, so making sure I'm taking leave and things like that. But um, yeah, that kind of giving permission. Um, so I know other organisations have put in a structured amount of time that they're expecting staff to be available for as they went into lockdown, and they had a lot of um, employees with dependents. So um, at the start of lockdown, they said, right, we want you to work 60% of your hours, and then it slowly increased 70, 80, blah, blah, blah. Um, And yeah, I've had conversations with probably the majority of people saying, okay, I'm not fussed about your hours. Like your work is excellent. Do what you need to do. Family is more important. Yourself is more important. And like people are dealing with a lot of stuff. They're being pulled in multiple directions. Uh, I had my mum here for six weeks, it felt like, I don't know, six years, and while she was recovering from pneumonia, you know, and you just got to be realistic about how much capacity you have when you're dealing with all this stuff, and then there's nowhere to go, right? You're just at home 24-7, and your office is just there, and your bed is just there. Um, so, yeah, I think um, just, yeah, allowing people and making it that you're saying stuff and giving permission to not be perfect not be brilliant not be top of the class um, and it's always the people who are the perfectionists who are like actually the world's worst you know and giving themselves a hard time it's like do you know what 80 percent is great you know 80 percent is just fine like i'm not expecting any more than that any day you know we all have moments without all of this where we procrastinate a bit want to chat to a colleague do some personal email do a bit of banking whatever like that's normal you know um and we just gotta i think it's really important to go with the energies that you've got definitely um, and then some people's like jobs are a bit more structured so they have less control but i think if you go with your energies and if you're feeling gosh if you feel like an afternoon nap take 20 minutes that you'll come back so much fresher definitely and i think oh sorry jay can I? No, no, please do, because I'm going to move gonna us say, on. There's so you, that, you um, off your that kind of uh, quote going around now as well that we're not necessarily just working from home, but we're working through a pandemic. And um, it's kind of really important not to forget that as well, because I think um, if I was just working from home in a normal day, those would be my days where I like get my head down and get loads done. Um, and at the minute, I'm working from my in laws, and you know, it, it's during a global pandemic, and I can't really get outside. and it, a lot's changed and it's just being really kind to yourself. I agree, I agree, that's great. And it's been really, and it's, good. it's just been another really useful session. We've just done 24 hours, and if you remember, I wanted to reduce <laughs> the staff as well. Um, I think, um, I think what's, what, I'm, what I'm really interested in here is the, obviously we've talked about talking about other people's mental health, so that's sort of us approaching them, isn't it? But actually, a lot of people watching this, or maybe in the future, uh, watching this, will might be thinking about how they can raise the subject themselves and surely that's also more empowering is because they're then leading on that conversation so what are your thoughts on 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 you as an individual then talking about your mental health and obviously we've got different dynamics here haven't we we've got three of us myself tracy and al that would need to be talking to a board which tend to obviously have different way of operating and, and a bit more disconnection and then steph part of obviously that national association where even if there was a problem hopefully you'd be able to influence the hr structures and stuff to be able to do that so different dynamics but still just equally as interesting what are your views on us as individuals then bring being able to bring mental health and talk about that openly to our teams or land managers 
Yeah, I think it's been helpful um, to be able to let people know that I've had personal experience. Um, I think it helps them to feel safer. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so that's, I guess that's how I started talking about my own experience because I started, you know, I put out the open question, they came back. Obviously, I'm not going to hijack the conversation and go, oh, yeah, well, totally, that was how it was for me. Da, da, da. Um, but, you know, I could see that they felt that they were risking something and to give them assurance that I had a level of understanding, I just touched on it. Um, and I think that enabled to me, you know, get more trust. Um, I think it's difficult if you haven't had that experience you know to to be able to say it in the same way but i think we've all had wobbles we've all felt overwhelmed we all feel like imposters we all have days where we doubt our own abilities and you know that's that's all about your emotional and mental well-being so you know drawing on everyone has got a personal experience of some kind um and it doesn't have to be you know an actual diagnosis for it to be valid yeah um, and, and, and Tracy, uh, thank you, Al. Uh, Tracy, I think the user manual, obviously, you've got a lot of positive comments there from people on workplace, and I think some of the national team stuff. I don't know if I've saw posts from you before on this stuff. I know a lot of people have put it on Medium as well to publicly sort of put it out there as well. So, Tracy, what, what are your views and thoughts on, on, on us, ourselves, talking about our own mental health? Um, to be honest with you, I mean, you might be surprised. I, I, I haven't had a conversation with my chair or my board about my own mental health. Um, not in frank terms around, I don't know that I have ever even disclosed that I've had postnatal depression. I might have done in passing, but it's definitely not been something that I've ever really said, let's sit down, have a conversation here. This is something you need to know about. I definitely didn't discuss it at interview. Um, I don't even know that it was particularly on my radar at interview and maybe that's something that I need to actually work on um, because if I'm I want to be an advocate for talking about mental health well I'm going to have to do as I'm kind of saying aren't I really um, I think I'd find it really hard in all honesty to sit down and have a conversation with my chair um, and I, I think it, it would take I, I think it would probably be a positive thing to do in the long run um, but I I suppose I need a bit of guidance really on how you start, what you want the outcome of that to be. Uh, and maybe there's other people out there who can, can share some of their experiences around this. I think I'm really good at, at talking to others about it. I think I'm probably really rubbish at, at, at talking about my own, own mental health. It, it, it sounds strange, but it feels quite self-indulgent. Um, I don't know if you sometimes feel like that. Um, and, you know, and, and maybe because there's other people around me that I talk to a lot about things to do with emotions, um, to do with, um, you know, I'm very conscious having um, an 18 year old son and an 11 year old daughter, that it's really important to have these conversations in the family. Um, and, and obviously with both me and my husband experiencing uh, different kinds of, of mental health issues, um, we're very open as a family, but I think I, I, I am far less comfortable with that in the workplace. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to take part in this. And when Jake put it out there and I thought it's just such an amazing thing. Um, and actually it's been amazing already for me, but I think there's gonna be so much more that will come from this. Uh, but yeah, if anybody's got any tips and ideas about um, how, not just how you start this conversation, but also what, what where do you want it to go? And I'm not quite okay. sure I know that. I think that's really, and, and, and thank you, Tracy, because that's all really useful. Again, I, I think for me, it, for me, it is about the practical elements of that. So I say it wouldn't be about saying, oh, here's what I've got and you need to just do, deal with it or, or find a solution. It would be about what are the strengths and weaknesses of that. So I said, for example, you know, I've been very open that I want to work part time and thankfully I don't have as much commitments that I do need to have that full time salary. So um, and the reason for that is the flexibility of 
you know, it might wake up one day and actually I've talked about not wanting morning meetings, but actually it might be the whole day. But actually I don't need to call in sick. I don't need to do all of the official stuff that goes through the system and just swap my day. You know, it's surely up to me to manage my diary and my own arrangements. And obviously sensible enough to know that if there's something unavoidable, such as maybe a trustee board, that I might just have to get on with that meeting in itself, but not do other stuff. Um, and I think the way I've approached it is is also then around, you know, if, I, if I'm being open with you about this, this is what you can expect from me to treat the rest of the team like. And I think that does put a little bit of expectation on them because it's a bit of a, I don't know what the right phrase would be, but you are sort of setting your expectations on them. And it's a moral thing then, isn't it? You're, what you're saying is this is how we are treating everyone else. And you really shouldn't then be treating me any differently if that's the way the organization's going to behave. But as I said, I don't think I will personally do it just to say, here is the problem, unless I was and you know, and ever diagnosed with a serious mental health illness, such as psychosis or a personality disorder or something else that I would want putting on the agenda uh, with, that, with absolutely that longer term impact. But it would just be to set that tone and set those expectations on, here are my vulnerabilities, here is how I think I can cope with them, but here's some things that I just can't do. So one of them um, is about diplomacy. So I'm not necessarily the greatest at diplomacy if I'm involved in the situation. So I'm very diplomatic when it's something that doesn't really personally affect me, but when I'm in the middle of it, I am absolutely not someone that can rationally sort out this situation. But again, what, what, what would I need to be able to support that? So that if anyone ever or the board did ever notice that type of situation or we were at a board meeting and it's something i'm really passionate about we should be doing this and it's definitely not going in my way my 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 bit of energy and and and, and drama for, like might come from that is not personally directed at people so it's again just to try and set those expectations really so i don't know if that sort of helps you tracy hello there oh, oh sorry tracy go on. I can relate to, yeah sorry to just come back to you i can fully relate to that because I think when you're emotionally involved in something, it's hard to be objective about it. And that definitely comes across with me as well. I think there's been times where I've been called defensive yeah. um, and I, I found that quite insulting because actually what it's all about is I'm passionate about this. Uh, and yeah, I probably am fighting my corner on it and I probably will jump in as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, thank you for sharing that, Jake. Really informative, mm -hmm. yeah. And can all I right. just come in there as well? Because I think... Um, uh, we work in a values driven sector you know we work in this sector because we're passionate because we're driven because we care we bring our whole self to work and if we're bringing the whole self and expecting people to bring the whole self and wanting to get the benefits of that you know there are the you know swings and roundabouts isn't it you know we, we, we want passionate motivated people um and so we are going to get passionate and motivated and, um, you know, if you were start selling widgets, you know, you might feel kind of quite differently about work. But in terms of what we do, it's, it's really important to, to be passionate. That's a good point. Steph, did you want to talk about your, your, your views yeah. on, on, on? I think, um, I think when it comes down to being yourself about it and, and sharing kind of what you want to share. Um, I think there shouldn't be, shouldn't ever be a pressure for you to share what you don't feel comfortable with. Um, but I know I found when I was first diagnosed, one of my friends at work um, had already opened up to me about the fact that she was taking antidepressants or she was kind of going through something similar. And I remember seeing her as kind of this ally that I could um, kind of use to have these initial conversations with and to help answer these questions of well, what does that actually mean and how do I how do I do that and I think that was so incredibly valuable for me because just having those conversations made it feel more normal straight away because I was I was we were going out for a drink after work and just chatting about it like it was like oh the weather was really nice today wasn't it and it just felt really normal suddenly um which I think um, I know I, I'm really grateful for it because I think otherwise I could very easily be kind of hiding behind it um, and not really feeling comfortable to talk about it. And I, I would encourage anyone who um, is kind of going through something similar, if you if you have a kind of other people in your life that have gone through it as well, talk to them and ask them questions. And, and it's kind of that thing where there is no stupid question and um, they're all really valid and, and mm -hmm. it's something that you, you should 
be interested in because it is affecting you um, and I know I'm more than happy to be that person for anyone if they need and um, so there's your call out if you need it um, but I think kind of just having having space for yourself to figure out what you need um, and then kind of sharing that more widely I think it took me quite a while to kind of share with my team what I was going through and kind of how I was feeling um, but I think once I kind of started to leave some like cookie crumbs of like heads kind of around the world way it just all kind of clicked together and made sense um whether that's we do kind of uh, we work in an agile way so we work in sprints which is every two weeks and um, we kind of set ourselves some goals and we'll just quite literally sprint at them and at the end we'll do a bit of a retro to see how the week's gone um and whether that's kind of these are the things that went well and these are the things that didn't really go so well um and i think i found that that's where i could feel really honest um because it was anonymous because we're doing it on post-its and putting them on a wall, even though some people might be able to be deciphered through their handwriting. Um, but it kind of was, it was really therapeutic actually to kind of put that stuff down and even doing it in a digital way now, it's still quite nice to say, this wasn't my week. Um, I, I wasn't feeling hundred um, percent. Thank you for your support. Sorry for this, even though sorry should never be a word that's used either when it comes to your mental health. I think it's really good points. Thank you, Steph. And and I think for me as well, I think an important point to raise would be that you know people shouldn't only talk about openly about mental health if they also know the answers, because often it's not rational, is it? So we don't know how to fix this. We don't know how to overcome it. Uh, and I do think sometimes people feel like you have to be in a great place to then talk about your mental health. And actually, I'm sure that's something we would discourage uh, as well anyway. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and like regular checking in and um, yeah, I've had like staff burst into tears um, and I think that's a real honour. Like I feel really, I mean, obviously I'm not happy that they're upset, but I'm really happy yeah, yeah. that we can have got a relationship where they can be exactly who they are in that moment. And, um, you know, and I think I have now like made a check on myself to say, okay, let me be not real as well. Like, I'm not always this big, brave, strong boss. Everything's going fine. I'm like a swan. You know, I am allowed off days. I am allowed to feel rubbish and not form and get stuff wrong. And I think that, you know, as part of, like, just the being human thing um, and taking the pressure off ourselves can also just improve the dialogue and allow, um, you know, the team to be more real. I think, you know, the whole, maybe it's just about being authentic. I think that's, that's what's coming through quite a lot today. I agree, thank you. And hi, Carol, welcome to the live stream. Hello. Hi. hi. So we're just finishing off our panel on um, how to talk about mental health and we're on the section of our own mental health. So Tracy, I think you were, you were gonna come in there. About kind of being authentic. Um, I feel that this is probably the first role I've had. I mean, I've been a chief officer at Blackpool for nearly six years now. Um, and I think it's probably the first role I've had, a leadership role, where I actually feel I'm taking myself to work. Um, and I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but I mean, I became a chief exec, um, probably not as young as Jake, um, mm -hmm. about 17 years ago. And um, I worked in a, an education charity for, for eight years, an education business partnership in Manchester. And I had very much a work persona. Uh, and it helped because it was quite a corporate environment. We were dealing a lot with employers. I was going out and meeting with employers around employer engagement within schools and colleges. So I was kind of suited and booted a bit more. And sometimes that's easier to then kind of not have to think about you as the person and become like work tracing. And I think it was a bit of a revelation to me when I realised I can be more authentic, I can be vulnerable, which was a biggie for me because I think I, I never, ever felt comfortable about ever displaying any vulnerability in that role and possibly even in the role when I was running the social enterprise as well. Um, but I think over the last six years, I've definitely settled in and become much more comfortable about who I am, about the fact that, I've got a, especially at the moment, I mean, I've got, you know, so much more going on work-wise. I'm not so much working from home as living at home whilst trying to work. Um, and, and, you know, and I've got children and I've got 
um, you know, all kinds of things going on. Like today, I've got an electrician putting new sockets in because we need a new office space. And, you know, it's just like life is kind of going on. And it's been difficult for me to kind of carve out a space that's comfortable. And, it, it, you know, and I've got the sun in my eyes and I've got mm -hmm. – and, and and I'm much more comfortable sitting here and going, look, I'm I'm in a woolly cardigan and I'm kind of like, you know, I've no makeup on. And and, and and some of those things sound really trivial, but actually it's about the authenticity that you bring to the role. And I'm much more comfortable about that. But it's taken me a long time as mm -hmm. a leader to get here. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really important point. Thank you. Um, Carol, I just wondered if you had anything to add on this subject then of, of sort of either talking about your own mental health um, or others encouraging others to have that conversation before we finish um, off on this panel i think i think i would just say that um I, i'm just very encouraged from all that i've heard today and how it has improved tremendously over the period of time that i've been involved with the service um, and uh, uh, because i am very old and ancient and to go back a long long time and doddery it was not that way and it has not always been that open believe me and so i know that people today will be talking about issues that they do face still today and things that they battles they are still facing i think we should celebrate the fact that people do feel able to discuss this today and and what a brilliant magnificent thing this is and i'm really glad to see that this has happened so yeah i just i'm, I'm really chuffed that that's happened within my time of being here that people now feel able to stand up and say that within the service because that was not always the case it really wasn't so yeah just brilliant no, that's a good point thank you carol so is there anything else from the panel the on, on, of, on this before we sorry go on al yeah that's yeah yeah no i was just gonna say um like i think leadership and um the definitions of leadership and what's expected of leaders is like evolved quite a lot um i went on the uh the cast business school uh, legal advice sector leadership course um, a couple of years ago and the whole of the first day was spent on resilience and looking after yourself um, and I, I just thought that was really poignant because um, it's quite easy as a leader to um, put yourself last and think you have to sort everything else out um, and, and then you can look after yourself and actually if you don't um, you know look after yourself and uh, do the things that make you feel happy and well and have a good support network um, and all the other stuff um, that you need. You can't, you can't need, you've got to, you've got to do your work from a place of strength. Um, yeah, particularly like for all roles, but particularly for one which is quite isolated. Um, so yeah, look after ourselves. And then sometimes I will not look after myself and I think, well, what would I tell a member of the team if they were in uh, this situation today? And I actually got to work one morning in lockdown and pretty much had a panic attack. I just burst into tears. Um, and I was like, well, I would just tell them just take the day off. Like, I just have a duvet day, like just catch up on some sleep and I'll be fine. Um, and so I think, yeah, that helps me to look after myself, looking after others. Um, and I've just got one final thing, sorry, I've talked for a few minutes now, that I wanted to share, which um, is about something called a RAP, I don't know if people have heard of it, W-R-A-P, um, it's called the Wellness Recovery Action Plan. Um, and we had a member of the team that was off for a while um, with mental health, and so it's to help um, reintegrate back into work, and also what are their triggers and what can we look out for to support them, um, and so there's, there's just some really great resources for employers um, to look after staff um, that are there. And I knew about it and I'd never had to use it before. Um, and I used it then. And it was it was a really good way for, you know, structuring the conversation. So, uh, yeah, just search on the Internet for Wellness Recovery Action Plan and, and, see, and see what's there if you've got staff that are in that situation. 
I think that's great. Thank you, Al. And that, the wraps are obviously definitely a useful resource to, to reference. And it feels like a good time just to put up again um, to contact Mind or Samaritans. And they've got really good websites there if people are um, feeling they just need that extra bit of support um, right now. Um, Steph, Al, and Tracy, are there any last comments from, from you before we wrap up your, your session? Just to say thank you, everyone. Really useful. I hope people really sorry, we lost we lost your last bit again there. Sorry. Um, I just said I I personally found it very useful, and I hope people who've been uh, listening have, have also found it useful. Thanks. I agree. Thank you, Tracy. Yes, did I'm just echoing what Tracy said. Thank you. Um, and also to say, I'll share. Um, our team uses the user manuals as well, so um, I'm going to share a template, um, in the workplace um comment. So if you want to take it, change it, do whatever you like with it, um, bin it, whatever, um, it's there for mm -hmm. you. That's brilliant. Thank you, Steph. And Al, anything last from you? Oh, I've probably said enough on this one, but thank you. No, it's been really great to just chat, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. Excellent. Okay, well, we'll see you later, but thank you very much for another great panel. That's fab. See you later. Thanks thank again. You. See, you Bye. Bye. see you later. Bye. Thanks. Bye. I was just wondering what's up next, Jake. So we've got, um, I am waiting for, for, for Mick to join as well, but we'll be able to, so so Carol and Mick will be talking about disability in Korea, and this is about longer term disability, isn't it, Carol, but more severe yeah. um, disabilities, diagnosed disabilities, um, and, and how you manage that alongside your career. So that's what we're yeah. going to talk about from now. Yeah, we, we're going to have a look at maybe having um, for people who have long term disabilities, but also maybe if you have more than one disability. So maybe if you have, say, a physical disability alongside a mental health issue or something like that, or how you would plan for that and how you can develop a career within the service or within the voluntary sector in general. And, and I'd just like to say uh, none of this is a how to guide with any knowledge behind it. This is very just mix and I personal experience. So please don't take us as knowing anything really. This is just <laughs> how we manage to cobble it together by luck more than judgment. Yeah, no, yeah. and and cool. I would say again as as someone who's knows how, um, how, how, how challenging the disability rights community, which I love dearly, can be. This is just my view. So <laughs> again, you know, everybody's view is different and everybody um, has their own take on ways we deal with these things. So again, this is not the way of dealing with having a disability or a long-term condition or anything like that it's just our individual view on it and our take on it and we certainly yeah. aren't saying that this is how everybody or or the majority of people even with a disability or a different ability feel about this um okay so uh, go on al sorry you were gonna no, I was just wondering um, what your experience of um, this has been so far. Is it um, personal experience where you've worked with people who've um, had multiple? Because I think we've had a member of staff who um, I think they're, they're quite interrelated, aren't they, in physical and mental health? Um, and it's it can be quite complex. Yeah, so I have um, epilepsy and it's uncontrolled epilepsy. So I have regular seizures. And from that, I have um, brain injury or some not neurotypical. And I have various sides to that, which means that I am very good at some things and very, very, as, 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 as my husband put it, very, very stupid at some things. As he said that to a disability tribunal, he were asking me how I could possibly be a CEO and be disabled which was a lovely experience i think i was having at the time because um that was only about three years ago because you can't be disabled and a ceo according to your pip tribunal apparently 
which yeah shows you the society we live in these days but yeah um so it's things like uh i have people say they have no sense of direction but i really have no sense of direction so things like i would walk up to the wrong house and try and get in the wrong door i don't have any memory of what things like that look like um i have very bad spatial awareness i am when we go to things like conference and people go oh no the room you remember it's just up there and they didn't mean anything to me mm -hmm. so i'll frequently go and i'll miss meetings or end up in the wrong room or go yeah no i plan to be here yeah i'm very interested in the future of whatever this is on the thing and i always wanted <laughs> to learn about this you know on the thing and make it up very quickly well i'm on the spot and i frequently if i'm using public public transport will end up in completely the wrong place and completely the wrong location and yeah, it's just a bit of a nightmare really so <laughs> it's 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 interesting um obviously the seizures as well mean i i, I sometimes use a wheelchair which is a, a pushy one if I've damaged myself or something like that on the thing. And people's reaction to the seizures is perhaps the biggest problem. Because mm. people have association mm. when you have seizures that that means certain things mm. and everything. Mm. So for me, that would be my physical problems. And from that, you then have some mental health issues which come from that. So that would be my background and i've had that since i was a young teenager so i've created a career in the service from there so that's me basically thank you carol and we've got we've got mick now so thank you al for helping bridge us over this section and clearly you may well stay as long as you want um so, so Mick, um, Carol was just introducing herself to, to to the session. I just wanted if you wanted to do something similar, and then I'll let you two crack on. I'll stay in the background, but I'll let you two crack on with your panel. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I'm from uh, Mick from Luton, uh, and you know I've uh, had a disability for probably ooh, since I was 18, so a few years ago now. Uh, I was a boy chief exec, so I've had over 20 years now in a senior management role. Uh, and interestingly, you know, I've always tried to hide my disability early on. Uh, probably what Carol was talking about, you know, people's perceptions and, and how you think you hide it better than you do and then you don't. And then there's a point in your life where, you know, certainly for myself now using a powered wheelchair that you can't hide it at all. Yeah. And you know, part of me says it's other people's problems, but equally there is always a bit of pride in yourself about how you present, how you come across. Uh, and while it doesn't define me, I think my disability has, if I'm honest, kind of driven me on and made me the person I am today. Yeah, absolutely. You know, well, that certainly makes sense. Great. I'm going to leave you guys to it. It's a really interesting subject. I'm going to switch over to workplace to um, to listen more. See you soon. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you, Al. Thank you. Thank you, Al. I think that's a really interesting thing, Mick, you're talking about there. Because for me, in my early days as well, I did a lot of hiding it. And I did a lot of pretend or wanting to um, pretend to everybody it didn't exist and almost preemptive getting in there first so i used to have um a thing that i did for interviews where i would go through all the problems they thought they would be and i'd come up with solutions for all of them and how i was going to manage them all and how this was not going to be an issue and how everything was going to be absolutely fine and absolutely there would be no issue at all and everything would be solved and I would solve them all for them and I would be like the perfect employee because I felt like I had to be better than all the other candidates by a mile 
because otherwise, why would they make the choice of picking? It's interesting, isn't it? You know, it's that balance between, you know, you are the person you are and your experiences and getting the foot in the door, the cliche of proving who you are and what you can do. Uh, And you know what you can do. And hopefully we will have to sell ourselves interviews anyway. But equally having an opportunity and, and even a level playing field. And uh, I mean, I joined CA Luton three years ago and, you know, have been in the job market relatively recently. Um, I think every generation says it's quite challenging to get a job, isn't it? You know, if you think about your parents or grandparents just walked into jobs, even in my uh, delicate age years and years ago, uh, I would lose a job uh, when my employer found out about my disability uh, and I'd leave the same day. And it happened three times in two years. So it makes you, you learn resilience very quickly when, you, when you're 18, 19. Yeah. But, you know, um, certainly in more recent years, you know, trying to get a job, and, and I say three years ago, um, I found a, a hugely diverse uh, attitude to disability. Um, some people, I will say they know who they are, um, and they do, but... Um, you know, they said uh, I was too creative for them. Well, they're the ones hemorrhaging cash, not not me. So it's not my problem. And uh, you can easily look at people's accounts to see how they perform subsequently. And places you've been or where you've come from or uh, jobs you looked at. Uh, and they said no, and you didn't even pass the first hurdle. Uh, some claim to be user-led, which is about empowering disabled people. Uh, and that's a term that's misused quite a lot. And I did run a, a user-led organisation for 15 years, and developed it. So very passionate about peer-led, you know, organisations. And I think that will flow. But it is a bit of a misused word uh, and term. And certainly how, uh, you know, we, we can actually develop those ideas. So it's it's tough out there in the job market anyway. But I think having to prove the additional barriers uh, sometimes but then i can also remember the green card and and quota system which failed uh, abysmally going back in the 80s and if not before in the 70s and you hear about lots of quotas and things today about you know you should get your job on a merit i think only it's got to be the right way of doing it Uh, i I don't buy into quotas at all because that's tokenism uh, and that's not the way forward but yeah it's it's tough and I once had a young lad who had a severe disability and he he, he said uh, about his career and uh, I said, well, you've got to go away and get experience. He said, but I want your job. I said, but it doesn't happen overnight. You've got to get qualified, uh, you know, whatever you're doing and and, and experience is also hugely powerful. Uh, And uh, he had to go away and I said, come back in five years time. I still tell you no, but go away, get your experience and, and start your journey or you'll get there. I think it's a question about how quickly you can get on your journey, isn't it? You know, if you know what you want, it's just mapping out your career and hopefully uh, finding a way. You get a few breaks in life, don't you? I think we all look back. Someone has probably believed in us and gives you the opportunity. I know for me, it was 20 years ago, you know, moving into the voluntary sector for the first time. And, uh, you know, I've just become a qualified architect and yet moved into something completely different. So it's funny how life evolves, isn't it? Can I, can I just quickly interject if you don't mind? So John has just commented on YouTube just saying on the subject of disability, um, if we could just reduce the labels. So I've just reduced yours, Carol, um, yeah. as they rely on lip reading. So just couldn't mm. see the lips. But it was my fault because I added Mid North Yorkshire to your title. But, um, but yeah, I've just removed that now. So I'll keep an eye on that throughout the day. Okay. Sorry to interrupt the flow, though. No, no, that's fine. I was, I was just going to say, so my attitude, how I present the disability has definitely changed so I've managed um, several local citizens advice now and in the early days I was definitely um, more worried about it and more protective of it and um, here's a weird thing I felt I couldn't be ill so I felt that um, because people used to mistake illness for disability and that um, I would be poorly the entire time, that I would be 
you, you know, you use words like burden or stuff like that, that they would have to look after me or they would have to do things like that. So I was so determined to do that that I never had days off. I never took any time off. So if I had a seizure, I'd still go in, I would do whatever I would work those things there. And again, that's about proving, over proving how much you can do and how ready you are to do things. And I've got a lot better at that. But over the years as well, I also have come to prefer trusty boards, funders, people I work with who are very honest about the concerns and the fears they have about my disability or my health, whatever type that might be, than those who on the surface appear to be okay about it, but just really are scared or don't want to be politically incorrect or thinking and have those prejudices inside and make assumptions that they're not asking me about because they're much harder to challenge. Whereas I, I, I won't say which citizen's advice it was, but one citizen's advice I worked for, the chair there went, well, you're not going to be able to do the job, are you? Because you're disabled. And that was, you know, terrible in the interview and the relationship manager from Citizens Advice nearly had a breakdown because he thought I was going to sue them for discrimination and everything like that. But it was brilliant because I could go, you're completely and utterly wrong and this is why, you know. And we had a conversation about it, whereas it wasn't being the only one sitting around that table thinking that. I was going to say, do you feel that you've you've changed their attitude and conversations now easier to have for everybody? I think I've changed their attitude for me. I get that. That's <laughs> that's the big question, isn't it? Is I then have to be a mentor for other people, and that's what I try and do within mm. my organisations. Is well, are you? But I have a hypothesis here. Uh, and yeah. let, me test, let me test it and see what you think. Are, are you a chief exec with a disability or a disabled person who happens to be a chief exec? So there's a blue touch paper being lit. My, from my perspective, I'm a chief exec who happens to have a disability because I'm paid to be a chief exec and I'm appraised on my performance as a chief exec. Yes, you can make allowances. Uh, and anybody who says Monday mornings are easy, I, I don't think it's telling the truth. I find Monday mornings a killer like anybody else probably, you know, to get out of bed and go go to work, wherever work is. You know, so uh, the fact that you, you don't skip to work and, you know, it's work sometimes is work, isn't it? I, I probably think that my disability is, 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 is a really important part of who I am. And I find it very hard to separate that from all parts of me. So that's a massive part of my identity. Um, I think because of me becoming disabled about the age of 13 and that being associated with puberty and growing up and developing a sense of identity and everything surrounding that and all of that stuff there and me and me becoming associated with the disability rights movement and everything associated and stuff like that so I would I would think that and we're probably getting into sort of like um what people might consider be to be semantics here but it's it's not semantics it's, it's fundamental to if you go back to the disability rights movement, which, which me and Mick probably are of generation where this was a very fundamental, important question back back then. I do agree with what you're saying. And, and from a work perspective, yes, I am CEO with a disability. But I would probably sometimes I might vary the other way. <laughs> no, there's no right or wrong. It's interesting. No. Which, yeah. which we see ourselves, let alone yeah. other people. 
yeah. to see us. I, I think that part of my role is to make it easier for other people from with a disability or, or differently abled, whatever you want to say, to join the service and to move forward in the service. And if, yeah. if I'm not doing that, that's a bit of a failure on my part. It should be easier for people who work for me than it was for me. Well, I think every generation, and I, I was thinking of, uh, you know, the, the, the guys who, the, the notion is that they tunneled out of residential care homes, not quite, yeah. but it's a nice image. You know, wheelchair users in, in the 70s and 80s to create uh, direct payments. Yeah. And that, that fight for independence. And, and there's still one or two of them still around today. It's a generation ago now plus. But they were really pioneers at the time, groundbreaking, to say, I want choice and control over things that are important to me and, and how I am perceived. And, yeah. and that's no different whatever your disability is. And yet we still rank disabilities, I find, sometimes. Yes. You know, disabilities you can see and understand or you think you understand is one thing uh but invisible disabilities which is one of the, the the main topics of today you know people get scared about what they can't either understand or see i guess and you know my, my disability is very tangible very visible uh people ask me why i'm in a wheelchair and if i'm feeling rather naughty and mischievous i will say well do you know what because I ask too many questions. So I draw them in and say, because I keep asking questions, does it matter why or how does it change the person you are? Uh, and my take on it is no. Uh, and you don't interrogate people's life history when you want to get a book stamped or swiped in the library, as they do these days. You know, so, you know, to be interrogated about your disability is unnecessary. It, 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 it's a funny one because people want to be interested. People are very keen to ask you and it's it's not always the best question. But, yeah, I know. it's. Uh, yeah. I always say that I manage to do most of my buttons myself, but not all of them. Can you just can you do a few of them at the front? I can't quite do them. You know. I mean, so be careful what you ask for. Yeah. I mean, because I, I, I – see, I swing because – if I have a seizure and I've hurt myself, I have a wheelchair that I use, but I never use it full time. And so I am i don't get that very much. But when I'm in my wheelchair, then all of a sudden I'm treated very differently to how I'm treated when I'm not in it. And the occasions I've gone to work in my wheelchair, people freak and treat me in a completely different way to how they would normally but i've not changed i'm not any different as an individual or a person but they absolutely treat me in a very different way talk to me in a different way you know will, will avoid talking to me about things at all and and, and it becomes very you know immediate illustration of the fear of disability and that fear that it causes, you know. But the, the, people have never seen that aspect of me or anything like that. They will say the most wonderful thing, which is, you're not really disabled, are you? You're just poorly, aren't you? Or, or, or you've you just know. got a condition because, um, they think that's the thing that I would like to hear. They think that's the nicest thing they can say to me is that I'm not disabled because I'm not really disabled because I can't be because I've got a job and I do things. And... I think it's when, when you tell people you drive or you're, you're professionally qualified or you, you're the chief exec, people go, really? Uh, and I still get it today that people are surprised that I drive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I have carers in the morning, 
to help me and what have you. And yeah, you know, it's a challenge at times, but you, for me to function, that's what I need. And then I take over and the rest of the day is mine. Yeah. But you know, it, it's there is even within care, you know, which is a very topical issue. There are still attitudes. And I think the attitudinal side of it is probably the hardest. That's what you're probably describing as well, which still surprises all of us today, doesn't it? Can yeah. There's some questions about it. Is that okay? So we've, we've got what are our points. So we've got one from Ross saying, on the point of ranking disability, it's not helpful that the DWP does rank disability. And I wonder what role that plays in the workplace when we look at disability. Just wondered if either of you had any observations on that. Um, I think so. And I think that a lot of support for people around disability in the workplace is focused around certain support for certain aspects of disability in certain low level, just immediately getting people in there. And it's not um, access to work. I mean, I could go on for mm years about access to work let's let's not get us started on because i'm sure Mick and me about access to work could be there for a year on I've access only got, to work. only got 12 hours so. yeah <laughs> yeah about access to work but the the support that is the reef the reform of access to work and the support about people with long-term disability and mental health the support for people with severe long-term conditions mental health conditions that's needed um we employ several people who have very severe mental health issues in our workforce um and we need long-term support for them they require long-term support and it isn't there mm and the crisis team support isn't adequate and um maintaining people in work is one of the we know this is a really positive thing and we know how the value they can bring to the work place and our client experience and everybody's experience but without the support it's not going to happen it really isn't so it annoys me i get quite annoyed as people can probably tell about this but You're passionate is a better word yes. <laughs> just want to yeah. bring anna's comment just before i bring you in Mick, as well so anna's saying um, because i can only work 15 hours or fewer i apply for any jobs i would like doing which are under 16 hours i get told you're overqualified for this presumably because i have the degree so again i'm assuming this is another barrier into the workplace for people with disabilities uh, yeah unfortunately it's the attitude i mean it, it is i mean it's discrimination as well and of course in employment i think we all know discrimination is rife proving you weren't the best candidate whoever you are it is so difficult but you know i always feel like going undercover but the trouble is you you get known locally sometimes and you know mystery shopper for employment i think is an opportunity you know uh, uh to sort of explore that further because you know you can work under a false name and, and even when you present you know the attitude as i touched on you know it never ceases to amaze part of, part of me relishes that opportunity to challenge people but at the end of the day you still want to work and and some people you need to work and relying on benefits isn't necessarily for, for everybody no. you know uh, and I think, you know, contributing part time, you know, to be overqualified, where else would you be told that you wouldn't? So yeah. there is a question of, of is that really discrimination? And I think the answer is yes. There's a, I think you've got to go for the right jobs. Uh, I understand that. Uh, and, and some jobs I felt I should have got at least an interview for, nowhere near. Uh, and then you see who got the job and you think, user led, really? You know, and, and time tells you know the truth always comes out and things evolve and you know that sort of thing and i think you know you hear about people applying for hundreds of jobs choosing who you want to work for you know we're motivated by money i think if we're all honest there's always that factor how many noughts on the end of a job but also the type of employer uh, and their attitude 
Uh, and I think how in an interview we can test them as well to say, you know, what is their approach to flexible working and, and better conditions for everybody? Uh, and, and it's interesting, sorry, I was going to say that, you know, staff with mental health issues, I mean, we, we have people who have experience of mental health who we didn't know when we uh, employed them. And things manifest and, you know, they've been able to express their, their feelings and, and emotions and we can support them. And I think flexible working and being a good employer is a way forward. And can, can I just, I just want to read one more comment that we've just had, but I can't bring it up because it's, it's too long on the screen. But I would like to, if we could talk about some of that as well, about what can we then do to, you know, help people in, in our workplaces, etc. So Paul has asked, um, I'd be interested to hear if Mick and Carol have experienced the overly positive, your inspirational attitude when people learn about their disability and level of experience, and if so, how they feel about this. Well, from my perspective, if they want to roll a red carpet out for me, knock yourself out. You know, uh, the, the, the better the, the, the pile, the better. You know, the shag pile, I'm all for that, you know. But some people, I find it generational, I'll be honest. Okay. Uh, so in theory, it will disappear as society moves on. But yeah, I mean, you do get that gushing side of things occasionally. Uh, it, it doesn't particularly wash with me because I am who I am. I come from a children's home anyway, and just the opportunities and you make your own opportunities, but you need a break as well. Uh, and I think if I was to write a book, it would be entitled something like So Far So Interesting, you know, but who knows what, what tomorrow will bring, you know, and it is about our journeys. Uh, I knew I wanted to be an architect at the age of nine or 10, and it then took me 10 years part time study, you know, uh, uh, you know, at Leicester to, to get qualified. So I went the long way around. I left school with two O levels, so I date myself at doing O levels. If you want to say you're young, say you did GCSEs, and it immediately takes 10, 20 years off your age. <laughs> so, um, but I did O levels. I left with two O levels at school, which isn't a huge. I had a great time at school, but not academically. Um, and you could argue that didn't really help myself. Didn't do A levels. Uh, and then had to do, sort of get cracking once you leave school and went to college and you build up and it takes a long time. But I never knew, lost track of what I wanted to be. That wasn't the chief executive of a charity, but it evolved very quickly and I took the opportunity there and then. I kept my career as an architect going for 10 years in parallel to being a charity chief exec. So I was able to do two jobs at once because I enjoyed it. But uh, yes, it, it's, I think knowing, I was very lucky, I knew what I wanted to do, uh, and then proceeded to uh, not find the easiest route to achieve it. So, you know, school careers and things, you have to make your own furrow in life, I think. That's very helpful. Thank you, Mick. And Carol? Um, well, those of you who know me know my horrible personality and ability to talk rubbish all the time, sort of put people off being overly impressed by any of the other bits. So it never really happens that much, really, to be honest with you. Um, I think there is something about that. If you have a disability and other problems with the mental health and stuff like that on top of that, you, you do develop a shell. You do develop a thing where you have to be a bit extra tough. You, so if I have a seizure in the street or something like that, people will sometimes feel me. And people will do stuff and things like that that isn't very nice when I'm having a seizure and things like that. And to deal with things like that, you have to be quite tough. And people will have said stuff to Mick and um, he will not have had a life where everybody's been kind and nice all the time and everything like that. So you do need to develop quite a tough shell. And that doesn't always mean that when people are trying to be nice 
and lovely to you. You're designed to accept that that much because you're set up to deal with the world where you have to be able to cope with it giving you quite a lot of knocks all the time. You try your best not to turn into a not very nice human being. You try your best to keep nice yourself and that's about all you can hope for and do, I think. But you do become quite hardened sometimes to things like that and, and you need to develop those layers of protection around how people sometimes can behave and be towards you. So I think that's it. Um, you you want us to move on to talk about something else, Jake, you said? Just, just around the practicalities then of what can we do to support? I think there's been some comments there, hasn't there, from, from Anna and others mm. around the barriers and just, just both yeah. the experiences on managing this and also supporting others. I think, I think. Sorry, I'm going to say. No. I think. I think it's important that we get conversations going. Uh, I think employers shouldn't be frightened of discussing disability openly with employees. If an employee can set the agenda, that's even better. So, because disability can manifest during employment, so a non-disabled person can then become disabled, uh, uh, and that's a challenge you know but they've got years of experience and if they're a key part of the team you know how can you support them uh, that flexible working uh, yes physical adaptations it's interesting that a lot of as an architect i know that a lot of the work the built environment does focuses on wheelchairs uh, and that can be misleading at times for compliance you know but i, I still say my profession gets it badly wrong in the 21st century designing buildings there's a what i would call compliance as opposed to inclusive design you can tick the boxes and be allowed to build things that there's no way inclusive at all so you know my challenge to anybody would be what can you do uh, some people will say it's very cheap to make alterations some are some aren't but funding is available uh, and it shouldn't stop the greater public access for older people, parents and push chairs into public buildings and how that works. Well, that legislation has been around since the 90s. And yet we still speak as though it's brand new sometimes, being able to go in and out of buildings. And, you know, I, I have a, a an interesting test that I use, uh, sometimes slightly controversially, but if someone with a disability is denied a service, it's just bad luck. But if someone, if it was gender related or, or race related, there would be outcry and yet disability in its widest forms either accepts secondary or mediocre service and doesn't complain as much as it should, individuals should. Or do we rank, you know, equality strands in different ways? Uh, and I think, you know, if, if I'm denied access on a bus or a train, which can happen, you know, uh, but if that if a female was denied access onto a bus, they'd rightly be outraged. If someone who was a person of colour was denied access onto a bus, they, you know, this is America in the 60s. It would just be civil rights would, would just kick off, understandably, as it is now. And I just wonder if disability as a movement is missing a trick at the moment in terms of on the back of not just black lives matters but that whole movement campaign uh, of gaining momentum about people's rights and, and, and independence yeah I, I, I think there's definitely something to be said about that and i think that we focus on for example looking when we're looking at pip and when we're looking at people's experience in tribunals and in medicals, I, I was talking to someone not so long ago who was saying, well, you're putting in a complaint letter. Why aren't you encouraging people to sue them for discrimination in that interview if they've been treated like that? Why aren't you encouraging that client to take them to court? if they've been treated like that, because that's illegal. 
to speak to someone like that under the legislation. And I think we need to maybe look at ourselves as an organisation and say, I know it's hard, I know demand is high, I know our resources are stretched, but are we helping clients, helping ourselves to look at these, particularly in mental health, does do people experience discrimination in mental health? Is there a solution to that? that is legal and should the role of the Citizens Advice Bureau be to support that? And if we're doing that, would we see that more and those solutions coming more if we supported more of our workforce, more of our volunteers to express those experiences within our organisation? And I think on average, 40% of our clients have some form of disability as well. Yeah. That's 40% across the entire network. Uh, which is tens of thousands of people, isn't it? There's a cohort, a body of people there needing support and representation. That pulling together, there's lots of initiatives, but I think, you know, the power of pulling it together nationwide could be really powerful. Yeah, and I, and, and I do think that for the first time in a long time, we may be looking as a service at the needs of people experiencing PIP and ESA and stuff like that. And I'm I'm hopeful, she says, that we might be starting to take that seriously now as a service. So that would be great going forward. Um, mm. I think for employees and people who work with us, I would say that we need to put more demands on access to justice. <laughs> um, they won't change in what they deliver and what they do unless unless we scream and shout at them that they need to. And I know that's really hard, but you won't provide services to people with mental health. Why not? I'm ringing you up and I'm asking you to. I'm going to demand you do an assessment. I'm going to demand you do this now. You say you're not going to provide this because you don't know why well, I'm going to ask you to anyway. And then I'm going to write to my MP and say, why, why aren't you? You want to get people into work? You want to? You know, you say you're going to have these things, you're worried about people being on job seekers allowance and everything. I'm going to demand that you do this. I think that we need to start trying to, we, we became so kind of disillusioned with these services and being turned away from these services. It's hard and it's tiring to have to phone the crisis team yet again, have to try and get turned away from these services yet again. But if we stop doing it, I get the feeling that's exactly what people want. But if we don't show there's a demand, if we don't show there's a need, then there will never be any improvement. Well, I think one of, one of the questions I had is for today is... is a, how effective do we think mental health services truly are? You know, the statutory provision, uh, because there are lots of challenges, I get that, and it's not easy. But, I mean, certainly I've seen experiences where, you know, people are waiting, you know, six weeks, eight weeks to get an emergency appointment. And that yeah. crisis is now not in, in eight weeks' time. And we hear these anecdotes and different evidence, but, you know, how can we build on that? And then when I hear they're investing again in the NHS, is that investing in more of the same rather than being creative and looking at different innovative ways of working? And, and, and comes back to peer-led and peer support. There are lots of initiatives at small scale. What's the most effective way you know, to support people? I know that we're using some of our funding to pay mind to come and deliver counselling services in one of our areas because otherwise there's no counselling there mm. and that's one of our things in rural North Yorkshire because they got their funding cut from things to do it and otherwise none of our debt clients will stay in their debt programs for mental health issues and we are in a situation where we have conversations with our crisis team that go we 
think they are going to kill themselves and the crisis team go, how sure are you? Because we're only coming out if you're really, really, really sure. Really, really sure. Yeah. And then they're going, and even then it's probably going to take like 24 hours. So, sure. And it's just ridiculous. It's to the point of ridiculousness. But there are so few, because I work in um, rural North Yorkshire, there are so many, so few face walk in access services around where we are that this is where people come. And so that's why we have so many safeguarding. That's where you have so many things. But <laughs> it's, really uh, it's really important. It's really important points. And I've just got another question from, from Nick, but I do think part of the reason I wanted to bring Sarah in, which obviously we spoke to our panel around for, is that, you know, I've noticed over the last five years or so, particularly on obviously the mental health point, that there seems to be this view now that because we're all open about it or, or perceived to all be open about it, that everything else just fits into place. And obviously that isn't the case, is it? So the services aren't there. There are many areas that don't even have the lower level, entry level support, like, as you say, a mind organisation that can support people. Um, so it's really, really challenging. A question from, from Nick, who I think is nearby to you, isn't he, Carol? Um, do you think the current working environment that we are faced with, with more people working from home, is ad advantageous or disadvantage disadvantageous for employees with mental health or disability slash mobility issues? Uh, what can we do to support our staff to cope with working from home? Um, I'm, I'm going to say for my personal workforce, it's been disadvantageous um, with the mix of disabilities we've had because we have mainly mental health, autism, Asperger's, various different types of disability and even people who we have physical disabilities. The problem is their work stations and stuff like that from home are not set up in the right way and 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 and, and as good as way as we had at work to be able to facilitate them but but the people who have who who were on the spectrum who have things like that, that have found it incredibly stressful so we kept one of our offices open throughout the entire thing which we basically put into lockdown to let a couple of people who would have found it extremely terrifying to still go into work every day to work in separate rooms because they wouldn't have coped with that change of routine and not doing that thing and that's a judgment call we made right or wrong you know I'll get hung for making whatever call that was later on, but never mind. Um, but overall, we've had, I've got, don't get me wrong, I've got one or two people who it's been really good for, but overall, mental health wise, not been good. Not on that balance. Now, that's not to say that. I don't think that working from home can have a positive effect for some people if they have the choice. It's about choice. This wasn't choice. And that's the important thing. Um, it's about control and choice for people. This felt that people were being forced into it and they couldn't have that sense of empowerment or anything like that. I think that it, in the future, the lessons we've learned from this and the ability to give people the option to work from home will empower lots of people to be able to do jobs they wouldn't have been able to do for us going forward. So I feel the opportunity will be there for more people with disabilities um, in the future. That would be brilliant. But for this group of people that I have at the moment, it's not been great. Yeah, I, I think it's mixed. Uh, uh, it, it does depend on people's needs and... I think I think we're we're creating other issues if we're not careful. 
you know, we, we're seeing things manifest that we didn't uh, expect uh, and how we support some people and it works and others, you know, even with support, it's still not the, the right environment for them. So I think, you know, we hear the word blended all the time now. And I think a blended approach to give people choice is the way forward. It's got to suit the needs of the service. I get that. Uh, and I think, you know, how can we move that forward quickly in a supportive way? I mean, we've tried all the different ideas that we've seen on the network from the virtual coffee mornings and, and the, the group chats and, and WhatsApp chit chats have been, you know, had to separate them out because some have got sort of lots of traffic on it and some have got supervision traffic on it and all the different things that crop along. It's fascinating to watch that evolve as a way of communicating. And I'm based downstairs and a lot of the team are upstairs when we return to the office. But I think I'll have a live link with upstairs going forward so we can feel a real time, all the time link, if that makes sense, with upstairs where all the action happens. So, I mean, there are physical challenges, but I think we've seen emotional challenges arise we didn't expect. And I think that comes back to flexible working. Uh, I think understanding your workforce, having that conversation uh, and not you know, being able to reach out. And we've had good support from National on, on the big white wall that has been hugely effective, I think. I've had some uh, amazing feedback on that, that it's the right, format you know getting the right vehicle to support your style we can only do so much we're not experts in everything and i think we recognize that we have to involve other people our, our local minds are great sources of opportunity as well to what our sector as you touched on carol so i think yes it, it's all those people we know and just remind ourselves who our partners are and who can work with you know in this time going forward so there are opportunities to work closer. And I think, you know, to me, one of the successes going forward could be that we'll have new partnerships. Mm. We didn't we didn't know existed a few months ago. You know, so that would be a, an indicator, I think, of success going forward, hopefully. I think that's great. Thank you. And we've got a comment from Ross just saying, working from home has certainly empowered me. I'm totally anxious around people face to face. And that's related with my diagnosis so if it goes back to your point carol about you know for some people absolutely will make sense but i do think the choice is is something that is really 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 important i suppose an, imp an interesting point there it, it can remove physical barriers but it shouldn't be at the cost of isolating anybody yeah uh, and i think you know some employers may say that's a way of isolating you know of removing barriers which is true but it shouldn't be at exclusively to, to, to remove other social contact. We know the social contact in the office, the chit chat, the, you know, the discipline of the office is, is you know, making that cup of tea as well and, and just the, the natural social exchange with people as well. There are lots of things that can, and people are missing that, that people contact. I mean, I, I would just say I've, been in contact with a couple of people who have been going through a d d ice, proper isolation for the last few months and that's been really hard on some people who live on their own and have had to isolate you know for the last and so it does depend on the situation mm. you're in I think so yeah it's 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 like i said at the beginning of this this is not a saying at all this is what everybody's experience should be this is very much an individual thing you know this is what we've experienced but it's it's going to be very very different for every single person isn't it and i think you know offices now are looking at different ways of working so why not go for a blended approach flexible yeah. working um there will be some reasons why you can't sometimes but equally you know i, I think uh, employers you know fitting people into smaller offices reduced overheads more investment in frontline you know there should be more opportunities you know and having big offices that, that fixed overheads you know is not the way forward necessarily you know so having you hear about having shifts of staff coming in on one day and 
a different group of people in another day. You know, you still got to bring them together at different times as well. The the one big shout out I, I I would like to do as well before this ends, looking at the time and things, is to say that as a service, we we do need to get better on our deaf advice provision as well, because that's something that we I know that we have some bureau who do brilliant work in that area and things like that, but we feel as a service we still haven't cracked that and that's something that we're looking at going forward in an area that we think we could do a lot better at something that we're trying to do so my my team i'm going to be selfish now they're in the top five in the country so you know see you see it's almost as if i knew that mick (laughs) well we're not allowed to publicize it oops but um (laughs) it's you know, Luton has specific challenges. It's like an inner city, you know, uh, and has those challenges. It's not in lockdown. That's important. Uh, people think we're in, <coughs> excuse me, lockdown at the moment, and that's not the case. It's just special intervention and measure at the moment. So, you know, but when I think we all know there are challenges going forward, and <clears throat> I think the issue about uh, we touched on debt uh, and mental health, you know, there is a, a fascinating juxtapose there of, you know, does mental health cre- cause debt or does debt cause mental health? And the answer is yes and yes, unfortunately. You know, and we see both sides of that equation. Uh, and I think you're working smarter around debt it is a way forward, n- not just to, to manage the situation here and now, but, you know, in terms of prevention and financial planning and, and, and you know, the whole financial capability side of things. There's a missing provision uh, throughout the country, I think, on, on, on financial capability. Uh, and that's, you know, to call it prevention, if you like, that's to me the forerunner of preventing debt is better financial capability. Uh, and I think we've seen it eroded over the years. Uh, and yet debt is spiraling in the wrong direction. So it is a huge concern. And you know, we have to monitor turnaway rates because that's the severity of it. And it's astronomic in Luton. It's a real challenge. Thank you. Thanks, mate. I'm just going to bring um, Tracy and Kate into the to the screen now as well, just obviously to do our crossover. But I just wanted if both of you, hi, Kate, hi, Tracy. I wanted if both of you. How are you doing? Yeah, very good. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted if either of you, Mick and Carol, had any sort of last take home. Um, comments that you wanted to share in the last five minutes? I think just um, the fact that it has got better, it continues to get better, um, it will get better, there hopefully will be more people at national conferences, at CEO forums who are um have experiences similar to mick and me and you jake going forward and we hopefully will see more of that as time goes on yeah i I think the key thing is um uh, i'm going to big myself up now for two seconds when i got my honorary doctorate i had to to receive you know make a a, a, some announcements and and a speech to receive it Uh, and i said it's about telling your own story and being proud of who you are uh, and sort of expressing your thoughts and views in, in a constructive way uh, and inspiring you know current people around you as well as the next generation and i think how with all our different challenges you know we move together as one uh, and we often hear about you know networks being families and, and I, I certainly feel you know the love of the network the love of the family is very powerful uh, and I think we can move together as one, you know, stronger together. A phrase I think we hear a lot it is very true. It's a really good point. Thank you both. And Caroline on where place is saying thank you, Caroline Mick, for sharing your personal experiences. A really valuable session, and we definitely will mm-hmm. all agree with that. I think it's been really useful. Obviously, it just it's been important to have those different panels to hear those different voices, experiences, and topics throughout the day. Um, so that's great. We have got a. About two more minutes though so or you can still fill your time I 
This is the first time you've ever seen me lost for words in my uh, life. Or maybe Kate or Tracy, if you've got any observations, because I know you've been listening to a little bit of that throughout the hour, <laughs> whether you had any observations on on the last hour session. I only came in close to the end, but I think um, the the honesty and frankness that you have all spoken with, uh, which I think has been throughout uh, what I've seen dipping in and out of the, this morning. Um, yeah, just just everybody's being very upfront about things, personal experiences and coping strategies and supporting as leaders. And yeah, I just feel it's a, it feels like a bit of a breakthrough in, in some ways. Thanks. I, th I think that's quite important that, you know, we build on this, isn't it? Yes. I think there's some, some ideas, initiatives, uh, and, and we, I think it's got to be nationally as a network, build on this, you know, uh, together not just leaders but you know that we're we're at grassroots as well because we, we then you know again one of my litmus tests is uh, as a, in my office i can then look at you know interoception and i can see 100 people queuing prior to lockdown uh, <laughs> whatever i think it's got to work for them it's got to work for citizens the people we support so are we doing all the right things as much as we can and i think you know, social care is an opportunity that nationally we need to look at how we can work stronger and, and, and closer within the social care sector market. I recognise that as an opportunity for, from previous reincarnation I had, you know, it, within the sector. So I think there's an opportunity there for a sector that will probably have to change immensely. Yeah. Thinking of where social care is today, it's got to change immensely. So there's the opportunity to support all of our individual clients. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And I'd just like to say a big thank you to Jake and everybody else who's helped out for today. Because Definitely. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Well, thank you both very much for attending. And please do check Workplace because there's a lot of um, wonderful comments for you both. So you can check in on that afterwards. Um, but that's great. So thank you both for um, taking part. Uh, and as I said, it's been a really useful panel. Um, and as Mick says, we... We will be coming back, well, we're staying obviously till nine, but we will be coming back to that subject at about half eight, eight o'clock around what is next, what are we going to do next? So I encourage people to come back at that point so that we can have that conversation, really. Look forward, look forward to it. That's great. Thank you. Good to see you all. Bye. Bye. So, so we move on now to um, our mindfulness hour. Um, and I am going to come off the screen at this point because I need to stretch, I need to grab the Jaffa cake again or whatever. Um, so I think, Tracy, we're starting with you, aren't we, with breathing? So what I'll do is I'll bring Kate off the screen and me off the screen and, and leave you on. And I'll ask her off my headphones and I'll rush back. So if you give me a, a minute's notice that you've finished breathing or whatever, I'll be able to bring um, Kate up onto the screen as well. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I think to introduce this session, we're just going to um, sort of switch down a bit of a gear here and... Um, take our awareness away from um, everybody else and what's been happening online and just bring our awareness back to us as individuals. Um, this is a technique that um, I've used for quite a few years and I think anybody who's ever suffered panic attacks or anxiety can relate to the fact that uh, we all take breathing for granted until you realise you can't breathe. Uh, and then actually what you need to do is you need to be able to slow down your heart rate and actually concentrate on your breathing. Um, so I just wanted to, to use this really as a way of relaxing and introducing um, a slight shift in gear in terms of us moving into a more mindfulness um, space. So first of all, I mean, you really need to be comfortable to do this. So sitting comfortably um, and, and feeling like, you know, you've got no restrictions um, some people prefer to stand to do this because the diaphragm is expanded, um, but it doesn't really make any difference. You can sit or you can stand. It's entirely up to you as long as you feel comfortable. So if you just switch your awareness now to your breathing. So if you just think about breathing in. And breathing out. And if you try and breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, just a normal breathing pattern, whatever feels comfortable to you. 
You might feel better if you close your eyes, but it's up to you. But if you can just breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Now, if you can try and elongate your out breath, in through your nose, out through your mouth. This is a technique that's used in Pilates. So some of you might be familiar with it. And Joseph Pilates described it as relieving your body of every last bit of impure breath. So in through your nose and breathe out as long as you can through your mouth. I'm just going to give you a little bit of time to just do three or four long exhales. So really pushing all that air out of your lungs. Breathing out, stopping and then breathing out that last little bit of air until all the air is out of your lungs and then taking a deep inhale and filling your lungs again. Now while you're doing that, don't remove the awareness from your breathing. Try and keep your focus on your breathing, but also try and move your shoulders away from your ears. So pull your shoulder blades down your back, away from your ears. When we tense up, we tend to hunch up. And sometimes you're not even aware that you're doing it. So another thing that you can do, especially when you're sitting and working, is be aware of where your shoulders are and try and remove your shoulders from in that hunch position to pull them away, pull them down. Almost like there's a weight pushing down on your shoulders, pulling them away from your ears and keep breathing. Just settle back into a normal breathing pattern now. Try and keep your shoulders down and just keep breathing. I'm just going to give you a minute now before Jake and Kate return, just to be aware of your breathing and your shoulders, removing the tension from your neck. And breathing. And what this should have done, if you participated in it, it should have lowered your heart rate, made you feel more relaxed. And it's something that you can use at any point. It's, it's a very easy technique. Um, I think it's something that I've probably used at various different times in my life. I've used it before I go into things like this where I'm facing people and speaking to them, especially face to face, um, which is very helpful in that. It's also very helpful <clears throat> if you tend to tense up and are not aware of how tense your body is throughout the day. Sometimes in the evening, it just helps you relax. So I hope that's been useful. I hope Jake's managed to grab a bite to eat and, uh, is on his way back, um, and Kate as well. Are you there, Jake? <laughs> I 
I think we've lost Jake. He has been, I think, on this since nine o'clock this morning, so maybe it's understandable that he needs a break. I think um, what I'll do is I'll just sort of introduce you to um, some of the things around mindfulness that um, that you're probably very familiar with. I think there's been so much talk about mindfulness over the last few years. Um, and I think sometimes people can be quite cynical about it and think maybe it's not for them. Um, one of the things that I've certainly taken away from um, any training that I've done and I've watched things on YouTube and, and I've, I've um, done a range of, of different um, things that kind of build themselves as mindfulness or about um, finding a calm space and those kind of things. One of the, the, the techniques that, that I use that I often share with people and, and it's something that you can share with young people, um, especially in this day and age of kind of being bombarded with different information all of the time we can all feel quite overwhelmed by information we can also sometimes feel and I think certainly younger generations through social media maybe feel um sometimes like they're kind of in the spotlight or being criticized or their life is out there for everybody to see uh, and there's a quite a nice little technique that that um I discovered many years ago it was actually when I was doing my um, degree in psychology it was one of the lecturers shared this with me and it's about protecting yourself and I suppose it's a little bit about resilience as well so it's about kind of um, making sure that you are not subjected to all the outside influences that could affect how you feel uh, and the way you um, kind of think about yourself and I think we're all um, quite conscious of that how others see us and how we feel about ourselves and one of these techniques that, that, that I was given was you have a little tune that, that is your tune. And when you hum it, you imagine a bell jar just falling very slowly around you. And if you can kind of master this technique and, and, and do this, what that bell jar does then, it acts as your protection. Uh, and like I said, I've done this for many years. Uh, and there's uh, you might be able to relate to this, but there's certain people that I really need to use my bell jar with because there's a lot of negativity around um, and it kind of protects me from that a little bit. There's also maybe certain situations where I feel that I just, again, need that protection. So I might be feeling a little bit vulnerable and I just want to be protected a bit from the outside world. So what I do is I just have a tune. It's mine. Nobody else knows it. Um, and when when I hear that tune in my head, my bell jar comes down and it protects me. Uh, and I find that actually really works for me. So I just wanted to share that with you whilst I was completely dying, Jake, waiting for you <laughs> to, to let Kate come back oh, in. Okay. But... I've just blamed the kettle. The kettle was taking a little bit too long. to. <laughs> it's fine. I said you've been here since nine o'clock, so I think you can have a break. <laughs> so that's great. Thank you. So what's the plan now? Is Kate, are you taking over this rest of this yeah. month? So, uh, yeah. That's great. Again, Tracy, there's some good comments there on, on WordPress about that being helpful. So thank you. Yeah. Right. So. Okay, yeah. so I'll leave you to it then. Okay, bye bye. Thanks so much, Tracy. That was amazing. Screen if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's just me. Um, I should have said it more when she was here, but that session with Tracy was amazing. I think um it shows how effective um the power of breath can be. Um, and that's kind of at the heart of a lot of mindfulness stuff. So yeah, for the next 50 minutes, I can't do maths, 50 minutes, um, I'm gonna be chatting a bit about um, mindfulness as a concept, going into a bit about um, kind of the history of it, yes, or kind of the um, science behind it, um, talking about kind of my experiences of mindfulness and hopefully if people have questions or thoughts or comments, please post them um because then I can respond to them and that makes it easier than me having to talk for uh an extended period of time. Sorry, I um, just uh, I don't want to take a drink, so I'll I'll keep coming back in there when I was Jay, you can take a break. Honestly, I feel like you've been like a little workhorse. It's fine. Don't worry. 
bless him. <laughs> He's been here since 9 a.m. Um, so two things to say up top is one, I am not a doctor, a psychiatrist, therapist or counsellor. So this is just my personal experience of um, mindfulness. Obviously, none of this is medical advice. The second thing is I have um, another screen up with notes. So when I'm darting away to look, I'm looking at my notes, not just being shifty. So yeah, I'm going to talk about mindfulness, what it is as a concept, how it can be used, and my own personal kind of journey with it, which I hopefully will be useful or a starting point for some people to kind of maybe go on their own journey. There's a comment from Alan Bromyard says, eating Jaffa cakes, which I just really respect. I think as a reference to Jake being off camera, but it, it all, Alan, if you're just eating Jaffa cakes, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Okay, um, so starting off with mindfulness, how would we define it? And I've got a quote here, which comes from Professor Mark Williams, who was the former director of the Oxford Mindfulness Centre. He says, mindfulness means knowing directly what is going on inside and outside ourselves moment by moment. Mindful also, mindfulness also allows us to become more aware of the stream of thoughts and feelings that we experience. And it, by doing this, we can see how we can become entangled in that stream in ways that are not helpful. And he goes on to say, mindfulness lets us stand back from our thoughts and start to see their patterns. Gradually, we can train ourselves to notice what, when our thoughts are taking over. And that's a um, take, quote taken from the NHS website, so it's legit. Um, so yeah, I think that sums it up quite nicely. Mindfulness as a concept is very simple. It's that act of taking notice of your thoughts. Um, and kind of the crucial part of it is very much that you take notice, but don't um, ascribe any meaning particularly, or kind of chase down the rabbit hole of thought trying to analyze or rationalize or dwell. It's very much that idea of, it's an uh, analogy lots of people use, but that idea of watching thoughts pass, like if you're at a bus station, you just wa watch your thoughts of the buses, you just let them pass, you kind of notice and let it go. So it's very much about a kind of passive, but engaged way of just noticing what's going on in your body. Um, one of the really good things about mindfulness is that this isn't like an evidence-based um, practice. So it's lo lots of years of study behind it. So it the most kind of comparable thing, I guess, is it's like a form of meditation. But that in itself has got years and years and years and years of study and data behind it that proves it can actually be an effective way of managing poor mental health. I've um, got a quote here. Uh, mindfulness is recommended by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence as a way to prevent depression in people who, who have had three or more bouts of depression in the past. So it is very much like an evidence-based, um, kind of legit way of dealing with uh, low mental health. I think something um, to be aware of is it's, there's lots of data and um studied into how mindfulness can help with low mood anxiety and depression there's less data and less kind of evidence for how it can help with like psychosis or more kind of chronic mental health conditions um so that's something to be aware of and in my experience i think maybe this will chime with quite a few people here um mindfulness is kind of the thing most gps will kind of nudge you towards because it is there's lots of positives to it it's very accessible it's quite you can do it anywhere it can be remote you can do it in your bedroom you can do it on the bus and it's very self-led so you don't need um you know you don't need to go off and pay a therapist you can do that there are mindfulness therapists but um it's very much something you can learn and teach yourself which is great if for every reason you don't phone's ringing that's gonna really ruin this flow in a mindfulness way this is me noticing the phone has rung and letting it go because someone answered it um what was i talking about uh yes so the fact that yeah you can do mindfulness kind of anywhere by yourself self kind of led is great because some, not therapy talk therapy isn't accessible to everyone and it can kind of be an interim thing but at the same time mindfulness isn't a silver bullet it's not kind of cure-all by any stretch um, and it can put people off sometimes if their first kind of uh, interaction with, you know, the kind of 
getting treatment for poor mental health, if their first experience is this kind of right, go off and do it yourself, go learn how to meditate, that doesn't always sit well with everyone. Um, and yeah, like I say, when people are in kind of mental health crisis, it's it's not gonna, it, it, it comes back to that idea of a toolkit. So mindfulness can be a really useful thing to have in your toolkit of things to deal with poor mental health. So you've got maybe therapy, medication, support network, mindfulness, all part of your arsenal. But um, for people who are in like really chronic um, crisis, mindfulness is kind of not gonna be that useful. But as Trace alluded to, um, some of the techniques are really useful for panic attacks and kind of anxiety attacks particularly. It's it's a very um, immediate way of calming your body down. So yeah. Um, so I kind of talked a bit about what mindfulness is, that concept of teaching yourself to slow down and notice your thoughts. And the, the logic being that the more you notice and think, when, sorry, the more you notice what you're thinking, patterns become clear to you. And it is quite a kind of passive um, way of kind of dealing with your thoughts. And it can feel quite counterintuitive. The first time I kind of, um, encountered mindfulness was when I was very 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 anxious and you know really kind of chronic like you know stomach clench not not functioning very well and someone comes goes to you and says okay well, what you need to do to help with this is really think about how you're feeling and it can feel bonkers if you're in a very very uh head up place and that you're told to kind of sit and go into your thoughts because Mine's, my reaction was just all I can think about is how stressed I am. And that kind of gets you onto that rabbit wheel, hamster wheel of thought of like, I feel awful, I feel awful. I, I can feel my pulse rising, I can feel this stuff. So something to bear in mind is one, um, mindfulness is a practice. It's like meditation. It's like, well, it's even like, you know, weightlifting. It's like a muscle you have to develop. And it, yeah finding your own path is a process. So you might try one form and hate it. You might try another and it's more suitable. So it comes back to that again, that idea of having a variety of things in your toolkit that can help when you are in a, so you've got something to reach to when you're in a less than good place. Um, I'll post in, this won't, it won't be helpful for people who, who aren't on Citizens Advice Workplace. I'm not sure how many non-Citizens Advice people are watching. If you are not Citizens Advice, hello. Nice, thanks for stopping by. Um, but for those who are um, on the Citizens, Citizens Advice Workplace uh, group helping each other, I'll post some links to various mindfulness things. But yeah, coming back to that question, okay, so how, do, how does one begin to do mindfulness or start to explore it. Um, Mind, the charity, has some great resources. The NHS has some great resources and places to start. There is the, I think it's called the Oxford Mindfulness Centre, which is kind of the most, the, the area of most mindfulness research. They're good places to start if you want to explore, but genuinely just Googling mindfulness, you will come up with thousands of hits and different ways to access it. Um, yeah. So I'm going to do some mindfulness now. I can hear my parents talking downstairs. I'm like, that's really distracting. Um, and yeah, that's another part of that can actually be helpful in stressful situations is noticing what's going on and naming it. So um, for me, something I do a lot is the idea of naming my emotions and sensations and feelings. And it sounds completely daft. And it's something that if five years ago, they're shouting that's really helpful um, <laughs> um yeah five years ago if when I was like starting to explore mindfulness I was very dismissive of it because I was like this isn't helpful just like just knowing that I'm feeling angry that doesn't help anything but the more I do it and the more I've, I've kind of surprised myself that how much that kind of act of noticing and naming emotions oh chick's popping up hello was it because I was sorry <laughs> I want to come in on this point if you don't mind because it is it's what I talked to you about when you said what want to do a mindfulness hour. For me, noise 
hearing people walk, hearing people breathe, if I sit on a train, it's all just too much. It's too frustrating. So madness has never, ever, ever connected with me because I'd never get silence. So I just didn't know whether, because you were just talking about the noise is obviously affecting you. So just yeah. to contribute to that. It's fun. Yeah, I think it's um, the idea with mindfulness, as far as I can tell, is that you just notice. So when, so yeah, when there's interruptions, um, you acknowledge it and let it go. And that's the hard thing. So it's the idea of like, if there's thoughts that are bothering you or if, in, in, intrusive thoughts, like I think that's something that I've, I've, I've um, certainly dealt with. The idea that you can just notice it and let it go. And it is a muscle that you, it, it's definitely a practice. It's not something that our minds are naturally geared to do. I think our minds are, are noisy and we look for distraction but it's about training yourself to acknowledge like, okay, the phone's ringing. Oh, okay, there's like a screaming child. That's interesting. That's making me feel X and let it go. I think especially with, um, I think it's, it's important to say like, if, if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. It's 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 just one, it's one aspect of something you can do, but um, it definitely doesn't fit all mental health conditions. Um, oh, I've got a comment from Alan Bromyard. So it's noticing things are kind of falling away, kind of. Yeah, I think it is that kind of noticing and not trying to ascribe particular meaning or um, or cause an action to it. So, and again, I want to caveat this, I'm not a doctor or a therapist. I'm kind of going off what I've just le I learned, kind of doing reading and being um, mentally ill the past couple of years. Um, I think what really helps me with, this idea of noticing and letting things go is having like an analogy or a mental image or a metaphor, I love a metaphor me. So the thing that really works for me is imagining when I've got really um, bad intrusive thoughts or just like really stupid and anxious thoughts that kind of like everyone hates you and everything's wrong, um, which I assume is anxiety, it could just, you know. um, yeah, I imagine, my, I try and imagine my thoughts like I'm in a big um, field of puppies and every now and then a puppy runs towards me. Puppies are thoughts, that's the key part of the analogy. Um, puppies are running around and every now and then they're banging to me. I just gotta pick them up, turn around and put them back on the path. <laughs> so the, the analogy there is that your thoughts aren't good or bad particularly, I mean puppies are good, mm. but it's, you just, you let your thoughts just kind of run amok and when they're hurtful you just kind of turn them around and just let pa pass them away or like recognizing okay that's not a good thought I'm going to just like put that push that away and then another analogy is that idea of um you're at a bus station and every thought you have is just a bus passing through you don't have to get on it you don't have to do anything with it you're just noticing okay the number 42 is going past and that's going um I would appreciate not everyone will find puppies and buses useful. Um, there are lots of other ways to do mindfulness. I think that's just kind of an entry level or what I particularly find useful is like noticing what I'm feeling. And yeah, naming emotions. So particularly again with anxiety, um, you, it just, for me, it's a very visceral thing. So you feel it in your body and you just feel like bad. And it, it, if you can train yourself to kind of drill down into, okay, well, what kind of bad am I thinking? Is it angry? Is it scared? Is it hungry sometimes we're hungry um but yeah listening finding a way to kind of quieten down your active mind and really feel what's going on and a number of times I've been surprised by what I'm actually feeling so I'm, I would think I'm just I think I'm just scared but actually there's anger and I can find out where that anger is coming from or kind of explore that a little bit anyway so I'm ranting a lot about puppies and buses so I'm going to move on slightly um, a really kind of popular form of mindfulness is guided, guided meditation, um, which is similar, I guess, very similar to what uh, Tracy did at the start of this session. So the idea, and there's a million, million different ways you can do it. Um, apps like Headspace are really popular. Um, I think something I found with Headspace is the if you like the voice of the narrator or not, 
for those kind of guided meditations or like calm app is another good one um and i think that's the one where they've got like stephen fry and like cersei from game of thrones read your bedtime story either you love that or you hate it um but there's also stuff i think most of those apps are paid um you have to pay for them and um, there's loads of stuff on youtube as well um again it, it's about finding the form that finding what suits you and finding um the kind of quiet that you need so lots of guided meditations Ooh, my dog is not calm right now i don't know if you can hear that um lots of guided meditations will walk you through how to relax and it's it, it can be really useful if you kind of let yourself lean into it um so it will kind of do it a, a really popular technique technique is a body scan so it'll talk you through like right you're lying down starting at the top of your head notice just imagine like a beam of light passing down your body and it talk the, the meditation will talk you through how to kind of scan your body how to and just noticing how you feel and again it's that thing of you don't have to fix anything per se it could be oh if you notice that your shoulders are tight explore what it would, what it would feel like to relax your shoulders if you notice things it's very much about noticing and correct not necessarily having to fix or correct things um and also those guided meditation things are really useful for well i i think a lot of people find them useful for putting you to sleep they're really good ways to um yeah if you if you trouble, have trouble with kind of racing thoughts at bedtime which i know is quite a common thing finding a way to slow your body down and get into a more mindful state can be useful for getting to sleep which is always good um, I've jotted down a few other can't scroll ways of being mindful. Um, colouring. There was a big craze a couple of years ago for colouring books. Um, but I think, and it could be seen as a fad, but I think also it's a really interesting way or really interesting avenue into finding activities that let your mind kind of go into neutral. I think the thing that colouring is really good for is it allows your hands to be busy and your brain's kind of slowly engaged because you're thinking about, okay, what colour am I going to use next, blah, blah, blah. But it's a way, that kind of state, I don't know how many of you watching really love colouring or remember when you used to colour as a child, but that kind of state of being, you kind of reach that point, it's almost like Nirvana, I guess, um, that state of just your brain is there your mind is engaged but in a very neutral kind of like mm, calm way that's kind of the the aim of mindfulness and I guess of meditation too is to kind of get yourself into the state where you're present but not actively having to analyze the situation or make judgments or you know analyze so coloring works for some people other people not but things like yoga um again some people that's some people's worst nightmare but I think any activity that can put you into that kind of Zen state of just tuned out, but tuned out, but aware of your senses as well. So I think there's a fine line between being mindful or being chilled and being numb or being kind of uh, tuned out. So watching TV, for example, isn't really, <laughs> it is of course relaxing and a very lovely thing to do, but it wouldn't be, your mind is switched off but in a, you're absent because your kind of stimulus is taken away from your body and put, you know, you're focusing on the plot of your standards. You're not thinking about, you're not thinking about your bad thoughts perhaps, but you're also not in tune with your body. Like you think about when you've been sat on the sofa watching TV and you get up and you've got a numb leg and like you realise you, you're thirsty. The idea of mindfulness is more to be really in tune with your body. So things that allow you to calm your mind down, go into a lower state of kind of awareness, but still be really into what your body is doing. So you can suddenly realise, you know what, I've been holding my breath for the past half hour. Um, and a lot of these kind of mindfulness practices, the idea is that you can take elements of them and weave them into your day to day. So I think again, Tracy mentioned that with her breathing. If it's about, it's again, it comes back to the idea of practicing and like building up your mindfulness muscle so that when you're in your day to day work, you can um, 
pull on that kind of that um, skill you developed and use it to calm yourself down. So, for example, if you've got a really big meeting that you're dashing to, but you can take 30 seconds just to center yourself and do some calming breathing, that's a form of mindfulness. Or if you're on a night out or you're out with some friends and you suddenly realize that you're not feeling great, taking a bit of time to go into yourself, go, okay, what am I feeling right now? Am I feeling anxious? Am I feeling scared? Am I feeling drunk? Am I feeling bored? Um, but taking all these kind of elements of a practice that allows you and encourages you to drill into what you're feeling and be more present, all those little elements can be woven into your day-to-day, which hopefully um, will make you feel a little bit more balanced, a little bit more present. And again, yeah, this is why the idea of mindfulness as part of a toolkit is really important because if you are going, you know, you've been recently been bereaved or something and are in a really low place, mindfulness can't cure bereavement, it can't cure anything. Um, it's not gonna fix anything. It's just another way to help you get through the days with the view that helping you get through the day to day will help you to get to the place where you're you come out of the bad place you come out of your bereavement or um you know out of an episode of depression or anxiety or whatever my dog is really really shouting which um isn't that conducive to being calm thanks back it was just about asmr because oh um, yeah I'm aware of a lot of people who really rate ASMR. I, I've always associated it with sleep because I have to have noise in the background to sleep, but I've never been able to fall asleep with it. I find it too cringy, really. Um, but there's a lot of, obviously, stuff like cutting sands and stuff like that, which isn't cringy, then it's just nice noise. But for some of it, it's just a bit too cringy. But I know a lot of people, it's not just to fall asleep. It actually is to calm. So it's just something to watch and listen to, and that helps mm-hmm. to have no noise they have. It's like softer noise or something, isn't it? It's a... Yeah, I'm I'm a big ASMR person. Okay. I, which, and I think it is quite, it's a little bit naff or it's a little, it, it can be a bit cringe. And also especially when you have to explain to someone like why are you watching videos of people like tapping lids? It's like, it's very important that I watch these videos every now and then. Um, it, yeah, it kind of, I think ASMR is really interesting to me because there's all that idea of like needing noise a certain kind of noise i've always been a kind of person who needs um background noise to work or to concentrate and like i always have headphones on at work i'd be listening to like just rain noise on youtube and again that's always awkward to explain to your boss like i'm yeah listening to some rain for 20 hours it's fine um i guess the thing i think with yeah i'm also conscious of like people using well I know I do it, that idea of using a relaxing video or kind of, because there's loads of like um, Instagram accounts that do that kind of thing, like, you know, cutting sand or carving, carving soap is great. Oh my God, like everyone take five minutes today to look at a video of someone carving soap. It is really, truly very relaxing. Um, But the point is, I think it can be a bit of a crutch or a bit of a, yeah, it's like that idea of numbing yourself or not. I think this is something that social media is really good at. You think, well, and this is me talking about my personal experience, but you think, oh, I'll take a, I'll take a break from what I'm doing, look at my phone, look at social media to kind of relax. But you just end up avoiding the thing that was freaking you out or making you panic. Um, and then you you finish your, your relaxing break, go back to real life. It's like, oh no, the thing's still there. I didn't magically go away while I looked at my phone. Um, this is very much my, my personal. <laughs> and I, that, that pattern, by the way, of that me realizing I kind of, that I found out um, through CBT, like that kind of took um, talking to a therapist to realize that, oh yeah, I do that pattern. I do this way of like escaping things to like relax, but then I end up making it worse. So that's all that's to say. Um, I think one of the benefits of mindfulness is that it's so boring that you're not going to do it to like procrastinate, but also like it's a better way of relaxing or de-escalating your brain that doesn't, it can, it doesn't have to be avoidant. It can, it's much, yeah, it's too dull to be, to be avoidant. It's just, um, and can be very physical as well. I think the breathing stuff 
it's can't be overstated how fundamental breathing obviously it's fundamental because without it you die but um that link between slowing down manually slowing down your breath and choosing to breathe slower will it, it, it does affect your mood well not affect your mood but like the oh, my a-level biology is failing me now but there's a like a the, the the connection between your breathing and your neurons let's say i don't know what you mean but like there is a knock-on effect like it's not going to cure your problems it's not going to solve everything but if you're in that really horrible crisis mode, mode and like you're freaking out or having a panic attack learning how to control your breathing will eventually calm you down and get you to a more safe way of being yeah, yeah cool okay well i'll let you carry on with it but i said just definitely wants to pop all about asmr because i thought it was missing Thank you. yeah um i'm a big asmr fan but um i think it can yeah be aware of like things becoming a crutch and not um being useful to you so yeah by the way please do keep commenting because you know it's good to comment it's good to have it in other other thoughts apart from mine um i think one of the things i found with mindfulness is that it's not it's not a natural way of thinking of uh, I think human beings as like a species, we have very noisy minds and we're not naturally comfortable without stimulation um, or without input or something. Like there's a reason why humans don't just sit and stare into space for hours at a time. We like doing a crossword or playing Nintendo, you know, but we, we don't, we're not very comfortable sitting alone with our thoughts. So mindfulness is a muscle that you have to flex and practice um, it won't happen overnight and it won't necessarily be useful to you overnight. It might be over a series of months or years that you learn this practice that will help you day to day or, or that you learn what aspects of mindfulness actually help you. Um, a note I wrote, which is a good note, I'm glad I wrote that down. Um, Mindfulness can be the stepping stone that enables you to have other conversations or takes you to another place. So often for me, giving myself time to slow down and do a bit of deep breathing or maybe meditation or whatever, I'll be kind of sifting through my thoughts, not necessarily analyzing them, but just seeing what comes up naturally where I sit, what images come to mind, what thoughts, what memories. Then what's really useful is it's that thing of you, you when like you have a dream and figure out what's been bothering you allowing yourself space to be with your thoughts might reveal stuff to you that you hadn't realized so taking 10 minutes of um mindfulness just to sit be alone with your thoughts see what comes to the top might help you realize you know what actually this is what's bothering me or this is what's actually the issue here I've, I've been not ignoring this thing but when I close my eyes this thought maybe it's a, a work project maybe it's a person maybe it's a money problem when I'm alone when I'm, I let myself be alone with my thoughts this is the thing that keeps coming back and that in that way mindfulness is a really useful tool for enabling you to have the other conversations that you might need to have so it might make you realize that okay actually I need to confront that person or I need to deal with this project or I need to um actually I need more help perhaps it might be that when you're alone with your thoughts um there's stuff there that you can't handle on your own and that's uh, extremely common and if it if it if you find that when you slow down your mind what you find you feel you can't deal with on your own um, I would always, I'm a big advocate of um, talk therapy. I know it's not accessible to everyone just because of money or um, maybe childcare problems or, you know, caring issues, people you've got to look after. It's not as simple as um, simply choosing to go to therapy. But I, yeah, I'm a big advocate of finding ways to kind of 
get more support essentially at the end of the day I think there's, there's not a person on the planet I don't think who wouldn't benefit from having like an hour with a therapist they just to talk an hour with a therapist a week just to talk about their feelings and thoughts because I think everyone um Jake sorry there's just two comments on the private chat I just wanted to let you know about oh please or should I go look at them yes please it's just, just okay. Kate's right. talking. <laughs> um they're not saying Kate's not talking great um Rachel Irvin says, we sleeping, I have to listen to read audiobooks to go to sleep or when I wake at night. But I, but I have to already have listened to them during the day, essentially better them to make sure they aren't stressful tense in any way. I really like that. That's the yeah. I find um audiobooks or like I don't I'm not an audiobook person at all. I do like podcasts, but I can only listen to them when I'm moving. I don't know why that is. Um but I really like that as an idea, like having to have um audiobooks that you've you know are comfortable or comforting i do actually i have i have certain books that i read when i want to relax and calm down like things i read when i was younger that i like to read them, go back to it's a really nice comment thank you rachel um eloise carrick said love the idea of mindfulness death can be easier to have been done sometimes also i hate asmr in terms of people whispering etc send the shield down my spine not in the good way yeah asmr is a funny one um because it genuinely has like a, like a physical reaction in me but I think also the kind of flip side of it is the uh, misophonia, misophonia. Um, but where like that, I'm not going to do it to probably piss off everyone watching. Um, but yeah, it can also just pop people right over the edge. Um, but um, yeah, mindfulness is easier than done. Absolutely, I think you're right saying that, Eloise. Um, and also. I think as a concept, it's, yeah, again, that idea, it's not an easy or comfortable thing to do, so allowing your thoughts, or, but then the nice thing about mindfulness and that tricky thing to learn is that you, you slow down your body and your mind, thoughts come, and you don't necessarily have to do anything with them right there and then, so if you have that thought that is, I need to talk to my boss because I can't do this project, so that's the thought that comes up. Um, you don't have to do anything with it. It's the idea of you pa it's passing it by, you don't have to pounce on it, you don't have to write it down, you can do if you want to. But um, often uncomfortable thoughts can come up or um, truths that you don't like. Um, so I've just seen Rachel's comment, I listen to a lot of children's books. That's lovely. I, when lockdown started, I came home and I was like, right, I'm just going to reread all of Harry Potter because I can't deal with anything <laughs> more kind of um yes like i need fantasy i need a book i know i need owls called hedwig i don't need any kind of like real world problems now i mean harry potter a lot of peril I, like past book three it gets too sad i couldn't do with it that's not the point though. um what was i talking about yes um when you're doing mindfulness however you do it and uncomfortable thoughts come up, you don't have to do anything with them. You don't, the idea is that they kind of just pass up, they come up and you can let them go. And the theory, which has been proven through science, is that just by acknowledging or knowing that thought's there, your mind along, you know, over the course of weeks and months, figures out the problem for you. And again, it is kind of, it reminds me, it's that thing of, you can have a dream, and it makes no sense and then you realize like oh that dream was about this or this person or something suddenly comes up you realize like what i've been worried about is this so the mind your mind kind of it's a very kind of low um impact way of figuring stuff out you just have to kind of like let thoughts come to you and trust that your brain will sort it out for you and surprisingly it often does obviously there's occasions when that isn't true and you need to tap someone in for help so whether that's um counsellor or family member or whoever but yeah I would, I would encourage everyone to try find a form of mindfulness that works for you that might be gardening or I think physical things can be great because it's that again that idea of keeping your hands and body busy and your mind goes, in, goes into neutral and you suddenly get thoughts or patterns occur that wouldn't normally if you're kind of 
keeping your active kind of thinking mind busy. Um, yeah, so, oh, well, put in the comment, thank you, Judith, Judith Edwards. Um, personally, I like non-fiction books about history, not recent, or the natural world, something mild, mildly diverting, but not so engaging that it stops sleep. Yeah, that's a really, I like that a lot. I always find non-fiction puts me to sleep, just anyway, because um, I think I'm a bit thick. I just, <laughs> something about, yeah, non-fiction. Um, I, find, I think it's, I find it hard to concentrate on, because I'm concentrating harder, I go to sleep very quickly. Um, thank you for your comments, Judith. Um, yeah, I'm really hoping Jake might pop up right now to come talk to me. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Still, uh, <laughs> just eating. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's great, and it's obviously um, very good of you to have just spoke to the screen for so long as well, um, which is good. But I think obviously it's it's connected with a lot and of people. Like oh, and and the you know the hour was designed, wasn't it, to to just give people some space to think about this as a topic um and and hopefully connect with with some people um and, and maybe inspire people to to have a go of it themselves if, if obviously they they would like to which is why it's good obviously yeah. the perspectives that you've you've gave on that um and, and that it is accessible as well because actually there are the apps such as headspace aren't there that, that you can you can even get deals with spotify and stuff like that on them so uh, and again i've tried them but it, it just didn't for me personally it just didn't i just wasn't into yeah. it um, but it doesn't mean I don't want to be. It's just that whenever I've tried it, it's just, it's just not for yeah. me. I'm trying to think of um, other ways of being mindful, or I think oh, I've got another comment. Let's go look. Oh, thank you, Alan Bromyard. I've just finished reading a book on mindful meditation. I love the bus station analogy. So thank you very much for the session. Twice went to ask a question. You were already answering it already. <laughs> well done. Thank you. It was helpful. Thank you, Alan Bromyard. Thank you for your comments. Very, very good. Um, you deserve to have that up on the screen, so we'll leave. That oh yeah, there. you're reading. You see over uh, my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for everyone for your comments and your thoughts. Um, yeah, I think something about mindfulness that I've, when I said the word so much this hour that it's lost all meaning. Um, it's something that I kind of mentioned at the start that the NHS I, I know has kind of like officially endorsed as like their kind of um as part of their kind of toolkit or however you know their, their their response to people with ill mental health which I, I do completely understand but I also understand it can be frustrating for people because it it is effective but it requires a lot of input from you it's not kind of it's and if it's sort of thing, if it doesn't work for you or you, you don't find it easy to get into that headspace, it's really frustrating because you're left with almost nothing. Because it, it's it's very well and good if you are in the mindset or the kind of person where meditation helps. If not, then you kind of left with not with nowhere to go. And I think there's definitely a risk of over relying on um mindfulness as a concept to fix everything, which I know mental health um, treatment actually can fix everything. You know, medication is one aspect of a, a treatment plan that should be holistic. So just as you wouldn't kind of give someone, or you wouldn't prescribe someone and depress them and go, right, that's it, you're done. It's equally mindfulness can't be the only thing in your arsenal. Um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of, I've got lots of friends or people I know who, are in a very bad way with their mental health and they're going to go to their GP and what they're told is um okay you can go on a six-month waiting list to get some mindfulness kind of um without slagging off the NHS or getting too kind of political with it it's I can see why some people it can be a bit marmite because it's a useful thing to have but when you're in a really bad place or yeah like if your particular mental health is something more uh more serious such as schizophrenia um but borderline personality disorder it's not really a cut the mustard it's useful to have but there's there needs to be something else that we can kind of offer people um other than just deep breathing which i love but can only get you so far i agree i agree we've got two comments here so kate hobson has said um, to you kate 
Um, that was a really interesting session. So thank you for sharing your thoughts and experience. And Rachel has commented just saying fab session, Kate. So that's, that's oh, great. Thanks, guys. Wow. Thanks good. for letting me talk. <laughs> Probably the least mindful thing is me just stream of conscious thing for an, an hour. But that might have been ASMR for some people. They might it. So it might have been. Maybe that's my sideline. I could. Um, yeah. I, I, the the. Well, those videos get millions of views, don't they? That's that's why I've seen them because I I fall asleep watching very random. I used to watch political documentaries because obviously I'm ex uh, passionate about politics as well. Um, so that would sometimes help. And now I just watch comedies, but they always come up because you know probably must watch them for sleeping as well. But then ASMR things come up. I may have got far more million views than the shows that I'm watching. Oh yeah, it's it's. I know I, someone I follow like she's made an entire career out of it, and it's <laughs> it's very sad that I'm admitting this publicly on like a streaming <laughs> platform. But yeah, like videos of people like wrapping presents. Yeah. It's just like oh. No, just, just don't, don't need don't need um search again just have that mm -hmm. um yeah and um the, I, I gotta say it again carving soap really does hit the spot like people with a oh, stunning knife and a bar of dove <laughs> um, <laughs> we're not we're not really promoting dove are we so any other soap no. <laughs> it's gonna it can't be liquid can it because you can't really cut the liquid soap so no it's at a bar which is obviously a uh, your point there so so yeah i think i think it's interesting we've got another comment here from emma saying a toolbox of tricks i can't see the rest of that comment because it's, it's got half the screen um and um, well helpful different things work for different people which again has been yeah. sort of your your hour here on mindfulness so for the last couple of minutes before sarah comes on what are your take-home messages for people who are thinking yeah. about mindfulness so um it is a practice and it is a muscle that you develop. It's not something that um, that the mind naturally wants to do, sit quietly, but um, it can be a really useful tool. It's something that I invite everyone to explore in their own way. I think, again, when we talk about the kind of main message of today was about like being more open about mental health or talking more about it. I think the more people can share their strategies for being mindful can be helpful. So if you know it's more of a normal thing to say when I'm freaking out this is how I ground myself yeah but yeah um take it's a muscle that you have to develop um it is part of a toolkit of tools that you I find helpful to kind of deal with the roller coaster of having poor mental health um find there's lots of ways to be mindful it could just be breathing it could be focusing on your senses and um, that's a really kind of nice way to be mindful like okay I can, what can i feel right now what can i hear what can i see um and yeah there's a million what it's it's and it's a nice way of cutting yourself slack if you're in a low place or not in a good place giving yourself time to be mindful noticing what comes up and then not feeling that you have to solve it or um, ascribe any particular meaning to it or prove anything you can just notice how you're feeling and that's really powerful like sometimes and it's it's interesting how these kind of ways of thinking or being kind of, kind of feed into your just everyday um, language because I'm thinking about when I'm, I'm talking to my friends sometimes one of us say you know I'm feeling really sad today and just rec and in a way you can kind of reflect mindfulness back to them like oh yeah it really sucks thanks for sharing that's what you feel and just allowing yourself the space and the capacity to notice what you're feeling and not to do anything with it can be really powerful a former colleague of mine joshua has just commented saying um in the beginning of lockdown doing cooling of mandela prints from i think that's how you say is it Man mandela yeah i think so from sainsbury's helped me overcome some of the distressed and anxious times because focusing on patterns, shapes, and colours to make beautiful prints was very good for mindfulness. Um, do you have any tips to help fit mindful practice into busy days? Um, good question. I, other but than anyway, don't you? You just said you had rain in the background. Yes. So you can do it. Yeah, I think um, find what. Yeah, I think especially now we're all working from home. There's a lot more flexibility. So you like make your work day work for you I think something I think is 
I try and remind myself, even on busy days, I think it's rare that you don't have a minute to yourself. Well, you can carve out a minute, 30 seconds, five minutes. I think even the most busy, busy days, everyone can find literal five minutes. Take it away from your desk, put a time on your phone so you don't have to worry about like falling asleep or like um, you know, missing something. And just give yourself five minutes to be away from your desk. And yeah, I get that idea of like not having to like put any pressure on yourself or like what am I gonna do with this five minutes? What am I gonna achieve? What am I gonna tick off my list? Just giving yourself space to notice your thoughts for or a minute or 30 seconds or whatever you can think you can give. Um yeah, I get this this is part of maybe a wider conversation about work and mental health, but like the what it's it's far, far better to give yourself. 10 minutes away from your desk then feel like you have to be productive and stay at your desk and then just work, make, get yourself into a tizzy and feel awful the world isn't going to explode if you take a half hour break there's there's rarely anything I mean I, sorry I'm speaking like on behalf of other people like I know people do do incredibly important jobs with citizens advice but in my experience like there's rarely anything that can't wait half an hour 20 minutes it's much better to give yourself a break a proper like go outside get some air and come back a bit more fresh and rested than trying to like battle through and then ends up just knackering yourself and not being that productive would be my hot take no i think it's i think it's a really good point um and and, and yeah i think it is you know it's difficult when you are facing a really busy day and you're feeling everything's you know intense to, to then think okay i've got ten, five or ten minutes to go away and do some mindfulness stuff but i can totally appreciate your your point that if you do do that and you take a step away um then you'll be able to do it. sarah are a very good friend of mine has just joined so i'm going to bring her up because i do think she might have a comment before you go kate Hi, sarah and we'll Hello. do it in a moment but kate has just nearly done nearly an hour on her own i've just been popping around talking about madness wow so, just just talking aloud about some of those thoughts do you have any tips on mindfulness I mean, it's really interesting. I'm not somebody who's um, very well practiced in mindfulness. My mind um, isn't isn't well um, set up for it. But I do know that it works um, for people who experience anxiety. And I know that it can have a really significant impact on all of those sorts of symptoms. So uh, I absolutely support mindfulness. And in fact, uh, you know, have done the odd uh, online mindfulness course and uh, definitely would support people getting involved and, and people you know definitely implement you know mindfulness in their daily living and that definitely changes lives so um, yeah I'm glad you've covered that. And I endorse UK probably, which is great so, um, so that's great Kate. thank you very much um, and I think we will see you again on the screen later on because you're going to help us wrap up later on so thank you Kate that's great. Nice to meet you Kate. You too. Thank you. Sarah, Hello. Hi. Um, Are you exhausted? Uh, not really, because uh, thankfully Kate did do the hour, so and, and Tracy did a breathing exercise but earlier, so I've been able to stretch. It's stretching really that's the problem, you know, me, me neck, because you know I yeah. start, you, you yes. know, it, it slouch a lot. That stuff that really hurts. But other than that, I think, you know, we both, you and I both, are fascinating. So it's it's not a subject to get bored of six hours in at no. all. Um, and we've had different perspectives, so. You know, we've had a conversation on conversation and on PS4, and then we've had disability in Korea. And these people who so we had two people, two chief execs who use wheelchairs, one permanently and one infrequently, um, and how that's impacted on their career and some other uh, conditions that they have, and how mental health plays a part in that as well. So, we've sort of gone through those stages. Yes. Uh, so later on, we've got a chat about leadership, and that's stuff that we talked about last week in our catch up being a leader and having mental health problems. So, so I think it's I think it's it's really interesting session. So let's not waste any time on, on, on yours. So thank you. Uh, introduce yourself to the team. So don't forget to sit and wait and then we've got public sections okay. as well. Cool. All right. Okay. Well, I'm Sarah Hughes and I'm the chief exec at the Centre for Mental Health. And uh, I know Jake because Jake worked with me in my last uh, job when I was chief exec of a uh, local mind organisation in Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. And um, I guess I've, I've worked in mental health for 30 years now. Oh my gosh. 
I feel like I, yeah, that's a long time. And, you know, both in um, community and secure settings, and the majority of that time has been on the front line. So in services, you know, looking after and looking, working with lots of different people with lots of different experiences. My current job is much more about research and policy. So I'm, I'm a bit further away from the front line. But Interestingly, I almost feel closer to it um, because we make it our business in the organisation to make sure we're informed by lived experience. So in some ways, um, I haven't moved that far away. No, it's good. So what is the Centre for Mental Health? So um, people don't usually like this, this terminology, but we are a not-for-profit think tank. And so we, we do research, we, um, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, influence in policy terms. So we've been at the heart of doing things like reviewing the Mental Health Act, um, you know, talking to government about their COVID and mental health plans. Uh, we have, we work with lots of different universities and providers around the country and around the world, um, talking all things mental health. And I think the thing that I've really valued about being at the centre you know, when you're working in the front line, sometimes it's really difficult to know why or how decisions are being made. And often the decision makers, i.e. government, are very, very far away from what you're doing. And organisations like us, we're like the broker, the middle woman, if you like, to try and bring those spaces together. But, um, you know, and it's tricky, it's tricky work because sometimes the policy and the experience do not necessarily um, come together or are aligned. So it can be a difficult job. I think it's interesting. I think when, when we spoke last week, and obviously a lot of that was private conversation and, and, and whatever, but we did talk about, you know, mental health in practice then. So, what do employers need to do? How can how can people get the support that they need? And you know, we did and we talked this today about the idea or the thought that um and, and obviously I talked to you about you know how delighted I was that Prince William and Prince Harry have spoken up so publicly about mental health. And I know again Prince William's been up this week, hasn't he, with footballers and talking about mental health and football. Um and that's all, and that's all brilliant. It's not it's not relating to then the increase in services in the NHS. And I know that we'll then hear that the government are doing that, and I'm not making any observations on that, but it just doesn't feel that we are getting increased support for mental health services. And that seems to be a lot of the feedback we get from people with those who are needing that help. So there's a few topics there, but I think if we start with the employers, because obviously a lot of people watching are, are going to be staff and volunteers and, and others who are who are wondering about what their organisations both need to do also should do and could do because you you know you used to have a marvelous hour or blue hour or something wasn't green it? hour <laughs> a green hour, <laughs> green hour which the government haven't enforced yet but i'm sure you'd love them too but so there's things that we should do we have to do and things that you think we possibly could do yeah i mean i think there's two levels to to what we as employers need to really think about there is the create creating the conditions for a mentally healthy workplace for everybody so that you know your the environment that people are coming to is one in which they feel comfortable they feel welcome they have the resources to do their job you know they're able to talk to their line manager you know they have you know external support if they need it so so it's creating the conditions that that help people feel okay you know because actually we know that work in of itself can be a driver for poor mental health so it's really about you know this isn't just about making sure that you have the right policies in place to deal with somebody who's got mental health problems you know actually we're talking about prevention we're talking about creating the the you know the workplaces we all want to work in and i think ever since I became a manager and I, you know I've been a manager and chief exec now for quite a while and I've always felt a, an acute responsibility to make the workplace an environment that I would be happy it's like a friends and family test you know would I be happy for my brother to work there with you know in fact both my brothers have worked with me in, in, my, in my organizations nepotism in practice um but you know that um you know would you be happy for that to happen and and I think it's about you know really thinking creatively about how you can do that if you're a small charity your resources are tight but that doesn't mean that you can't have good conversations that doesn't mean to say that you can't really think about the language that you're using in the workplace and that you know that doesn't mean you can't really think about 
you know how people are working and 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 the manner in which you manage people so so i think there's that and then there's really for those people who have you know um specific mental health needs that you do have very clear approaches to that that you work really carefully with you know ultimately discrimination um, against somebody with a mental illness is against the law so you know from that perspective it is your duty to make sure that you attend to that in the same way as you would attend to any other condition that you know a member of staff came to you with um and again you know thinking about having good policies and practice going back to my original point that's all well and good but you have to have the culture that allows you to use those policies and practice in a way that actually is helpful you know so so it's often you know you hear people say we've got a really good return to work policy but there's no mental health awareness in the organization and so the, the conversations are just not very good around mental health so so it's not um you know it's not like a a, a set of a menu and you can go we'll just have that and we'll just have that over here actually you need to have all of it and you know my view is if you can create the conditions that are good for mental health then you're creating the conditions that are good for um you know equality all disabilities you know and, and that from my perspective you know is our our duty as an employer you know people spend a lot of time with us yeah. you know yeah. every day um I'm assuming it's driven by CEOs and leaders then in terms of culture yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I would be loath to say that the chief exec, um, you know, in that visible leadership role, because, of course, we've got a board of trustees as well, which we can talk about. But certainly the, the chief exec who is in that visible leadership role absolutely does need to demonstrate what um, a good culture might look like. And that can be really challenging if you've never worked in one yourself or if you don't really have an idea of what it might look like but you know I've spoken to a lot of my peers you know I've interrog interrogated myself around what what does do I want a workplace to look like and this is not um, me saying that I think I haven't made mistakes because I also think um, you know we're always learning and developing and you know bringing new things in that make all the difference but I do think the leader has to you stand by those words it's it's again about making sure that the leader gets it you know and and when i say gets it you know that they take responsibility for it that they don't kind of um shy away from confronting these that, that can be quite complicated and challenging issues especially if you work in an environment where your the mental health of your workforce is at risk because of the nature of the work they do you know our our social care staff our nurses you know they're very much at risk because of the work that they do so you know i think the leader is important but but also we are all important in an organization and so our board of trustees absolutely must you know demonstrate uh, again and that's through their governance strategies i guess you know policies and practice they push those through and they and they support those um they need to be present and and demonstrate again they need to be symbols almost of, of these values in the way that they practice and have conversations but you know for all of us as employees um i, I think we all have some responsibility there and and that's um responsibility to you know create supportive conversations to not do the things in workplaces that we know are you know um negative to other people's mental health so it's a combination of all those things but i think if your leader isn't you know really paying attention then you're going to have an upward struggle you know that's the reality of it cultures are not created by leaders but they are certainly sustained by leaders i think can i just try and again i might got it wrong but you can still answer it because you still did it it's a podcast <laughs> i think it was about bullying in the charity sector yeah. Yes. So, so you did you did you research and we did. Yeah. So we we partnered up with Akivo, and I would say that if you're a chief executive of a charity, being a member of Akivo is a real resource and support for all the reasons, in fact, you know, around mental health and you know, being a chief exec, um it sounds lovely, the title is great, but if you're a chief exec of a charity, it's not quite the same as being a chief exec of ICI 
or you know BT or whatever they're quite different experiences um and I think that you know Akivo offer a rounded level of support and they came to us because you know with all of the the kind of scandals in relating in relating to charities you know over the years they were invited by the government to to look at sort of safeguarding issues broadly and um we we landed on the bullying thing partly because you know that had come up quite a bit in some of the stuff that had been that had come out about various charities and so we undertook some research at the centre we had some independent researchers that were doing that for us the analysis was really great you know it, it made it clear that bullying does happen in charities and you know it often uh, happens at all different levels it's not just you know top down it's bottom up too um but that you know ultimately you know the findings were very clear and this is again not new news it's not revelation but that bullying equals mental illness you know really does have you know very negative uh, connotations for for people and you know our approach again to that was saying well as an organization if you're creating the conditions for good mental health then that would also mean that you would have the conditions that where bullying was mitigated that you know you you would have very good policies for di you know disclosing bullying or harassment and those sorts of things so there was a really good suite of recommendations that I do recommend people go and have a look at but again, um, it's about the board reading those um, those briefings and really understanding them as well. And it's not for the chief executive just to kind of um, spoon feed your board with, you know, what they should be doing. And um, because uh, Akiva also um, published another report recently called Home Truths about racism in the charity sector. And, you know, frankly, that report also demonstrates that racism, you know, exists in our sector. And so, you know, we've got a lot of things that we need to kind of be brave and, and step forward to. And mental health is one of a number, I think. But yeah. if you can get it right in mental health, you can definitely get some headway in the other things. Yeah. 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 Um, I wonder if you have some comments on for some of the panels that we've had today. So the first panel then was around starting the conversation. So you know, in both contexts of, of personal talking about mental health with someone that you know, or in your workplace. So I wonder how you would you would encourage addressing that. Say say again, me because obviously I've been open today. I've got a problem with my mental health. How would you be suggesting that I approach that? Well, I mean, I think you know. To, if if you're working in an organisation where you have good support and supervision, one to one opportunities to talk to your manager, then I think, you know, what we have to do is we have to accept that it's uncomfortable to have the conversation. So I think we should take away the myth, you know, that, that we can make this all right. But actually, you know, even if your manager is great it's still going to be really hard for you to have that conversation and to bring it into your workplace. And so I think that in the first instance, you know, if you're taking it into a supervision session, the manager's first response should be, this is tricky, isn't it? This is difficult. This is going to be, I know, a little bit uncomfortable, but I am really interested and committed to finding a way, you know, through it with you. And so, again, you know, setting the scene for an honest conversation rather than a performative conversation, because it's very easy. And, and you know, just knowing you, you will very quickly pick up on this person's not interested in what I've got to say and then withdraw. So, so if you're in that conversation, and the and the manager actually says, "Okay, let's just let's just go for it. It's not going to be easy, but let's just do it." That gives you an open door. Um, I think if you're the person who's disclosing, and this is sometimes really tricky, but but having a sense of what you need. So you might want to go into the conversation and say, "All I want to do is tell you." Yeah. yeah. You know, because sometimes it's just about saying, I want you to know. Um, and, and you know, I don't necessarily need you to do anything. But if there is something that you think you need to, to have happen um, in relation to your work, then it's somehow being clear about what that ask is. If you can come to it. And sometimes the manager's job is to help you do that thinking. But sometimes it's good for a manager for you to have come with a very clear set of things that you think will help. 
and together you can negotiate that. Again, if you're the person who's making the disclosure, I would definitely check out the policies. So, you know, it's just about having that safety net there of, you know, actually, you know, what policies am I going to refer to? You know, what are the implications of sick leave? What are the, you know, so that you have that knowledge. If you're not in a position to be able to understand it or, you know, um, because of where you're at, then it's then it would be a good idea to either seek a colleague out, you know, that you trust, a friend that you trust, or to seek some separate advice from the wonderful people at Citizens Advice, or, you know, another place where you can get some clarity, because, again, it can be very difficult when you're in, in, a, in a bad place to make sense of all of that in a way that's good for you. And, and when you can't advocate for yourself, you do need to get some support because otherwise it can be very, very difficult to negotiate a workplace and, you know, um, when your mental health is deteriorating. I think that's really good. And I think these are really useful tips as well. That's why I want to just run through some of those sessions. I think the second half of that session was around whether whether you wanted to raise something about somebody else. So again, mm -hmm. I, I, I know let's say we should never go to someone if I think you've got this as a uh, course of call but but the idea that you are then concerned about somebody and whether that's as a manager or, or a colleague or just just you know someone is at the other end of the room how would you be thinking about that conversation well I mean two I've got two two ideas really I mean firstly again I would want the organization to be in a situation where um, those conversations were fine and that, they, you know, you could you could come to me and say, you know, Jane over there, I'm, I'm really worried about her. I don't feel I can speak to her at the minute, but I just want to log that with you. And, you know, obviously, without breaching confidentiality, the manager needs to take that in and then do what they need to do about it. I think creating an organisation where you show concern for each other is important. You know, where you say, you know, are you okay? I mean, one of the things that's difficult, though, is if you're the leader, very rarely do people ask you if you're okay. Um, so actually, the test is, in an organisation where that culture is embedded, is if you as the leader are asked if you're okay. Thankfully, I'm often asked if I'm okay. But that's because I think we work really hard at making sure those conversations can happen across the organization, up, down, sideways, it doesn't matter where they happen, but they can happen. So again, it's it's it comes back to that culture piece yeah. around, you know, what what are the conditions we're creating to make those conversations possible? And that's um yeah, that's really important, I think. Yeah, I think so the, the the next panel was around peer support. So we had chats around, you know, views on peer support and and obviously again, like you've led, you've led a certainly a local man association which has had volunteers as well as paid staff. Yes. So there's those certain dynamics as well. But how would you be encouraging organizations like Sitting Device to promote peer support? Because certainly my contribution to that was, you know, I've found it difficult that when when we're when we're put in place, it's like we're enforcing things to happen and that doesn't mm -hmm. seem to take off as much as when it's grassroots peer support, which is, you know, really true. This is actually what we want to do. Do you know, I think this is, you know, the, the million dollar question, really, because I think, um, so there's, again, number of levels in peer support. So if we're talking about leadership, um, I would say that um, chief executives must have peer groups that they engage with for their own mental health and for their own kind of you know, just support and sense checking and all of that kind of stuff. And, and you know, I think in my career, when I've not had very, very good um, peer support, um, that's, I, I think I've suffered for it. Um, when we're talking about services, um, I led a piece of work with some colleagues recently with Health Education England about embedding peer support into health services, um, national health services, and learning from the third sector and trying to, because effectively the government want to scale up peer support. You know, the cynics in us would say, well, of course, um, because maybe it's cheaper than having a psychiatric nurse. I think the business case has been won in terms of the value of peer support. There is no doubt that in mental health terms, and I think in communities generally, peer support um, achieves outcomes where professional services can't. 
and and that's a given and there's a huge amount of research around the world that tells us that i think as an organization it is really difficult to create um peer networks without it feeling artificial but but actually if you could take a little bit of a step back one of the things i've done that tries that that kind of um helps me uh, resolve that tension is that um, peer support only works when relationships work yeah. and they will only be sustained if those relationships work. So if you're creating peer networks and they don't work and you, you create another one and it does, well, then I would just say, you know, it's a matter of keeping going because sometimes it's about finding the right fit. Sometimes people do need help in coming together because, you know, not every community can make it happen. So in mental health terms, we've got a really good heritage around peer support you know it is it is very sophisticated and it's very grass grassroots led um but sometimes people need need help they need help in identifying where these networks exist they need help in engaging with it and they need help in understanding the parameters of what peer support is and so organizations i think in every domain in the charity sector um should be creating the kind of platforms for some form of peer support you know either it's for their volunteers for their staff teams for their leaders and that's very much because of of really understanding where you sit in relation to everything else getting that sense of understanding from somebody who really understands where you're coming from um so i guess the value of peer support is indisputable um but but I think we have to accept that sometimes we create these networks that feel artificial, but ultimately it's people who make them work. So, you know, it's trial and error. Often. I, I, I agree completely. I just found it an interesting topic because when I did first work for you in 2015, one of the blogs that I wrote in part of the project was around loneliness. And that was based upon, I should remember the Christmas day project that I ran in the before when I was yes. a And um, you know, the thing there was, and I think I remember telling you the story, that actually it was a lot of the volunteers that were the lonely people who needed mm -hmm. support. So it goes back to that idea of we think we know, and I don't want to do this cliche of, you know, think no best, but it was true. You know, we thought we were solving an issue which still exists of older people being isolated and lonely, but actually the biggest demand was from younger people and, and single parents and, and lots of other groups of people who, who actually needed that support. Um, and what came from that was that, um those friendship circles that created their own groups so i, I just again think if we'd have planned that project out and said right well that table is going to create a chess club and that table's going to create a book club, it just never would have worked but the idea we just sort of said well go and sit where you want me merge with the people you want to merge with do what you want we just need people sitting at tables they then created their own social circles from that that some of them still continue to date yes. or one-to-one -one relationships and that's what i then see from the peer support was actually mm -hmm. it was manufactured it was very much uh you, you said you create that space which was important mm -hmm. they were going to get st george's hall for a 500 um sit down christmas meal but we can create that space and then allow them to to move forward and and the whole point on the loneliness blog then was that that it was about being meaningful then so if we just force people where to sit and who they had to engage with it's not meaningful is it it's not a it's not a genuine decent conversation that they're necessarily going to have it needs to be that they gel with so that 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 the idea that if you're older you just need to sit there and play bingo with the people in your sheltered accommodation is not always it's quite often is but not always the case of something that you actually want to engage with so you can still be lonely by forcing oh, absolutely. and peer support really is an opportunity for people to um you know make choices about what they want what they need you know who they need it from and i think that services we often create situations where you know i'm your worker whether we get on or not i'm your worker but actually peer support offers something that's very very different this is about relationships this is about you know what you you know that mutual connection and and peer support you know mental health terms you know, there's so much research about about mental health peer support around the world that says, you know, what's really important is, um, you know, that that kind of reciprocity. Yeah. 
you know that, that you know both of you are getting something out of of that relationship and organizations can sometimes find that very difficult especially if you've got well I'm the member of staff you're the person I'm the volunteer you're the person that uses our services and never the twain shall meet really in you know less formal terms and I think again we're sort of starting to shift and move and rethink some of those boundaries. I wondered if you thought though, that that's why some of the certainly at yeah, something like mine then that those sort of um group work where you've got a, a group of four people who have eating disorders for example or or um a bme um group of people who have got mental health problems certainly to one we've got in in surrey in the minor amateur yeah um, and they they are led by the staff members. it just often is led by someone with that passion because it's either a side thing that they do that then led to something much bigger or or it is just the only thing that they then get involved with and they seem to be pretty effective yeah, and I think, you know, ultimately, look, I think you always, in whatever walk of life, you always do best when you feel it, when you feel it deeply, when you know it somehow up close and personal. And again, that's what peer support does. And so, you know, in all of my experience in, in mental health, you know, I've, so much of my work was delivered and developed with uh, people with lived experience and you know I remember um, the first personality disorder group that we ran at part of my uh, mind organization um, it was it was co-delivered by somebody with lived experience of that diagnosis and you know really my role there was to hold the space it wasn't my role that was having the biggest therapeutic impact it was the person with the lived experience who was talking about you know, living with some really tricky, difficult experiences and recovering. And so, you know, peer support also offers hope, um, you know, in a way that uh, other types of interventions just don't do. Yeah, no, I think I, I, I want to ask the question on serious So that's SMI, isn't it? Serious mental health. Um, we, we obviously had a, a bit of a chat last week, but. Um, the, the panel that introduced this morning were very conscious to talk about the, you know, a lot of us become into this with depression and anxiety and lots of other things that are popular in, in, the, in the sense of, you know, very frequent. What, what would you be saying around, you know, employment or daily life for people who are living with um, serious mental illness that, that arguably are having different experiences to people who have depression and anxiety? Or maybe you'll tell me they won't, but I'm just certainly interested in that, in that angle. Well, I mean, sadly, people with uh, serious mental illness do have starkly different experiences to people who have much more mild to moderate conditions. And some of that you might think, oh, well, well, you know, that's fairly obvious. But actually, people don't realise that, you know, people with serious mental illness often die, um, are more likely to die 20 years before everybody else does that they are often more likely to live with comorbidities, i.e. more than one condition. Um, they have, uh, you know, lots of complications with physical health, yeah. poorer relationships, poorer uh, housing, uh, you know, situations, you know, all of these sorts of things, you know, the prognosis for all of the life domains are much more challenging. They are more likely to be excluded and marginalised from mainstream society. They are more likely to experience poverty. Uh, they are more likely to experience hate crime. So, you know, uh, I mean, it, it's bleak. Yeah. For people with serious mental illness, it, it you know, it can be incredibly bleak. Now, I, what I'm not saying is that people with serious mental illness can't also live fulfilling, good, fulfilling lives, because that's also true. You know, often when we talk about these things, people would like to say it's either that or that. Actually, it's much more complicated and grey. Um, and, and so, you know, but it's more likely that people with serious mental illness will experience all of these other inequalities that I mentioned. And I think that it's also very difficult because if they're on lifelong medication, you know, that has massive, that has a massive impact on their quality of life. So I think that, you know, certainly in our organisation, we work really hard around making sure that the needs of people with serious mental illness are very well understood. So at the moment, we've got a campaign that we um, are working with nations across the world on called Equally Well. 
And basically, it's trying to close the gap between physical and mental health, and particularly in care, uh, particularly in secondary services, where it seems to be the most uh, challenging to bring those two things together. And ultimately, we want to reduce the mortality gap. So effectively, you know, our, our campaign is about making sure that we're getting the knowledge out there, you know, that we're saying to everybody, do you realise that people with SMI die 20 years before everybody else? Do you realise that they're more likely to, you know, be on medication for 40 plus years? Um, so, so it's about... Um, bringing all of these issues together. It's about working with mental health services and physical health services and helping them understand how they can somehow collaborate for the benefit of patients. Um, calling out uh, pra bad practice, really making sure that, you know, we're working on the things that, that, that can make the most difference. So for example, I remember we launched Equally Well in September, 2018. And at the event, we had two women talking about their lived experience. And one woman uh, spoke about, you know, she was on an acute admissions ward and she was on the ward for quite a long time. But as somebody who self-harmed, you know, she, she it meant that she wouldn't be allowed to have access to knives and forks and things. So she was often given food that... Um, you know, that was that she could pick up with her fingers. So it'd be like chicken nuggets or chips and things. And bearing in mind, we've just had the government reduce, uh, um, re produce a, a national obesity strategy this week. That, for instance, is not a great way to work with somebody who is stuck in a psychiatric ward for months, perhaps years on end, eating food that is effectively going to kill them. So, you know, all of those things kind of need to be taken into consideration for people with serious mental illness. And of course, with people who have long term physical health needs, they also develop mental illness, too. So, you know, th there is a um, it's important to join those dots. Um, and if anybody's interested in Equally Well, we'd be particularly interested to hear from, um, you know, citizens advice on, on these sorts of things, really. Yeah, that's really, that's really useful. I think. Um, I think I think it's an important topic because I said the panel were really keen this morning that we are all coming and representing different angles of mental health and different experiences. And some of us who were on this morning, you know, we both say we've got depression and anxiety, but actually totally different experiences mm -hmm. and circumstances, mm -hmm. perspectives, and every other word that I can throw out there to, to sort of add to that weight, really. Um, but, but I think with personal illness, you know, there's so we had a comment in a session earlier on the disability in Korea, and this person said around. You know, they, they, they need to work under 16 hours, and I think that was related to their benefit situation, their, their PIP um, situation. But, but um, the, the employer that they're going to are saying, you're overqualified for this job. So that already felt like a barrier for somebody who was only needing to work part-time, so were applying for jobs that maybe weren't you know, necessarily within the, the field or level that they would normally be applying to. But given their circumstances, we're needing to apply for part-time, and the employers weren't really as accommodating of that. And when I've talked about doing this live stream in the last week or so, some of the comments have been from people saying, you know, it's all well and good to talk about things like depression and anxiety and, and stuff that, as you know, still have very serious and, and damaging consequences. But when they're going to their employers and they're saying, I've got bipolar, or I've got lots of other um, conditions, and prospective employers are just not seeming to be supportive of that. Mm. I think I think this is, you know, when we talk about mental health awareness, I think we are still quite far away from some of those basic, basic principles around um, disability discrimination, you know, and in that sense, you know, if if you have a, a applied for a job, and you feel that your diagnosis has been a barrier, it's, it's really hard to challenge that. And I, you know, I, I know how hard that, that is to challenge, but it is challengeable. And, and I think this is this is where I think that, um, you know, when we're trying to dismantle systems around prejudice and discrimination and stigma, um, it requires quite a lot of strength and emotional labour in challenging that, um, because that's just, a, you know, that's illegal. You know, and again, it's all well and good for me to say that's illegal because I know in my organisation we don't make that type of decision based on people's declaration of what diagnosis they have. Um, but, you know, it's 
it's so difficult and I think that's really very much where it lies it lies in that space around discrimination and you can again have all of the greatest policies in the world but if you do not have a culture where people really believe in those policies really believe that you shouldn't be discriminating against people because of their disability um, then that's a problem and, and but what I would say is that you know we do a lot in my organization we work with a lot of um corporate companies you know large international organizations and I've been really heartened by the progress that that they've made so we work with the, the city mental health alliance that works with the finance industry in the city and you know so you you've got banks there you know that gosh that I can't even pronounce because they're for very wealthy people um but what you're seeing is massive strides towards equality and anti-discriminatory practice in a way that actually I would suggest that the voluntary sector doesn't always keep up with and there's something that we have in the voluntary sector that I think can be problematic which is a bit of complacency because we're values driven we are mission driven you know we're there for our beneficiaries and sometimes it's that kind of you know what's going on under our own roof that we don't really interrogate and 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 I think that's that is still a problem in our sector that we must overcome I would always challenge that level of discrimination um I would always um in your organization have a system whereby I think recruitment can be interrogated on those grounds and, and hopefully it might get a bit easier with things like uh, freedom information requests and GDPR subject access requests on mm. things that, um your interview questions and stuff like that so there's definitely mechanisms to take but but i do think you know, you've touched on the point that and and you know and i'll talk about my stuff later on in the session that i've got at six about my personal experience so i don't want to take it up in this time but i do know that it is all destroying and quite often it feels like things all happen at once but also you know we talked before about you know so you might be prepared for cbt or, or talking therapies or anything else but actually that, that if there's a time that you really, really need to help, and the time that you then finally go and get some support can be months, and, so, and for children and and adult mental adolescent mental health services, it's years before mm. people get any form of appropriate support. And quite often, just a conversation in itself. Surely, it's just scandalous. <laughs> I mean, yes. I mean, you know, we we as an organisation, you would just need to see some of the briefings that we've published over the last like, six months to know that we have a very clear position on, you know, um, what we're saying to government services, decision makers around investing into services. And I think that, you know, what's very difficult for people who um, are, you know, certainly in that kind of you know so so we've got the serious mental illness but pe for people who are not quite mild enough to use yeah. IAP, the improving access to psychological therapies bit there is this growing growing group in the middle that are struggling to access services because they don't meet the threshold for secondary care and they don't meet the threshold for primary care services either newly documentary sorry Watch the Stacey Newley documentary that she did. Uh, no, I haven't seen that. It was, it was a couple of months ago, definitely. But it was this year, as far as I'm aware. And she went to a, um, it was a hospital. Um, but, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was called, but I'm sure it was in Surrey or something. But she went to this hospital and it, and it was this sort of crisis centre uh, where I think you could stay for about 48 hours or something. But but the patients that were on that video were talking about exactly that, which is why I just wanted to interject, which was, some of these people go all the time, you know, so that's the, they're absolutely dependent upon this service, but they're not able to go to a, and you used to have it, well, I say used to, but I've heard this certainly come up before in conversations around if you've got alcohol dependency or, or drug use, you can can't access some of the mental health services as well, which is really just a problem with it. They both um, are, are arguably as bad as each other. But, but, the, but these patients were saying, you know, I, I get discharged from here and, and there's literally nothing else. So I have to get to a point where I'm suicidal or that I'm making these threats or that, or I'm violent or whatever the other things that I have to say to get listened to. And if you've got to live your life where you've got to be constantly in some form of crisis to actually fit in with support, I, again, I just don't understand how that helps anybody at all. I mean, I think this is a really tricky one because, again, you know, uh, 
there so we at the organization called this group in the middle the missing step mm -hmm. so the way mental health care is constructed is that it has is a stepped care approach so uh, improving access to psychological therapies is you know mild to moderate there are four steps there or, or whatever and then secondary care um but but quite often, you know, if you've got any kind of comorbidity, so if you've got an alcohol problem, if you self-harm, um, if you have anger issues, uh, you know, if you're homeless, it's going to be really difficult for you to access services in primary care. But because of uh, years of austerity and, you know, various different things, it might also be very difficult for you to get access to secondary care. What I would say is that, you know, the NHS long term plan that, you know, was published last year, you know, offers a massive investment in a way that we've never seen in my professional life into mental health. And some of that investment is about investing into this middle step thing. So and that is investing into community mental health teams, investing in crisis services, investing in enhanced primary care. So in Cambridge and Peterborough, for instance, we've got an enhanced primary care service that specifically looks after this middle group of people. Um, and so we're now moving to a place. I mean, it's the progress has been phenomenally slow and slower than any of us would have liked. But we're certainly getting to that place where these sorts of things are being addressed and, and pretty much um, across the country we've got crisis care coverage um, but it's still not perfect I think for particular diagnoses like um, emotional unstable disorder personality disorder I think it's still acutely difficult to get access to help um, and I think uh, that's probably one of the um, over the years we've had lots of initiatives to try and deal with that um you know every 10 years we seem to say okay we've definitely got to deal with personality disorder this time we haven't yet got there so i i'm hoping that we do in the coming sort of year where there is a you know focus on that i completely agree uh, eloise said on our on our national workplace great info definitely a big link balance with physical and mental health i think particularly important to remember in the current pandemic too yeah, I mean, I can't believe I've spoken for 45 minutes and not mentioned the pandemic. I mean, um, <laughs> that's denial. I mean, pandemic denial. Um, well, you know what? It's Again, you know, we, we are living through a time like no other. I think we all accept that, um, you know, for some of us, lockdown or isolation hasn't been as bad as, as everybody else. We've not been in the same boat. And I, you know, so I do think when people say, oh, you know, we've all been in, we've all shared this experience. Well, yes, we've all, you know, had the experience of a global pandemic, but not all of us have had the same experience of, you know, poverty, perhaps trauma, domestic violence, you know, all of the other stuff that happens ordinarily. So, so this pandemic hasn't been felt equally. We are yet to see, um, uh, you know exactly what will happen in mental health terms we at the center have already published two sort of mental health forecasts that we're updating every three months to say okay well this is where we think we've got to now this is where we think we've got to now and our most recent publication said that you know what we don't want to use is the language around tsunami we don't want to say there's going to be a tsunami of mental illness we think it's much more of a rising tide of mental illness and, and there's a nuance in that that's about saying a rising tide means that it's preventable. There are, there are things that we could do to mitigate the harms that we've all experienced over this time, or at least some of us experienced over this time. So things like um, trauma. Some of us are, 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 will have experienced horror and trauma um, in ways that you know, will be incredibly difficult to recover from. And that will include people in our health and care workforce. That will include children who've been locked up with parents who, you know, there might be struggles at home for months on end. Um, and it's about, you know, the, the mitigation that we're saying is, well, look, let's create trauma-informed workplaces, schools, to make sure that, you know, when we're all re-emerging into our lives again, that actually we're not we're not going back to where we were before, that this is an opportunity to really change the way we see the world um, and really look at 
how can we make some of the fundamental changes that will address the issues that have emerged through the pandemic, but also right the wrongs that we knew existed before, especially around inequality. And um, so there's a couple of papers out there that I think uh, your colleagues would be really interested in and it's the new social contract. We've we've written a paper for the government that's called the new social contract in partnership with lots of other charities. And we've got 50 or 60 signatories to it now, which basically says, you know, we do not want to, it to go back to the way it was. We want to focus on equality. We want to focus on children's well-being. We want to cre create the conditions in society for better mental health. We want you to invest in prevention. And so... I guess, you know, the pandemic has been the most extraordinary time, but it has also offered us an opportunity, as has, you know, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, the horrific murder of George Floyd, um, you know, that trauma will stay with us for generations, and so it should. But, but I think it also has op offered us an opportunity to revisit an issue we've all sort of turned away from for quite a while and, and re-emerge with, with racial justice in a way that we must commit to going forward. And so the pandemic and the murder of George Floyd coming together um, creates, I think, an opportunity for real social change. And, I, and I'm sort of, so I'm trying to, you know, get people on that bandwagon at the moment to try and say, you know, actually, we don't want to, to rebuild uh, yeah. what we had before, we want to renew, we want to, we want something different. Yeah, I think it's really, it's there are absolutely really important points. I think I want to touch upon uh, one of the things that you talked about a little bit earlier, and it's something that we certainly see most days, and so, certainly stuff you will have seen at Minds, is, is those people who, um, because I don't, I don't know how you would you would you would um, uh, describe them really, because it is around people. So I'm talking specifically clients here, and I think I shared some experience with you around how I think you can become detached from the professional you when you're the one who needs support. So you would see people who, who sometimes quite often come across as really rational, but when it's something they're trying to fight for cannot present themselves in a good way so we would get clients come in and say i've just been thrown out of the council offices because i'm about to become homeless and this person's just not listening to me they're just not engaging with me not listening to what i've got to say i had someone in another device who came for a food bank voucher they'd been to the council who were who was someone who could sign them off and they were asking about a bank statement but the bank statement from the bank cost them money and they didn't have money which is why they wanted a food bank voucher and they were stuck in this cycle of being sent back and forward arguing with someone at the bank who had rules to follow, arguing with someone at the council who thought they had rules to follow. And then they come to us and they're frustrated and they're worn out now. But actually all they did need was someone who knew the way around that to navigate that system. But actually other other sectors were so quick to just give up on them or be so rigid that these people weren't able to make any progress. Do you know, and I think that's, uh, you know, and that's one thing that I've always liked about your approach, um, Jake, which is that, you you know, you've always kind of conveyed that sort of spirit of um, inclusion. And, you know, um, I hate terms like hard to reach um, or uh, marginalised. And, and the reason why I do is because it's the services and the systems that have marginalised people. They haven't marginalised themselves. Um, people haven't made themselves hard to reach. Uh, the systems have made themselves hard to reach. Services have made themselves hard to reach. And so, you know, what you're, what the example that you give is a really good one of somebody who is worn out from decades, probably, of having this fight, that their entire mindset is about survival because that's the mindset they've, they've needed, you know, that it's not about, you know, them just being obnoxious, difficult people, you know, actually it's about the fact that they are in survival mode because that's the only thing that they can do to get through one day to the next. And I think systems and services, we have created a really good way of um, making our services inaccessible. Yeah. That's the truth of it, you know, and, I, and I'm sorry, I will never ever, um, um, a step back from that position because I believe it with my entire body and mind you know it's absolutely the truth and I think that, you, you, that the challenge for us therefore needs to be you know um, being closer to communities 
you know, actually, what does listening really look like? Because listening, we do a lot of this engagement stuff. I'm listening to you. I, OK, that's I can see that you're listening. That's all very nice. But what are you then going to do about it? So it's it's so it's the listening with action. It's not just listening that's okay. So, you know, that that's the problem, isn't it? And again, that will demand quite significant cultural change because services, local authorities, especially, which is a large bureaucratic beast in local areas, you know, there's a kind of um, multi-layered dimensional organisations that, that they have to accept. Services have to accept. And including in the voluntary sector, nobody um, gets away from this that they have to accept that they have created services that people will struggle to access and and if you don't accept that you will never change it so you can't keep saying you know we have it in mental health all the time um you know that 16 year old who you know has has got suicidal thoughts didn't turn up for their half nine appointment Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know any 16 year old that gets up before lunchtime. And if you do, I don't know where they are. I don't know where they exist. I mean, you know, that's what I'm talking about. You know, um, you know, that uh, woman from Bangladesh didn't turn up to her appointment at lunchtime. But the letter you sent to her was uh, in English. You know, all of this stuff, you know, I mean, it's quite profound and it's deeply embedded in the way that services work and operate. So so I guess the challenge is not to individuals. I think we should stop talk, looking to them to help us fix the solution, you know, the problem. We know what the problem is. We also probably know what the solutions are as well. But I think, you know, and I think, you know, I've certainly been championing it and I know that there's, there's colleagues from and the business development team it's incentivized listening into this call as well to follow up with you but we have to have that connection with mental health and, and we because i've just gave you the example if we do deal with clients with mental health problems we do that all the time um but, but actually it's just a you know alex who, who happens to share the same second name as you and we can see if she's family when she pops up on the screen but, um, <laughs> we're a good group these <laughs> families vast but, uh, but alex is on um at four um, from Rushmore Sittings Advice, and they're delivering a service for the CCG there on, on clients and health problems and supporting them with, with debt and, and, and other problems that they then have, benefits, etc. all those inquiry areas. So we always know that there's the link there, particularly between debt and mental health, but then it could be employment, it could be housing, it could be domestic violence, there's so many other examples. But I think we know that, and I think we just need money, if that makes sense, you just need money to then deliver that project. I think what does upset me is, you know, and as I know that you're then very similar. When you then hear at your at your level, and and when you were chief executive mind in Cambridgeshire, of cases where we who were on the phones answering it, which is what a, a role I used to play uh, at your organisation, and you hear them from people say, like they just they give you their lives, and only one aspect of that has to be incredibly serious and touching to, for you to think, why did someone sit back and think, wow, like you're going through that, and you just need my help. Let's let's do it. Let's try but the, the, the phrase you've just said is exactly what i hear all the time and i still hear it in managerial roles that i've had where i've had the relationships with senior people at the other organizations and i say have you listened to this person's story this excuse as you say that they didn't come for their appointment and suddenly that is just like that's ridiculous when actually mm-hmm. you know are you even in a rational mind at that point to be planning out your week and what schedule appointment you need to be at and what bus you're going to get and all that type of stuff? We're not even thinking about these type of issues. And morning appointments, by the way, do always just make me laugh because I hear it all the time of, as you say, this person didn't turn up for the nine o'clock appointment. GP surgeries, I spoke to you over the years about this, having to phone at eight o'clock to argue. And I do love receptionists. I actually quite get on with them now because I'm a bit more cheeky. But I've had to fight with receptionists over the phone previously to argue about why my case is important to be put through to a doctor at some point in that day. And 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 to, you know, if I have to do that at eight o'clock when I said most of the time you don't even really want to be up. You don't want to be facing the no. world. No. Argue right your way across. Just wanted to read more comments before you mm-hmm. your chat. Oh. Um, Tracy Hopkins has said, I agree with you reach a margin they're seldom heard and it's up to us to start listening and she's ceo of black Core. and christine and barrow has said thank you sarah for my new mantra well there you go uh, listening with action how can anyone argue with that 
So there you are. I mean, I think you know this. This is you know the CABs around the country. We did some work with Sheffield uh, CAB some years ago, which um, I, it was before my time, but it was groundbreaking. I understand because it really demonstrated the effectiveness of having a psychologically informed approach in you know in the work that you do, and I think that 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 still continues. And you know, I'm really grateful that you invited me um, to come and talk to you, Jake, and I'm really pleased to see you in your role and um you know we've got a good history together and i think there's something for me about um you know taking these conversations like like we say you know what does it mean in our in our organizations but ultimately you know for leaders of of all of these cabs around the country um there's loads of resources out there and i know times are really tough and your resources are really short but um you know they are available do do use them because they are fairly easy to use when you get hold of them yeah that's brilliant thank you sarah and caroline just saying thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience with us sarah yeah great, thank you great. so thank you i'm just going to bring that because we've got three minutes left but i'll bring alex up just to hi alex hi hi nice to meet you I nice to meet you too yeah, yeah. Whether you were really there I'm looking there. a bit frazzled because I had a really busy day, so I've only been oh, popping in you. and out here and there. But uh, it sounds like it's been a really great day. Um, yeah, it's like loads I think going it's on. Amazing thing that you're doing, yeah. Jake. Great. It doesn't yeah. surprise me that Jake's doing it, but um, yeah, <laughs> Jake amazing, just I got think. so much energy, puts the rest of us to shame. He sort of like makes all these things happen all the time, and I'm yeah. like, oh, what's happening next? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Always keeping you on your toes, but good. Yeah, so, Sarah, yeah, it's fantastic. Alex, yeah. Alex, just before Sarah goes, do you want to just give us a quick summary then of, of what your LCA does, your local sit and surface? Yeah, we've um, yeah, we're um, we've been delivering a, a specialist mental health service, um, which started off around the um, community care act back in 1990 this is where people start wow. laughing because i've been around so long um where um the discharge from the long long stay hospital yeah, so from there we've kind of um carried on with a, a specialist mental health service around some of the acute care and secondary level mental health care but also developing services around the more um community-based mental health services as well so people who are in the um primary care level um so so it's very much what i was going to be talking about is about that service delivery side of things but also you know how that impacts on us as a service and how we how we manage that as a team as well so um just a, a slightly slightly different angle really on um on that but a lot of it's about working with guys you know in the community other services and professionals um and how we work in partnership with people so but I think some of that com comes back on the on the main team as well, um, because it means that we're all much more aware and much more focused on on some of those issues too, which is is good yeah, for everybody cool. really. Yeah. I know, amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll yeah. have to hear a bit, a bit more about that, and maybe Jake, you and I can catch up um, uh, sometime later to talk more. Brilliant. Okay. Great. Take care. Uh, that was great. Bye. Good to meet you, Sarah. Bye. And yeah. you, Alex. Take care. See you later, Jake. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Alex, hi. I'm just going to bring up your colleagues. I just wanted to give them five seconds notice before I do swing you up on the screen. And um, so we've got here, I believe, Sir Jade, who I'll let you do your introductions uh, in a second. But Alex, do you want to do you want to start off with um, just introducing yourselves, and then we'll talk about what the session actually is going to be on. Yeah, I'm Alex Hughes. I'm CEO of Citizens Advice Rushmore, famous for having been around for over 30 years. So I've got a long history with the service. Um, and I, uh, yeah, we've been running a range of different specialist services around mental health for quite a long time. Um, yeah. Great. And Jade? Yeah, um, I'm Jay Bone. I am a caseworker for the Heathlands team at Rushmore. Um, I've been there now, I think, a year and a half or thereabouts. Um, yeah, so I've been helping, supporting some of our clients um, whose mental health has impacted perhaps more of the social and practical aspects of their lives. I'll just add I'll just add that Jade Jade was our experiment because she came in as a graduate trainee. Ah. So we, we trained her from from day one. So um 
into into our ways and means of doing things. <laughs> so we've molded we've molded her, but it's been really really successful. So yeah, really glad Jake could join us today. Great, thank you, Jake and Sarah. Yeah, hi, I'm Sarah Carter. I'm also from Rushmore. I've been there not quite as long as Alex, but quite quite a long time. <laughs> Lots of different roles, but but one of which was uh, managing the Heathlands project, which is the the project that Jade works under now. So yeah, we're very sort of closely involved with that in the delivery at the acute psychiatric unit and in, in community mental health settings. I've moved on to different roles from them, but I suppose my time at Heathlands really made me aware of sort of you know mental health and the impact of that um on our clients so i've tried to bring that experience into other roles that i've had and and, and certainly we're working on a, a project recently to try and share that knowledge with the rest of our team but i think um it's also made me aware of sort of you know mental health effects as all well. so it, it's not just our clients it, it's the whole team and i think that's been a really um you know, really brought home in the last few months. So, you know, I think some of the knowledge we've gained for our clients, we've also been able to use that, you know, with our staff and, t and teams um, in the last few months. So that's sort of what I was going to talk about a bit more. Yeah, no, that's great. Later on. And I think I think all the panels today obviously been have been very interesting, and I like that they have been so varied because obviously you can risk because it's on the same topic. There's just a lot of you know repetition, but actually they have been very different. And this one in itself is very different because although we are talking about mental health, this one is very specifically then around how you deliver services, which as you say includes how you support your team. But this is then about you actually delivering services on the ground for people with mental health issues, which is. So Know, supporting people is going to help all day. So, Alex, did you want to start off? Because this was the session that you you were integral in, in champion. And so, could you just introduce it and then let us know what we're going to see in the next hour? Yeah, I mean, um, I thought it might be useful just to talk a little bit about the background to the work that we do and how it's developed, what I started to say earlier, I suppose, um, but also um, about that relationship with the NHS and the commissioning. Um, people who are interested in funding us and how that how that's played into our wider service um, and and also within our team and the sort of training and support we we deliver there and then um, for Jade to sort of say a little bit more about the casework side of it and the sort of issues there but and for Sarah to come in on the wider team and the work she's been doing to try and bring uh, um, not only the well-being resources to the team itself but also build up relationships with the um, partner agencies that we work with and the other mental health um, charities and services. So does that sound like a, a reasonable way to fill an hour? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so um, yeah, I, I mean, anything specific, Jake, that's been coming up earlier today? Because I, I haven't really had time to tune in as much as I wanted to. It's just been a really busy day one way or another. Um, but anything that you think we would want to cover today that's come up? earlier or anything no i think i think one of the points that i did just touch, touch upon with sarah hugh just before um you guys came on was around um clients who are, 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 are described as being hard to reach and difficult and not engaging and not turn up to appointments and then they're written off by often by other organizations i think it'll be interesting to hear whether you've got experience of that in your project and how you overcome that but certainly happy to leave it to you Def definitely, yeah. Um, Jade would probably be able to give you chapter and verse on that one, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, um, yeah, it's it's not it's not straightforward. And I guess coming back to you know what I was going to talk about, was, um, that's kind of why the service was commissioned in the first place, is because um, it was recognised that this the sort of mainstream citizens advice or CAB service it was then wasn't sufficient to meet the needs of those clients who have multiple and complex issues and who very often were um, not able to engage with the local citizens advice because they were locked up or you know sectioned in hospital. Um, so it's about getting the service to them and very much focusing on this is why um, this is why citizens advice is needed for that recovery process. So if people are going to be living in the community, then there's a need for them to have the practical support in order to have a sustainable life in the community. So whether that's to do with housing or benefits, more often benefits than anything else, or actually managing their finances and debts, 
that's what we provide in citizen advice is an integral part of that work. But then the needs of those clients are very different to our mainstream clients in many ways. Although some might argue that they're not that different, um, but it's it's how we engage with them. So we we sort of um, since 1990 when the service was first set up. Um, I think it's fair to say we kind of limped along from year to year as the NHS went through various different transformations and um, reshaped how mental health services were delivered. And I think that's for all mental health service users, that's an ongoing issue in that the, the victim or the <laughs> or they're subject to changing public policy and changing ways of delivering services. So keeping up to date about who your care coordinator is or what the latest care plan is can be a really big challenge for people quite often. Um, and that was a challenge for us in terms of delivering the service too, because all the time we were having to reshape and how we did things or meet different commissioners requirements. But we did somehow manage to keep hold of the funding through thick and thin, through different iterations of um, the NHS and how the services were commissioned. And I think there was quite a growth in the sort of services across the Citizens Advice um, National Service um, with different types of specialist services being set up. But on the other hand, um, some of them were able to continue and, and sustain themselves through those changes and some weren't. So we feel quite fortunate in that we were able to build a, a quite a positive relationship with our local commissioners. And Sarah was very much part of that where we finally felt that we had a, um, a commissioner that we could engage with and really understood what we were trying to do. And that resulted, um, I'm trying to think Sarah, when it was that Janine set up that service, but um, it must be about seven or eight years ago right, now. That's, that's what I'd say, yes, I think yeah. so. Yeah. And they, yeah. there was a kind of recognition that there was a pathway that the patients needed to follow in order to make a recovery and that our intervention was an essential part of that recovery pathway that, that if we're talking about mental health and recovery, then um, it was really important that people had the practical support and expertise that we could provide in a dedicated way. And that wasn't part of our mainstream core service, which isn't appropriate for all sorts of reasons for people to access. And that's why we have dedicated caseworkers like Jade who are able to deliver that. So after that service was commissioned um, in that way, uh, very much as a joint effort between um, um, between us and the um, local commissioners, um, it was very much a partnership arrangement. Um, there were very much clearer expectations all round. And after we'd been running that for a couple of years, it was accepted that we were really part of that mainstream funding. And it was no longer as just an add-on, but it was actually a core part of what the mental health services wanted to deliver at a local level. And that they fully recognised that as an important element of their overall offer. So that, that's where we are now and we have funded um, to provide that secondary level um, service at um, the local acute psychiatric ward as well as through the community mental health recovery services and, um, and that's delivered actually in the office when, when we're in the office um, as well as actually in those mental health settings. So that involves working in partnership with the providers as well. So we're working with the Surrey and Borders um, Partnership Trust to provide our local mental health services and, um, and with the community-based staff as well as with the ward staff at the psychiatric unit. So um, there's a lot of partnership work involved all the way along, whether it's at commissioning level or whether it's at the sort of ground level. And then in addition to that, there's a local charity um, called Broadhurst Trust, who, who we've worked with for quite a long time, who were very interested in funding the work that was for those clients who weren't at that secondary care level. So we've been delivering work from our local wellbeing centre, um, and uh, which is a, a drop-in, well, was a drop-in centre <laughs> for people who were um, at the community-based primary care level who could access our service through that drop-in centre. And they offer a range of community-based therapies and support groups and things. Um, so we were, again, we were working, we were aligning ourselves with them and the partnership 
um, partnerships we built up there which were quite successful but again that's been the subject of this continuing change which we see in mental health services in that the commission has decided that they didn't really like so much what was being delivered there um, and they wanted it to be a much more bespoke service focused on recovery so we've had a drop off in those referrals so there's this constant review and rearrangement and realignment of what we're doing to fit with the changing um, environment for mental health services um, but I think what it brings to the team is a, is a much greater awareness of um, of the overall mental health challenges faced by people and the skills that um, our Heathlands team, of which he, um, Jade is a part, are then transferred across to the wider team as well because we can share some of that understanding about mental health and the sort of ways to support people. Um, it's probably better if I stop talking now and I can shut the door so we don't get the sounds off but Jade um, it might be a good point at for which at which you can come in and say a little bit more about the training um, that you have had and the sort of work that we do to engage with those clients so that, that yeah makes sense. yeah of course yeah so I think as Alex has said pretty nicely she summed up um, how the Heathson service works so I'm part of a relatively small team of about four to five case workers um, and we work exclusively with clients who have severe and enduring mental health problems um, all of the clients are referred to us by the local community mental health team so they are accessing um, secondary mental health support um, when they come to see us um, so we do have quite strong ties with our local community mental health teams and also with GPs, um, which is obviously ve very helpful when it comes to things like PIP appeals, um, housing applications, um, working together with mental health social workers, um, care coordinators and GPs and um, as well the the service users, you know, family, friends and carers, it's it's not just working um, exclusively with that individual, but I think it's taking a more holistic approach and working with with all of the people who are, are involved in their networks um, to provide them with the best possible support um, with practical issues, which obviously their mental health may be impacting and, and the practical issues impacting their mental health. And it, it's just, um, a cycle. So the main issues, I think, as um, Jake touched upon at the start, um, are benefits, housing and debt, particularly um, debt at the moment. I think we're probably going to see a rise um, in those particular areas as, as we come out of lockdown. Um, so as a team, obviously, dealing with mental health issues and the impact that has on individuals on a daily basis it can be quite challenging for us as well um, as individuals so trying to support each other as a team I mean we're all professionals it is it is our job um, but just trying to debrief with each other as much as possible particularly after you know difficult conversations and, and difficult appointments with clients um, where sometimes you feel you know, you have to deal with everything all at once and, and the world's crashing down in front of you. Um, but just reminding yourself that, you know, you are part of a wider network. There are the client social workers, care coordinators and, and this whole other you know, mental health networks of support um, around them that you can liaise with and, and that you're all working together, really, to achieve the same outcome. So making sure that we utilise that as best as we can. Um, I think the important thing as well, we have struggled sometimes um, with um, engaging with mental health teams to get the um, necessary medical evidence on occasions for things like benefit appeals. Um, but I think it's important, you know, not just to focus on the clinical side of mental health, but also about the, the social aspects and the impact that that has on an individual as well and how that um, will impact their recovery. Um, both in the short and long term as well. Um, <clears throat> so the Heathland service, it tries to empower clients so that they are able to take action for themselves and, you know, empowering them with the knowledge and information um, and the confidence, I guess, to, to go forward and, um, you know, support the, their lives within the community and, and grow as individuals. Um, so the, the Heathland's role, it is quite a 
a challenging but rewarding um, role, I would say. But yeah, um, but one of the I other things as well with the Heathland sub, sorry, <laughs> go on. No, I was going to say, Jade, I know it gets a bit much when you're just you talking, isn't it? But for, for me, I found that anyway. But I mean, having a conversation might be better. But I was just th thinking, um, you know, for the team, it's very much you work as a team and support each other, don't you? So that some of those difficult conversations, I, I, one, mm -hmm. of the, one of the things one of the things I think we've missed when you've been working from home is that ability to come back into the office and offload and share and support each other, which I know that you're doing that anyway through WhatsApp and um, some of the other Zoom meetings yeah. and things, Sue's organising. But I think that's always been a very important part of the way that the Heathlands team has worked. I know when Sarah was managing it as well, you know, it's that ability to share and um, share some of the distress and the just difficult situations you've been working in and to support each other as a team, I think. Is that, that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that was one of the things that we struggled with the most when starting to work from home is that you can't, you know, come out of the appointment and pop in and, and speak to your colleagues about, um, you know, what's happening and, and debrief a little with them. It's a bit more, although we are able, obviously, to pop, have a phone call or, or drop each other a WhatsApp message, um, it, it's not quite the same as before in terms of of having that support network, you know, right there. Um, it's not as easily accessible at the moment, but obviously I, I know still got my team around me. So yeah, your virtual team. Because I think I think there's some people <laughs> where, where they're delivering maybe a mental health project and it's just one worker working on their own. It's a lot more mm. challenging um, because they're dealing with quite difficult situations and they they haven't got anyone else in the team that um, is able to share that with them quite in the same way. Whereas I think for the Heathlands team, there's always been quite a good close-knit group of people who have been able to sort of offload and share with each other. Would you say that, Sarah? Oh, definitely. Def definitely. I think I think they've always been a very, yeah, close, um, well-bonded team. But the other thing I was going to mention as well is obviously their amazing advice work and outcomes they get. It's also um, somewhere that does an awful lot of research and campaigns work as well because, you know, there's so many issues that sort of um, emerge. Um, so, you know, obviously we did done lots of work around PIP and feel we've sort of influenced some of the processes there around appeals and I think probably with universal credit as well and I know that's an area that Jade's be, been involved in and again there are sort of issues we've picked up locally um, or, or recently around the digital inclusion thing so um, I think it's it's really you know um, though it's quite it can be seen quite distinct from the citizen advice service it is really you know the advice we give is is the same that's available to any client it, it's it's often the way that we deliver it and and certainly the research and campaigns uh, work it's something that we've always you know it's always that uh, balancing the the advice needs but it's certainly issues we've tried to pick up but we have had some real good successes over the years in terms of things that we um, we've picked up and that have actually you know if resulted in changes. I, we got I, we got quoted in the House of Commons once, didn't we? I think. Yeah, yeah we were our, our evidence. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That just, was. Um, can, yeah. can you, can you let us know about that? But I just want to bring in Kate's comment on workplace. Just say, um, um, I've recently managed to get successfully a client's debts written off using the debt and mental health evidence form for a client suffering from severe depression and increasingly worrying suicidal thoughts. However. We are finding creditors often refusing our requests, despite the evidence, which we fear may increase as more people come out of this pandemic with mental health issues and significant debt. So I just wanted to raise that as, a, as, as you say, on the RNC point, the research campaigns point. So if someone could come back on, on that, that would be useful. But Alex, tell us about the um, parliamentary coverage that you had. Oh, it was a long time ago now, but um, there was actually the law about, um, I remember it well, because um, there was, it used to be that if you went into hospital, you would lose your housing benefit um, if you were in for more than 12 weeks. Um, and then um, people would, obviously mental health being mental health, people would be in and out of hospital quite regularly. So there was huge disruption to their benefits and their ability to maintain a stable, independent life. So... Um, the uh, Sally Robinson, who was volunteer of the year last year, I think, or the year before, she was the one who really campaigned on that and really took it forward. And, and the evidence 
that she produced was used in the House of Commons and they did change the law. So now everybody who goes into a hospital, their housing benefit stays in place for 12 months. So that's much, much better. Yeah. Well, it's not housing benefit. Yeah. 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 I don't know, Jade, if you wanted to comment about the debt and mental health stuff. I think I think we use that quite a lot, don't we? The, um... Yeah, I regularly find that the, the debt and mental health evidence form is, is quite useful in being able to at least reduce, if not completely write off, um, clients' debts if they've arisen because of mental health or, or if they're, you know, now unable to work and realistically aren't ever going to be able to, you know, be able to repay um, any of them. But again, I think that's where... Um, our relationship with our local community mental health teams really come into play because you do need to have um, a healthcare professional who is really understanding of how your mental health is impacting, you know, your everyday situation, including your finances, um, and is willing to take that time to sit down with the client and complete and complete the debt on mental health evidence form and, and you know send it back to us to be able to distribute. Um, I think it's it's really key that again, like I said before, that we're focusing not just on the clinical side of things. Um, although I appreciate that um, there's not a lot of time or funding at the moment for, for that to occur. But um, but really, that, that's what we need to be able to support um, PEEP service users with mental health problems, um, with, with their benefits, with their housing, with their debts. Without that support, I mean, it's it's pretty difficult without the medical evidence, without the debt and mental health evidence forms, um, all of those things. They're just so crucial. Um, yeah, so I think that that's that's where our connections really come into play. And I think that's where the Heathland service in particular, that's where one of its strengths lies. I think, um, Sarah, did you want to say a little bit about the um, the work we've been trying to do with the team to build up the core service and um, um, how we've been trying to build up those partnerships with uh, local agencies? Yeah, so, certainly. I mean, obviously, um, yeah, I think you've got an overview of sort of the Heathlands um, service and the, and the huge resources we've got really as a, as an organisation with them. And we they well historically they've been were based in a mental health setting, um, you know, from the psychiatric unit to a, a, a day hospital for a while. Uh, but about a year ago, they actually moved in with with Farnborough office. Now I don't think they were entirely sure. Um, whether they wanted to do that, but I think for our general service, that's been had a, a, a huge benefit because though um, we had some staff who crossed over, now they're actually in the office in Farnborough. Um, their, their brains are certainly being being picked, um, and and, uh, and Jade and other people that work as a supervisor. But I think that's been really helpful in terms of sharing their expertise, um, and obviously um, for the generalist service. Uh, we're te they're, they're tending not to see people at secondary um, care level. They're probably at, at primary care or, or even with undiagnosed mental health problems. Mm -hmm. So I think I think the support that uh, we can get from that that team, and as Jade said, actually, you know, if someone is in secondary care, they have got other professionals involved, uh, and we can call on those. So I think sometimes it can be really hard for people at, at primary care level or with, as I said, with an undiagnosed. Um, um, uh conditions that that we it, we can't access that so i think using the expertise of heathlands maybe to help make referrals in or to to try and um how we, how we can best assist that client is really really helpful but sort of looking out what we've as, as well as sharing that internally we're, we're, we're trying to look externally and and we are lucky um as well as sort of the the, the nhs provision we have got a lot of local organizations and community groups and charities um, operating which which is great um, but it can be a bit of a minefield working out who's doing what because as, as Alex said it, it's an ever-changing landscape because of funding and personnel and some groups are user-led so that they can fluctuate depending on who's leading those groups so we've been trying to do some work to sort of in increase our understanding of what's what's out there to liaise more with local organizations and, and groups to find out what what they're doing what they're providing because you know they range from the recovery college which is very educational based um, to um, sort of user 
social groups to practical groups like going to play football or going to do knitting um so there's there's lots of things there and, and obviously there's lots of clients and lots of individuals so it's what suits them so we 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 have been trying and we've got a great volunteer who has worked on our local information for years and she's very good at collating that information but we're, what we're trying to do is share that more with our keep it make try and keep it up to date and try and share it with our team so if we've got clients who come in and um as jade did obviously the social side as well trying to give them information about other organizations that, that, are, that are out there to that you know and so whether they want to go and find out more about their condition or they want to go and knit and natter with someone what, what's going to, to suit to suit them um so that it, 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 it it's a bit of a bit like painting the fourth bridge i think because things do do, do, do change a lot but i think we, we, it's something i think is 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 um i think is useful for for us as a team and and, and hopefully also for well primarily hope uh, useful for our, our clients as well um, um but it it helps us to build up partnerships with other organisations and and certainly yeah, we haven't been able to do it recently but we're hoping to sort of maybe involve them more in our research and campaigns work as well because they're very much on the you know on the on the ground and picking up mm -hmm. issues um so and the impact of things um so um that if you say i feel i've been talking a lot so do chip in someone else <laughs> yeah I, th I think i think it, it sort of comes back I, I was, we've got a sort of customer experience project going on at the moment i was chatting to the guy earlier i had a meeting and and one of the things is about um what, what we expect of ourselves as a service um and how we can we haven't got all the solutions ourselves and especially around mental health i mean i think we all feel passionately about mental health in our service and it is something that we really need to um you know work on all the time um but we we know that we're not the whole solution it's about joining up as sarah said with those other agencies mm -hmm. that can offer additional services so whether it's a whether it's engaging with the secondary mental health services you know the care coordinators and the cpns and and all of those services or, or whether it's talking about joining up with some of the more um, low level sort of social activities and things i think we we owe it to ourselves and to our clients not to think that all the answers are with us they're also mm -hmm. about working with those other services and working in partnership. You know, as Jade says, if we if we want to use the mental health and debt um, form, then we need to have that engagement with those other services in order to get their cooperation and, and complete the information needed. If we want the evidence for benefit appeals, we need to have that input. But similarly, you know, I think we can often get a sense of a failure or a sense of oh we we haven't done enough because we haven't sorted it all out but it's not always down to us so for our own mental health and well-being we we need to have that wider picture of what other services are out there in the community um and um i think the other thing um, I, I don't know if we mentioned sarah we, we, we've we've been doing a bit of training as well with the team yeah. so looking at things like mental health first aid um, and uh, Samaritans did a um, suicide awareness oh, um, training. I don't know if either, I, I hadn't been on either of those, but I don't know if either of you wanted to mention anything about that and how that went down with the team and how useful or otherwise it was. Yeah, I mean, there, there was that particular training and then there's a few others um, which were steered towards mental health and having mental health conversations um, that I know I've attended and that other case workers have also attended and, and said that they found them particularly useful um, with, with bringing up with our clients um, to discuss, you know, issues such as, you know, suicide and and um, and other quite quite serious topics. Um, <clears throat> I, I was going to say I quite like the previous speaker was talking quite a lot about barriers to services and that we need to acknowledge um, barriers as well that that we put up as as charities and I think um, that is one of the things that Heathlands as a service do try to at least acknowledge um, barriers such as you know public transport um, trying to see clients in their local community mental health teams where they do feel you know it's a familiar surrounding it's you know they've, they've been there before they go there um to see the psychiatrist or care coordinator trying to make them feel as comfortable as possible um i think the other thing with the heathland service and how it perhaps is different to the core um 
it's not so much a three strikes and you're out policy. There's a bit more, you know, lenience and understanding and trying to negotiate um, with the individual to, to try and get them that help that, you know, once they finally reached out to us, particularly regarding things like debt, where obviously once they've made that initial contact, we really want to um, support them going forward and, and don't want to, you know, not stop the engagement just because they haven't turned up for like they say that 9 30 appointment when when realistically that that wasn't suitable for them at all i think i think you're right and and that was um you know coming back to my earlier um point about commissioning the service that was one of the points we had to make quite strongly wasn't it sarah yeah. about how how difficult it was for people to overcome those barriers to access the mainstream service and i think we listed a few um criteria for the referrals and one of them was you know a lot of people just really experience a lot of anxiety if they're in a waiting room with lots of other people and just going into that sort of environment can be a really huge barrier for people so that's why the Heathland service works very much on referrals from their care coordinator or CPN or you know whoever's the care coordinator so that we can have some prior information about what that client needs and then the referral is made um, in a way that's tailored to their needs rather than them having to brave the waiting room and or the you know trying to get through on the phone and the various barriers that they face there um so it's it's about yeah having a having a service that really reduces those barriers as much as possible yeah and, to... I, and i think as you say the appointments often can be you know you don't expect to deal with everything in one appointment you know mm. it's very much tailored to the needs of the client isn't it so it may take a number of appointments and just break breaking things down so you know Ethan's cases can go on for, for a long time so it, yes. it's, you know, it's generally you know t t done at the client's pace but taking account of deadlines and <laughs> um, statutory requirements as well so yeah it, it is very tries to be very much tailored to the to the needs and health of the client doesn't it and, and accepts that people you know go up and down and you know there's lot, lots of repeat clients as well aren't yeah. there yeah three steps forward two steps back yeah. a lot of the time yeah i just wanted to bring lorraine in because i think lorraine from bromley is looking to join us check that right lorraine hi lorraine hi lorraine hi. 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 so are you looking to join us on the delivering services for clients of mental health session yeah yeah so so um alex and, and sarah and jade were just telling us about the services that they offered at their local sitting device do you want to tell us where you're from in terms of your sitting device and the services you deliver for people with mental health yeah so um hello hello hi hi, hi. hi. <laughs> You're very yeah. small, but yes. <laughs> I'm very small. <laughs> that better? Yeah. yeah. That was a bit too wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 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 So in terms of where we are, um, about three years ago, um, we were we were commissioned by um, the um, London Borough of Bromley and um, the CCG. So uh, we formed a, a sort of a conglomerate. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We formed a conglomerate with, um, with um, we've got one contract and we're joined up together sort of with a, um, uh, another other organisation of which um, Bromley Lewis and Grange Mine are part of our, um, part of our organisation. So we call ourselves Bromley Third Sector Enterprise as an organisation and all the directors from um, five different organisations work together. In terms of mental health team, I think it's been a real eye opener for our team. Um, the, the relationship that we've got now with, with, with MIND in our borough is, is just phenomenal. Um, the, what we do is we're called the single point of access, so we're the first ones on the phone. And then we would then um, pass the client through to what we call our other pathways, of which mental health pathway plays a big deal in that. They have the recovery unit. Um, we all our staff and volunteers had to learn quite in detail and quite quickly exactly what services they do provide and how they work, which is quite different to just sort of passing people on. We actually do know um, 
what we, what those services can offer to our clients. And I feel that since we've been doing that, we've been working since um, 2017, the holistic is a real holistic advice. We don't just focus on advice itself. We actually look at what's causing it. Um, and we are able to actually say with confidence when you when we pass you through to our mental health pathway, this is the service that you will get. Um, we, if people have got, for instance, um, debt, but they've also got mental health issues, we're able to look at what's causing the real anxiety for them. And if it is that they want to talk about the mental health issues and they want help with that, then we recognise that they actually the debt is kind of secondary in a way um, because they're never going to be able to to absorb the information unless they've got the help they need so um so it's really good for them it's almost like having um the mental health team on tap as we can ring them up and we can say to them well actually we've got this client with this particular issue are you able to deal with that now and then they will deal with that we will highlight to them there are their issues and if we picked up any priorities, we can tell them so that when they're talking to, to that particular person, they, they're aware of that and they can then, when that person's at a plateau where they feel more able to deal with those issues, they can pass those issues back to us and we can deal with that. So, so for us, it, it is really a, quite a phenomenal service. Um, yeah. Sounds amazing. Yeah. 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 Is that is that anything to do with the Bromley by Bo social prescribing? So no, we're, we're actually Bromley in Kent. So Bromley by oh, Bo is right. kind of separate. Um, oh, right. And I think what happened was um, the council decided they just wanted um, one organisation, so one bid with several organisations of which we are part of that. Um, and obviously there was a lot of resistance, but three years on... Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah. No. I and mean, I think I think what you're saying really rings a bell, you know, with what we were saying earlier about you can't do it on your own. You need to do it with yeah. other people. And um yeah. and whereas the uh, mental health um, professionals recognise that, you know, if they're wanting people to recover, they need to have help with their debts to get to recover. Mm. By the same token, your guys are saying you can't help with your debts until you have the other inputs and support as well. Mm. So it's very much that joint approach, isn't it? You mm. you can't do one thing without the other. You need the, the you know specialist help and expertise on top of the mental health expertise. Can I just read out some mm. comments from workplace before we carry on? So Victoria McGregor has said, thanks Alex, I think that's a really good point about working on And Paul Savile has said, we had some input from some emails coming through there. Paul has said, <laughs> we had some input from Samaritans at a development day for staff and volunteers just before lockdown. And it's opened up to the dialogue locally, and Paul is now on a site to have a venture project, uh, which is obviously a celebration in the town locally. So it's really interesting to hear of those um, different experiences. Um, Jay, I just wanted to, to touch upon a bit more around, uh, as I said, what was what's described often as hard to reach difficult clients, etc. Uh, whether you know through all the work that you've been doing. Are there suitable times for different appointments? Is it just on a case by case basis of understanding the individuals you work with? Or are there some tips for working with people with serious mental illness that you would be able to share with us? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, can you hear me? You can hear me, okay? It's gone a bit okay. fuzzy, but it's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think it's working yeah, with clients on a case by case basis um, and figuring out what works for them and their particular circumstances um, and also acknowledging um, obviously the impact their mental health is having and also things such as trauma and how that may impact their ability to, I don't know, time manage, be able to keep to appointments. Um, I went on a training a couple of weeks ago, which was um, around mental health first aid and acknowledging um, how, you know, the impact of trauma and how that manifests itself and can be seen, you know, physically, how it physically manifests itself. Um, so I think it's working with the particular client to, to see where do they want to be seen? Do they need to be seen by a particular person? 
um, I don't know, because of domestic violence, would they prefer, or, or another perhaps trauma that they've experienced, would they prefer to be seen by, I don't know, someone of the same gender? Um, would they prefer to be seen, if possible, by someone, you know, from the same background as them? Um, I think just, just working with the individuals to see what is best in, in their particular situation. Um, I think the, the early 9.30 appointments for, for most clients, that, that is a bit of a struggle, <laughs> mm. I must admit. Um, but obviously there are some some people who that, that works better for. Um, but I think it's acknowledging things like um, when clients have to take the medication and the fact that they might not actually be able to be you know, functioning or be able to get out and drive that early in the morning. Um, so by booking these appointments at, at that time, that is, I guess, discriminating against them because, because they, they're not able to access those services. And then if you're writing them off after, you know, two strikes and you're out, that's it. That's, that's not um, really taking into consideration their needs and, and delivering an appropriate service. So I think it's, it's really exploring in that initial contact. And again, I think this is where the community mental health teams and the referrals are really important um, to provide a background for, for the client situation and how we can you know best um, help them. I know I had a client last week um, who it said on their referral, you know, they they don't normally answer the phone, they do struggle to answer the phone to unknown numbers. Um, so it was trying to either not withhold my number or phoning through to their um, family member to see if I could get through that way rather than just you know phoning once and saying oh no that's it they haven't answered at the particular it's, it's gone 11 it's, it's two minutes past 11 that's it now um, so I think it's just trying to be a bit more understanding and trying to um, figure out ways in which you can help a client um, just yeah doing not just doing the, the set requirement and Jake, have you been doing more by email during lockdown? And how have you found that with clients? Yeah, so some clients um, quite like to receive um, email support. So I know I've had a few who, when they're having particularly bad mental health days, they don't want to speak to anyone over the phone. They don't want to see anyone in person, mm -hmm. but they are still willing and happy to receive an email or a text to talk to them. And I think that's it's really important to still try and keep them engaged in that way. Um, and I think that has worked really well, obviously not as a complete replacement for, for the advice, but obviously to supplement it um, on days where clients aren't well enough to be able to attend a telephone appointment or to come and see you face to face. Yeah, that definitely has been one of the main changes, I would say, as well as obviously delivering um, telephone appointments, which has benefits and <laughs> challenges in itself. I think... Um, I think we were quite surprised, weren't we, that the email and the phone advice was quite successful. Um, that um, there was actually, I think, I think people were anticipating for this vulnerable client group that doing it by email and phone would actually be much more difficult. But in in some instances, it's been welcomed, hasn't it, as a as a better way for delivering yeah, services for clients with mental health issues. It has actually been welcomed that, that they don't have to face the challenge of coming to the office. Yeah, I know um, for me in particular, I, I would have presumed before lockdown that most of my clients wouldn't have answered their phone. They wouldn't have, you know, they would have disengaged completely. It would have been um, too overwhelming for them. But actually, for the vast majority of, of the Heathlands clients that I've been seeing, um, a lot of them have actually said to me they feel, you know, more comfortable having a conversation where they're in their own home, you know, that they're in familiar, safe surroundings and they do feel happier actually to be able to speak to me over the phone than they would um, if they would have had to come into the office and have that stressful journey of, you know, getting on public transport, worrying about timings, worrying about all these other things. Um, having appointments over the phone actually have completely, you know, got rid of all of them other barriers that were in the way for them. Um, and I've, I've actually been able to do a lot more in the last, you know, couple of weeks than, than we've been able to do over the last year or so. So I think for some clients, not for all clients, um, but for some clients, that, you know, that, that has been a, a real positive for them. That's a very good point. Thank you, Jay. Um, Lorraine, I just wanted to bring you in. I think you were just putting your headphones in, though. But, um, is that a similar experience to you for Bromley in the sense of that you're often locally? 
Sorry, you're just on mute at the moment. You're on mute. Yeah. It's just at the bottom on uh, at the bottom for yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we are. It is, it is quite similar for us. Um, we're experiencing the, the. I think with the lockdown, um, there have been quite a few people with mental health illnesses that have gone up. We're getting a lot of calls about that uh, from a lot of people. So yeah, it's a very similar situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. Um, and and for, for us at Wokingham uh, and Gallops, we've talked about this previously, but um, we've got some money to train uh, as an instructor so that we can train everyone in our team, all staff, volunteers and trustees in mental health first aid. So the view is that hopefully, you know, by maybe the end of next year, all of our team will be trained and at least understanding and responding to those immediate issues that present to them. And it goes back to some of the conversations that we had in the session this morning about um talking about feelings and stuff the back of this uh, and, and jg talked about some of the stuff that came from the health test day course as well but i think it would be really beneficial just for dealing with clients in general of course as well as that quality support that we need to offer as well which is obviously a lot of the theme around the day today what what extra bits of training apart from mental health first aid do you think are um you know useful to do to support clients with mental health problems I'm just trying to think. Uh, it's a long time since I've been involved directly in the training, but um, we used to do. We used to. Um, there's certainly some bits of citizens advice standard training, aren't there, around mental health? But one of the really positive things um, we did a couple of years ago, because we we're commissioned by the NHS, um, they offered one of our staff um, to um, progress on this training course around um, personality disorder. Um, and that, that was a really useful opportunity to work with mental health professionals who were also learning about the same thing. Um, so as well as learning quite a lot about a disorder that affects a lot of our clients, um, they were also building up that relationship with the people they were training with. Um, so things like that are really helpful. Um, Jade, I don't know, as having done training more recently, obviously the main focus was on your advisor training and casework management but were there specific modules around mental health that you found useful or, or? um there's definitely um obviously there was the e-learning on mental health um there was the mental health first aid course which i recently attended um and i think it was mental health conversations as well um any training which which is around i think complex needs and, and mental health and how that impacts um, I think recently I went on a, a housing course with NHAS um, about how complex needs um, interlink with housing. And that was, a, that was a really interesting course because it wasn't just attended by citizens advice individuals. It was also, you know, local authorities um, and other advice charities. So it was interesting to see their perspectives. Um, and perhaps a lot of the time they hadn't actually really considered um, the impact of complex needs and of trauma. And, and of you know mental health on um, individuals trying to access their services. So um, yeah, I think they're, they're some of the key ones for me that have stood out recently. Yeah, and I, th I think they're going, attending, if you can, those multi-agency trainings uh, is really useful mm -hmm. because you get lots of people's perspective and it's, again, an opportunity mm -hmm. to network and share experience and maybe build some links that will be useful to your clients in the future but i think that you know great assistance as well as training is that it's good to get a different perspective yeah, yeah it's a good point yeah. we've been using our zoom sessions to do some training so we've had people come in from outside organizations through zoom and i found that's really good because it is a way of getting the staff to interact and then be together they feel as if they're a team then and they but you've got that common cause there so that's helped with us um, having both of us. We've had the Samaritans, we've had Mind come in. And they're only short sessions because we have Zoom meetings in the morning from sort of 9.30 till 10. Um, and they do about a 20 minute session with people on that. Um, and that's been really quite useful, I think. Yeah. So you've been doing that during, during lockdown, have you? Yes, we have, yeah. yeah. That's really good. 
Yeah, being part of a multi-agency setup like you've got at Bromley must be great for things like that because you've got all of those different services in the same spot, haven't you? Really? Yeah. Sorry, Jake. It's all right. Now, I just wanted to raise about, you know, because one of the questions then is for anyone watching that's maybe obviously from the public side and is thinking about accessing certain device and they have a mental health issue, what would the comments be back from yourselves? I would say if, if you're thinking of accessing us, speak to your, if you're not already under the community mental health team, you know, speak to your GP um, about the difficulties which you're facing. If, if you are already under the community mental health team, talk to your care coordinator, talk to your support worker, um, explain what's going on. As, as soon as you've opened up to someone about that issue, it, it is a weight off your shoulders and, and you know, we can work together um, to move forward. So I would say definitely um, have that initial conversation. I know it might be difficult um, to, to start that off initially, but then, you know, once once you've opened up and once you've talked to someone about, I don't know, the debt or the housing or, or the benefits issue, then, you know, we can we can help you going forward. I think I think the difficulty sometimes is um, that we've experienced is that the the services that are around can vary so much. Um, so what works for us locally um, might not work in another area. Um, but you know, even even talking to your GP, some GPs are much better informed and understanding about mental health than others. So for some people saying talk to your GP, that might be like, no, you know, I've already tried talking to them and they just gave me a tablet sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's kind of gearing that conversation to who who do you trust, who can you who can you confide in, who's who's your support network, um, and share it with them so that it so that you can get support in accessing the help that you need. Because I think doing it on your own when you're already feeling overwhelmed and feeling vulnerable is, is, is very difficult to go. Uh, you know, if you don't have a specialist service like Heathlands in your area or you don't have that immediate point of contact, um, it can be very intimidating and scary. And, and we all know, you know, we're not a perfect service. So and now that you can't just rock up <laughs> in your local office, you know, accessing us by phone can be quite tricky, too. Uh, and, and who you get on the other end of the phone. So I, I, as much as we'd like to think that all of our advisors are fully trained and aware and understanding, um, we all know we have good days and bad days as well. So having somebody who's already on your side before you try and access help from us, I think is probably good. I, I mean, as I said, I was talking earlier to our customers, this customer experience person we're working with at the moment. And I think part of the trouble with our service is about managing expectations. So if people come to us and they think that we're going to suddenly wave a magic wand and get everything sorted for them at the first visit, they're going to be disappointed. So being realistic about the expectations, you know, much as we know that we provide a fantastic service, we also need to be realistic that that's not always going to be um, what the, the first experience of our service is going to be like. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's getting that right balance between saying, yeah, we are great and we do fantastic things, but also sometimes it might be difficult to get through or sometimes the person you speak to might not have as much empathy or training as the, you'd like them to have as well. So it's being realistic about that. <laughs> what are you watching now? <laughs> is, is that fair, would you say? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Is this for an internal audience or an external one? <laughs> I just wanted to add that to all the information on, on this as well. Just about you know encouraging people to make contact with us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I think, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I think the whole day has shown that, uh, and when I was listening earlier, people were saying if the service has changed, I think there is much greater sort of understanding. Um, and I know it's very difficult if you come in as a client to maybe disclose but as, as much information or um, hints that you can, you can give and, 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 ha and hopefully um, you know, that will be um, recognised uh but by, by by us and yeah and 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 I, I know it's hard to you know if you don't get an ideal first um contact but try not to be put off because i think that you know the the, the good work, we want to help people we're, we're always trying to do our best to do that uh, and if you, and if you've got someone can support you and you're happy for them maybe to share some information uh we will always sort of do our best to 
Um, you know, even yeah, obviously the, the specialist service at Heathens is, is can be very very tailored, but I think even you know um, most offices will try and ac accommodate as much as they possibly can individuals' needs. So please, yeah, we we are here. Don't be don't be put off. <laughs> yeah, and I, th I think there's a whole issue, isn't there, about how we gear the service to the people who most need us, you know, and how we define that. Um, that could be quite interesting. Um, so who is it that most needs us? And arguably people with those mental health issues are really at the top of that um, list, aren't they? Because they're, they're incredibly vulnerable for whatever background um, they're coming from. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, that, and I suppose the other thing, if you're engaged, yeah, engaged with any other organisations or any spot, you know, get mm. them to make, make a referral into your local office and, and, and provide some information. As Jade, as Jade said, if we ha have that information, it, it's much you know, it puts us in a better position to how we how we deal with you as a client. Mm. So yeah, okay. so yeah, and especially yeah. at the moment, uh, that's about you know a, a good way. Well, uh, it, there are challenges at the moment, so that's a good way to reach your local office. Yeah, I think it's really yeah. interesting because we've just been talking about um, with with the team. We've got a moving what we call a moving forward review team, looking at maybe taking the first tentative step to opening back our outreaches and looking at who the vulnerable clients are because what we want to do is to reach those who are most vulnerable. We yeah. expect that once you've opened up, there will be lots of people that then want to come in and have face-to-face -face, um, sessions and, and it, it's, it's been quite, um, you know, it's a new training for, for the staff and volunteers about how you define those vulnerable clients and their needs and so that they can actually access us and be the, the first through the door, if you like, that way. Mm. Yeah, sounds very much like what we're doing, yes. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and because they're the people you both concerned haven't been able to access it in other ways, so yeah. Mm. So, yeah. so just before we wrap up, because obviously we've got Sarah, Natasha and Stu on just ready for the next session, so hello to you and we'll do introductions in a moment. Hi. Hi. Final comments mm. from Sarah, Jade, Lorraine or Alex in the last two minutes on on nurse delivering services for people with mental health issues. You want to wrap up? No, I think it's just, it, it can be challenging, but I think it, as, as Jay said, it's all so very rewarding, isn't it? Because you can see great you know, progress and great outcomes for those clients. So it's definitely worth making the effort to accommodate the needs of those clients. Yeah, I think I think it's it's sort of having that at the heart of your service and making sure that you you're recognising that those are um, ex those extra needs are uh, managed and um, put at put at the forefront. Really, um, mm -hmm. it's difficult to do when we've got so many demands on us. But um, yeah, I think that commitment and that passion is very much within our team and hopefully across the service as well. Brilliant. Okay, so. Thank you to Sarah, Jade, Lorraine and Alex for uh, another great mm -hmm. session talking about this subject. So it's been really useful and thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Jane. Thank, thank you. 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 Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Not a problem. So, um, hi, we've got Sarah, Stu and Tasha uh, and this session is on ways we can help our mental health and wellbeing. So what we've been doing is just introducing ourselves before the session. So I'll start with Sarah, who's next to me on the screen. So do you want to introduce yourself for us? Yep. Hi, I'm Sarah. I work for National Citizens Advice uh, in the Families Welfare and Work team on policy research. Um, and I'm joining today because I've had some negative experiences with poor mental health myself and have family and friends who have as well. So I think uh, what you've organised today, Jake, is great um, and a really good opportunity to speak about these issues and remove some of the stigma around them. Brilliant. Thank you. Stu? Hello, I'm part of the Universal Credit Team and I decided to get involved today because I've had my own experiences with mental health and also I'm part of a minority too and want to help as much as I can. I know that there are gaps out there and I know that a lot of information doesn't get out that if we shared it, everyone can be so much better. And so if we all help each other, we're all better off. Brilliant. Thank you. And Tasha? 
Hi, I'm Tasha. Um, I work for a local um, systems advice in Haven. Um, I am the training supervisor and help to claim lead, which is universal credits. Um, and again, I've experienced uh, my own mental health issues um, and experienced quite a lot of negativity in terms of negative comments and bullying actually over the years. And I think it's really important that uh, we continue these conversations so that um, hopefully one day uh, talking about mental health is the norm because although we've made leaps and bounds, I think uh, we've got a long way to go yet.